Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders, past and present, of all Australia's Indigenous people. Are there any documents to be tabled? I call the clerk. Yes, Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. Thank you. Are there any proposals for committees to meet? No, not today. Just before we commence today, I do wish to make a short statement about an issue that was raised in the chamber yesterday, which is the recording of pairing arrangements in Hansard. Uh, Basically, this practice was stopped when the Hansard reporters stopped attending the chamber uh, during the early stages of the COVID uh, parliaments. Uh, without the Hansard recorders being in the chamber, there was nowhere for the whips to deliver pairing arrangements to. I would remind all senators that pairing arrangements are informal arrangements between the parties. Uh, in discussions uh, with the clerk, it is clear that there are no barriers to recommencing the recording of pairing arrangements in Hansard uh, if that information is delivered to the Hansard recorders, either directly or via the clerks. Uh, I've also committed to having a look at whether it is now uh, appropriate to allow Hansard recorders to be back in the chamber. All right, I'll call the clerk. Government Visitors Notice of Motion Number 1, standing in the name of the Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham, relating to the routine of business for today. The Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I move Government Business Notice of Motion Number 1, enabling consideration of a motion relating to the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Minister Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I move that the Senate A notes that 1. Today, 25 November 2021, marks the UN's International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, beginning the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. And 2. In Australia, on average, a woman is killed by a partner every 11 days, and one in five women has experienced sexual violence since the age of 15. B commends the joint efforts made by governments, stakeholders and providers under the current national plan to reduce violence against women and their children. C acknowledges that the next national plan must be an ambitious blueprint to end family, domestic and sexual violence in all forms. And D recognises that ending violence against women requires a national effort by all governments, workplaces, schools, communities and individuals. Mr President, as we mark the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, I would like to take a moment to remember and to pay our respects to the women and children who are victims and survivors of violence. There are the names and the faces that we do know. However, there are many, many more who have endured over many years great pain in the shadows and in the silence. Violence against women and children is never acceptable. It is a global issue that affects everyone, everywhere. Too many women and children are not safe at home, in the workplace, at school or online. We know gender inequality is the root cause of violence against women. And we must work across our society, including with men and boys, to change social norms and attitudes and behaviours to eliminate gender equality. Globally, the statistics tell us 
that one in three women aged 15 or older have experienced sexual or physical violence. And in Australia, we know the figures recorded in the motion. The, statis the statistics, though, can't tell us the true stories of the pain and the fear uh, and the anguish and the suffering that leads to the derivation of such numbers. And it must stop. We know the COVID-19 pandemic has also impacted progress on gender equality here and around the world, both in women's economic empowerment and in women's safety. Over the course of the pandemic, violence against women and girls has increased. Physical distancing, lockdowns have, for many, made it harder to seek and to receive help. The government has, during the course of this pandemic, delivered very significant levels of resources towards Australians' women's safety and then further delivered resources on economic security, on health and wellbeing, and to support women to realise their full potential. In our 2021-2022 Women's Budget Statement, we invested a record $1.1 billion in women's safety, in part in partnership with the states and territories, because it included $260 million for new national partnership agreements with the states and territory jurisdictions to increase the capacity of frontline support and crisis services. We are now developing the next national plan to end violence against women and children as a blueprint to end violence in all forms. Mr Rustin and I continue to work with the state and territory governments to drive that change in women's safety through the National Federation Reform Council's task force on women's safety. A key focus of that work is the next national plan. The first national plan was formed uh, in a non-partisan way through this parliament and the work of governments and oppositions here uh, and with the states and territories. Shifting the dial on violence requires a national effort by all governments, indeed I would say all parliaments, workplaces, schools, communities and individuals. The government is committed to ensuring that Australian workplaces are safe and free from sexual harassment. We commissioned the Respect at Work report, and the government's roadmap, roadmap for respect responds to the recommendations in the Respect at Work report. We've committed over $66 million in the last two budgets for the implementation of the roadmap. As I've said before, in this place and elsewhere, a number of the events of this year have been disturbing and distressing not just to me, not just to the people in this place, but to many Australians, but most particularly to those who have suffered. Stories of violence against women and children are always hard to hear. But we have to listen, particularly to victim survivors, to inform our way forward. I think in our jobs in particular that very few of us would be, after a period of time as elected representatives, would be in a position where we have not, from someone somewhere, heard their own disturbing experience, or that of a member of their family, or a friend. Too many stories. On this day, I would also invite us to consider the significant challenges in our own region, which has some of the highest rates of intimate partner violence in the world and some of the most horrific stories I have ever heard in my life. 68 per cent of women in the Pacific and 40 per cent of women in Southeast Asia had experienced violence by an intimate partner before the pandemic. Addressing gender-based violence is a key priority for Australia's aid and humanitarian programs. We have provided UN women uh, with $10 million in funding to support essential services for survivors and to deliver prevention activities. We are contributing to the UN Population Fund to conduct studies on tackling violence against women as well. We are working alongside, for example, the government of Timor-Leste through the Nabilan program on prevention activities to stop violence before it starts. This is uh, an area in which I have had some association since the 
um, since the, uh, the ballot for, uh, uh, for Timor-Leste's independence uh, in 1999, where these issues were prevalent, disturbing, uh, and a significant challenge for those communities. In the Pacific, Australia supports 15 crisis centres across eight countries, providing safe accommodation, counselling and medical and legal support. Last week, Australia joined the United Kingdom, and I acknowledge the work of my friend and colleague, the Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, Liz Truss, uh, in condemning the use of sexual violence and rape as weapons of war. And we strongly support the important work of the UN representative for sexual violence in conflict. Now, more than ever, we need to stand together to address and to prevent gender-based violence in Australia and worldwide. This year and every year, remember those we have lost, victim survivors, and those working to end violence against women and girls, particularly those on the front line. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to speak today on the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. And this day comes in the context of a profound shift in this country, but also distressing setbacks abroad. We watched, the world watched in disbelief and in, distre and in distress, the fall of Kabul and the return to Taliban rule of Afghanistan. It was distressing for all of us, but for women everywhere, there was an additional poignancy, and for women from and of Afghanistan, there was great anguish. For 20 years since the fall of the Taliban, gains were made, and the women of Afghanistan, who had been brutally repressed, fought for their agency and their autonomy. They could access education. They became politicians, judges, policewomen, teachers. They could work outside the home, and many could provide for themselves and their families rather than simply being controlled by male guardians. They were starting to have a chance to shape their own lives and shape the future of their country. With the return of the Taliban, it's likely that little, if any, of this progress can endure. And already we've seen restrictions on media and education for women and girls and a return to limits on the free movement of women. I've spoken with many Afghan women in Australia, trailblazers, community leaders and patriots, all deeply proud of their heritage and often lost for words as they witness the return of a regime whose brutal repression of women the world knows too well. And this is a story that through our history has been repeated too often. And it is why Australia must always not only take the world as it is, but work to shape it for the better, including to work in every way we are able for the equality of women and for the elimination of violence against women and girls. Here in Australia, violence against women remains pervasive. We've said these statistics so many times. One in five have been sexually assaulted or threatened. One in four experience emotional abuse by current or previous partner. On average, a woman is killed by a current or former partner every week. And these facts haven't changed for years. And what is hard is we keep saying them. And of course, behind every one of those numbers is a tragic story, a tragic loss. One of the most moving events I have ever been to was outside of the State Parliament House, where we read through the list of women who had, been, who had lost their life, who had been killed in these circumstances. And we said their names, and we held up um, um, a call flute of, for each of them. And it is a reminder of what there is behind the statistics. And of course, the numbers also don't capture the trauma that many women, many survivors endure. And how is it today in this country we still have women and children fleeing violence turned away from shelters? How is it today in this country we still have women resorting to sleeping in their cars, on their friends' sofas, or worst of all, returning to danger? 
It used to take an average of three weeks to find someone in crisis a secure home. It takes two years now. For these and so many other reasons, it would be easy to be despondent. But let's choose to be determined. Let's choose to be determined not because of those who frankly have offered too many platitudes and too much cynical political management in response to a profound moment of reckoning in this country. Let's choose hope because of the many extraordinary women who are driving this reckoning and their allies. So I choose hope because of young women like Grace Tame, Brittany Higgins, Chanel Contos and so many others who chart a path and offer hope to other victim survivors. Women who understand change doesn't mean telling people you absolutely are committed to something, it means doing it. I wish that more leaders showed a fraction, just a fraction, of the courage, determination and principle those young women have shown. A Labor government led by Anthony Albanese will ensure women's safety is a national priority. We will appoint a Family, Domestic and Sexual Violence Commissioner and we will fund, and Senator McAllister I'm sure will speak to this more, 500 new community sector workers to support women in crisis. Surely it is beyond any partisanship that women and children freeing violence should always have access to ref safe refuge, advice and guidance. When the ground disappears from under them, it is our responsibility to actually give them something to hold on to. Surely that's not beyond a, a country of our means. And we will build 4,000 homes for women and children fleeing violence and older women on low incomes who are at risk of homelessness as part of our Housing Australia Future Fund. I just want to pause here and say you know, there are always moments, you know, we get a privilege in the jobs that we have of meeting extraordinary people and some of the most extraordinary people I've met are women who uh, have gone through Catherine House, which is a service in Adelaide, which I started engaging in many years ago because my partner explained to me it was the only service at that time for women without children fleeing violence. And they're extraordinary women. I regret deeply that the Liberal government in South Australia has cut their funding. Extraordinary women. Women whose stories of courage, whose stories of perseverance, what they have overcome, more courage than I see ever in this place. We need to back them. And more, with more than words, with funding and people to support them. Because so many of them, and so many of them have, find their own path. Labor's already said we'll legislate for 10 days domestic violence leave and we'll work with state and territories for a national definition of domestic violence that includes coercive control. And we will support early intervention to reduce family violence in First Nations communities. So colleagues and Mr President, I've been in politics 20 years, isn't it, nearly? I've given this speech or a version of it for a couple of decades now. It would just be a, a wonderful thing for this nation mm. if we could actually make a difference on this. Mm. And we need to remember always that it is resources, it is political commitment to deliver resources, but it is also the recognition that inequality, gender inequality, is an essential prerequisite for this violence. And that means all of us and how we behave here towards each other, how we speak here mm. about women. That matters too, and that's a responsibility too. Australian women have said enough is enough, and they deserve a government, a parliament, political leaders who say that too, and that summon the courage and the will to turn their call into action. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Senator Waters. 
Thank you very much, <coughs> President. Uh, the theme for this year's International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women is simple End Violence Against Women Now. The key facts and figures on the UN site say that globally, nearly one in three women have experienced physical or sexual abuse in their lifetime. And one in ten, only one in ten of those, go to the police for help. Now, shockingly, these statistics are not that different in Australia. In Australia, one in three women have experienced physical or sexual violence since they were 15. On average, one woman is killed by a current or former partner once a week, and 38 women have been killed this year. Now, we know that because a volunteer organisation tracks those figures, not because we have a national toll of women killed, which the Greens have been pushing for for many years and again suggest would be a very wise thing to do to keep this issue on the national agenda and to act as a deterrent and a prevention mechanism as part of a pool of other prevention programs. I also want to note that First Nations women experience significantly higher rates of violence throughout their lives, and my fabulous new colleague, Senator Dorinda Cox, will be making a contribution um, on this uh, part of the program also. This year in particular has really laid bare the pervasive nature of gendered violence across Australia, whether it's in our homes, on the streets or in workplaces, including ours. Brave young women have come forward and have forced this conversation onto the national agenda, building on the fabulous work of strong women like Rosie Batty in years gone by. Those brave young women have been Grace Tame, Brittany Higgins, Nina Fennell, Chanel Contos, Saxon Mullins, Amani Haydar, so many others. So many, often survivors themselves, work behind the scenes to support survivors to get justice or just peace and safety to rebuild their lives. We owe it to those women to do everything we can to end violence against women now. And stopping this violence starts with believing and listening to survivors, learning from their experience so others don't have to suffer the same harm but also recognising how long and hard and disjointed the road to recovery is and supporting survivors and their children to heal. Stopping the violence takes systemic action to tackle root causes, to transform harmful social norms and to empower women and girls. We know that gender inequality and gender stereotypes foster disrespect. We know there's a correlation between the rigidity of gender stereotypes um, and the rates of violence. We know that you can't be what you can't see and that workplaces like ours should be showing leadership in the representation of women in decision-making roles. We need survivor-centred essential services that understand and respect survivor experiences and don't compound the trauma when they seek help. This requires specialist services that understand the specific needs of First Nations women, of young women, of older women, of disabled women, of LGBTIQ plus women. Um, and women from culturally diverse backgrounds. And we need funding to make sure that no woman is turned away, no person is turned away from services when they need help. Really, it boils down to this. We need some actual funding to invest in those prevention programs that start early and start in schools. We need a proper investment in housing in this nation because not only is there no crisis housing or transitional housing, it's all full, there is no affordable long-term accommodation either, and no woman should have to choose between violence and homelessness. And that is what the services are telling me on a daily basis when I speak with them. We need funding to make sure that those services have enough people, enough uh, beds to accommodate everyone that reaches out for help. And we need to tackle the gender inequality that is driving this wave, this epidemic of violence that got worse during COVID. I want to note that the second edition of Our Watchers Toolkit Changed the Story was released yesterday. Um, they are our premier uh, experts and on prevention in this country. And it confirms that we must go beyond a focus on individual behaviours to consider the broader social, political and economic factors that drive violence against women. This means promoting the equal distribution of power, resources and opportunities between men and women. It confirms the connection between harmful forms of masculinity, gender inequality and violence against women. And it points to the importance of effectively engaging men and boys in prevention work. 
The framework outlines the essential actions that are needed at all levels of society, from schools, from workplaces to governments, to address those underlying drivers and stop this violence before it starts. It calls for schools and universities supporting children and young people with the knowledge they need to develop respectful and equal relationships. And yet what we got was a milkshake video. We need a strong investment in evidence-based, age-appropriate, respectful relationships education from early childhood education and care onwards. Our watch calls for Australian employees to take, employers rather, to take the necessary actions to ensure that women both feel and are safe, valued and respected when they go to work. And yet this government has so far refused to impose a positive duty on workplaces to protect workers against sexual harassment and sex-based discrimination. Our watch calls for the media to responsibly report on violence against women and help frame the issue in the context of structural gender equality. We need to get rid of the he said, she said narrative, the slut shaming and the victim blaming that's coming from the mouths of people in this place, from some in the media and from all quarters of society, sadly, still. It's critical that the new national plan is informed by victim survivors, and I'd like to thank the amazing group of victim survivor advocates who've been working to ensure that the government establishes and supports a victim survivors advisory group. This is essential if the national plan is going to properly reflect, respect and learn from their experience. In addition uh, to ending violence against women, the national plan needs a particular focus on recovery. Victim survivors and their families often carry the burden of abuse long after escaping. It continues to affect their mental health, their economic security, their confidence, their sense of worth, their ability to engage in work and society. Broken confidence can then lead them into other abusive relationships and perpetuate a cycle of violence. An investment in trauma recovery is essential to help victim survivors rebuild. Now, we recently had the Women's Safety Summit. This was a, a showpiece of the government's response to women's safety. It was criticised by many groups as a talk fest that spoke more about what we already knew than what the government was going to do about it. The summit statement made clear that there needs to be more funding, more trauma-informed and survivor-centred approaches, more preventative actions and more homes, the very things that I outlined at the start of this speech. It's not the first time the sector has called for these things, and I fear it will not be the last. The government needs to start listening to those calls um, and build upon its often encouraging words with some meaningful actions of the quantum that is required. Now, on housing, the Women's Safety Summit was particularly clear. Affordable and accessible short and long-term housing is fundamental, so women aren't choosing between abusive relationships and homelessness. We need a serious investment in this nation to put roofs over people's heads and to ensure victim survivors have somewhere to go when they escape. We know that older women are the fastest growing group of people who are homeless in this nation, and we know that women escaping violence often have nowhere to go. In some cases, they're being put up in hotels with no wraparound supports. We desperately need genuine investment, and not just a small amount, but the real amount that the sector says is required. $12 billion over the 12 years of the life of the next national plan is what the sector is calling for. It's what they have long called for. That is the amount that is needed, and anything less will see people turned away from those services when they seek help, and that is reprehensible and utterly avoidable. Now, I want to note on First Nations Women That Change. The record has today released a report, Pathways to Safety. It is a strong, passionate and sensible call for a self-determined First Nations National Women's Safety Plan. First Nations women know how to keep their children and communities safe, um, and we need a national plan that listens to them um, and that is written, co-written by them and provides the tools that they need to end violence against First Nations women and their children. Um, I want to finish my contribution by paying tribute to the workers in this sector, of course by acknowledging that our hearts break for the innumerable women who have been killed, um, and to thank the individuals that bear that trauma in supporting those women and children on a daily basis, um, often on tiny wage, working far more hours than a, an ordinary worker because they care so very deeply. And in particular, I'd like to acknowledge Angela Lynch, who has been the CEO of the um, 
Women's Legal Service, who is uh, who has now announced her retirement after 20 years in the field. Thank you, Angela, for your amazing contribution. You've saved so many lives, and go well in the future. Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to associate the National Party uh, with the contributions made today uh, around this important uh, topic. A few weeks ago, grieving parents Lloyd and Sue Clark were nominated for the Queensland Australian of the Year Awards. They were nominated in recognition of their efforts to halt the cycle of domestic and family violence so that all Australians can feel respected and safe. The story behind their nomination is tragic, but sadly, uh, as we know, too common. After the shocking loss of their daughter, Hannah Clark, and grandchildren, Alia, Leana and Trey in February last year, Sue and Lloyd founded Small Steps for Hannah in a bid to educate Australia of co coercive control and domestic violence. The murder of Hannah Clark and her children was a line-in-the-sand moment in Australia, where members of the community came together and said that where domestic and family violence is concerned, enough is enough. Family Violence Campaigner and 2015 Australian of the Year, Rosie Batty, has risen above her own personal tragedy and the great loss of her 11-year-old son, Luke, uh, to domestic violence, and she's been able to put uh, domestic violence on the national agenda. This International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women is a crucial that, as a government, we provide education and support services in partnership with states and territories to protect women who are in risk of violence. No matter where you live, you deserve to have equal access to these services. The National Party knows that women in regional and rural Australia face unique circumstances due to their geographical location. And sadly, our women in the regions are more likely than women in urban areas to experience domestic and family violence. Our government, the Liberal and the National Party, are committed to ensuring these services are readily available. We've taken this matter incredibly seriously and delivered more than $1 billion in, of initiatives around uh, women's safety including $164 million for financial assistance to individuals escaping violence payment, $260 million for new partnership agreements and a raft of other initiatives. We provide ongoing funding to specialist domestic violence units and we know there are many barriers that victims of domestic violence face and we know that there is no simple answer. And that is why we'll continue to listen to the voices of those who know. We are now developing the next national plan to end violence against women and children, uh, and today we announce an investment of $2.8 million over three years for the Women's Voices Project uh, that will include a national summit for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women chaired by June Oscar. The next national plan is currently under development, and I'm sure Senator Rustin uh, will have more to say about that. We can, as men and women, in this place and as leaders in our own communities, and many of us are parents, uh, raise our sons and our daughters to respect others, to stand up and call out bad behaviour. As we here, as we go about our business uh, as senators in this place, be respectful to each other and demonstrate and live those values, uh, not just at home but in our workplace. We can always do more and we are committed. Behind every statistic is a tragic story. We will continue to listen to those stories to provide any necessary support to help vic victims um, be supported and to recover. Thank you. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, uh, Mr President. Well, today is the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. It marks the beginning of 16 days of activism against violence. But for a brave group of victim survivors who have been leading our public conversation, every day has been a day of activism. And some of them have had a public platform and others have had quiet conversations with friends, but all of them are incredible. And I would like to start my remarks by thanking them for their advocacy and their insight. You have had the strength and the generosity to take your own experiences of abuse and trauma and to use them to drive change and to improve the lives of other women and children. And we are so lucky and so grateful to hear from you. But the responsibility for change cannot lie solely with the victims of violence. 
as a community, we have a responsibility to come together and play our part in stopping family, domestic and sexual violence. It is a national crisis and it is a national shame. One in four women have experienced family violence and one in five women have experienced sexual violence since the age of 15. And Australian police deal with the domestic violence matter every two minutes, with an estimated 657 domestic violence matters on average every single day of the year. And they are sad statistics. These women are our mothers, our grandmothers, our sisters, our daughters, our friends, our neighbours and our colleagues. And they all have the right to live their lives safely and free from violence. And the violence of this nature does not just have a single victim. We also know how violence, the threat of violence, witnessing violence, affects children, causes trauma that may profoundly affect that child's development. And if we want a better, safer future for our daughters and our sons, then we need to press for action and take action ourselves. It's why I was proud to stand with our leader, Anthony Albanese, yesterday and announce our plan to fund 500 new community sector workers to support women in crisis, with half of those to be placed in rural and regional communities. Leaving a violent relationship is the hardest and most dangerous thing that many people will ever do. And we know that having a community sector worker there, standing beside you, helps make all the difference. But right now, women who are fleeing violence are turned away from services because there are not enough workers to help them. And the services I speak to across the country who are at the front line when it comes to supporting women at this time of great peril tell us how much they could do, how much more they could do with an extra pair of hands. So, for example, last week I visited the women's cottage in Richmond with my colleague from the other place, the member for Macquarie, Ms Susan Templeman. And the women's cottage currently has just one part-time domestic violence caseworker, and despite her best efforts, they really cannot meet demand, and the waiting list continues to grow. And based on demand for their services, they say they could easily benefit from two full-time workers. The manager, Maria Lozado, tells us that ongoing casework resources would mean that their advocacy and support would no longer be limited or short-term. They could walk closely with women and walk with them through that hardest part of their journey after escaping violence. They would be able to provide the support women need to find safety and to re-establish their lives. These concrete announcements and commitments matter. In 2007, Labor came into government determined to tackle the epidemic of violence against women and children. We created the first national plan to reduce violence against women and their children. In the first few years of that plan, Julia Gillard, Jenny Macklin, Julie Collins, Kate Ellis, Tanya Plibersek, other Labor women made the most of this opportunity. We saw the creation of a national hotline, 1800 Respect, a violence prevention body, Our Watch, the Australian National Research Organisation for Women's Safety, ANROS. And these years represented the most productive and progressive periods for women's safety. It is deeply unfortunate and this is the kindest way that I can say this, that this enthusiasm and progress did not survive the 2013 change of government. The First Minister for Women under the coalition government in 2013 was Mr Abbott. And that action set the tone for the eight years to follow. It should go without saying that a commitment to ending violence is nonpartisan. And I appreciate the remarks from colleagues across the chamber today. But as an opposition, we owe it to our communities to be honest when worthy objectives are not supported by meaningful action. Yesterday, Labor again committed to national leadership on this issue. We announced that an Albanese Labor government will implement a new Family, Domestic and Sexual Violence Commissioner. Now, this was a recommendation from the House of Representatives inquiry into family, domestic and sexual violence um, to deal with some of the issues of coordination and delivery that we have observed in relation to the national plan. It's part of our ongoing commitment to tackling the scourge of violence. And our focus is on providing women with the housing and the economic support that they need to establish a safe life. On any given day, Women's Crisis Accommodation Services across Australia will have to tell women fleeing violence that they have no room to house them or their children. 
They will sleep in a car. They will go back to a dangerous situation because they have no other choice. How is this acceptable? Labor recognises the extent of this problem. It's why we will allocate an additional 4,000 units of social housing to women and children experiencing family violence and to women on lower incomes at risk of homelessness as part of our Housing Australia Future Fund. We will also provide $100 million for crisis and transitional housing for these, women, for these women. This gives survivors of violence a chance to rebuild their lives. No woman should have to choose between her job and leaving an abusive situation. We will establish 10 days paid domestic violence leave. We know that employment is enormously protective. A job means social connections with colleagues. It means financial security. It means independence and self-worth. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have made it abundantly clear that services will be most successful when they are designed and delivered by First Nations people. They are also calling for a separate national action plan for First Nations people to end violence against women and family violence, and Labor supports this call. These are practical solutions advocated by people who work to support women and children at their time of greatest need every day. Labor is committed to action and bringing down the rates of violence in our communities. Over the years, there have been too many words and too little action, especially from our national leaders. Acting with urgency and ambition is essential if we are to make an impact and decrease the rates of family and domestic violence. I began my contribution today by reflecting on the impact of the advocacy and the insights of victim survivors of domestic and family violence. The Australian community owes a great deal to these people who have experienced the most horrible of situations, but are relentless in their efforts to improve the lives of other women and other children. We should do everything in our power to avoid adding to their numbers. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Um, well, I too rise today to speak about uh, a very important issue that every Australian needs to take responsibility for on today, the International Day to Eliminate Violence Against Women. Before I start, can I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people? Can I also acknowledge Indigenous people in this place and Indigenous people uh, who may be listening? Can I acknowledge those who have lost their lives at the hands of an intimate partner? And can I acknowledge those that have survived but bear the scars of what has happened to them? Family, domestic and sexual violence is everybody's business. We cannot go forward as a nation and end violence against all Australian women and children, end violence against all Australians, unless every single Australian takes responsibility to ending violence. We must change the attitudes of Australians so that they understand the damage that is done when violence is perpetrated in its very many forms. And to do so, we have to understand respect. We have to respect each other and we have to understand the impact that our words and actions have on other Australians. Because as we know, all disrespect doesn't end in violence, but you can be absolutely assured that all violence starts with disrespect. And that is why we collectively together are committed to the delivery of the next national plan to end violence against women of their and their children. And we have embarked on a significant consultation process because everybody's voices need to be heard and everybody's voices need to be listened to. It is exceptionally important that we listen to the voices of First Nations women and girls. And that is why today we made the announcement in conjunction uh, with June Oscar, with Marsha Langdon, with Sandra Creamer and a number of very strong Indigenous women to say that the voices of women and girls need to be heard and we must make sure that we have a dedicated action plan for First Nations women and girls that is informed by the voices of their people, that is delivered by their people for their people. I would now like to tell a, a story. One Friday night earlier this month, emergency services were called to a fire at a res residence in the Hidden Valley 
town camp in the Northern Territory. Most of the fire had been extinguished by the time the emergency services arrived, um, and the alleged victim, a 34-year-old woman, had suffered extensive burns and sadly died two days later. A police officer in the Alice Springs Criminal Investigation Unit told journalists the woman, a mother, was known to be at risk of domestic violence. He said, we believe there was fuel used in the fire and we believe the fire was started as a result of a fight. The alleged offender, a 36-year-old man, uh, was the woman's partner and he too died several days later as a result of the burns. Last week, when I visited the Northern Territory in my role as Women's Safety Minister, just about every single person said to me, where was the national outrage? What occurred in the Northern Territory on that Friday night was an utter tragedy and something that shocks and should shock every Australian to their very core. There absolutely should be national outrage, but there wasn't. And we know of the statistics in relation to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women when it comes to family, domestic and sexual violence are so disproportionately uh, overrepresented in comparison to non-Indigenous women. And that is why we must listen to the voices of Indigenous women and girls to make sure that they, their solutions to this problem are delivered. And can I acknowledge today um, Senator Cox uh, and Senator Thorpe, who I have been in discussions with in relation to making sure that we inquire into these missing and murdered women. They have the right for the rest of Australia to understand what has happened to them. We support you, Senators. But across the whole of the landscape of Australia, we need to continue to invest. We need to invest in leadership. We need to make sure that we have a coordinated approach to domestic violence, because we need to make sure that every single cent, every single resource, every single activity that we deliver in this space is targeted to the outcome, and that is supporting women and children in this country who are either at risk of domestic violence or who are victims of domestic violence. That is why the single largest commitment, the $1.1 billion that was made in the 21-22 budget as a down payment on the next national plan to end violence against women and their children, is so important. The Commonwealth needs to take a leadership role. And that was why yesterday, uh, as a result of the recommendations of the consultation process, the, the, uh, joint, uh, the House inquiry uh, into domestic violence, as well as the, as the National Summit, the recommendation for a domestic violence commission and commissioner to make sure that we take a coordinated approach, because we need to improve coordination, we need to have transparency, we need to have accountability, because this problem is a shared responsibility. And the best way to make sure that we make the best use of all resources is if we coordinate that approach. We will make sure we have a properly funded commission with the horsepower, the resources and the staff to make sure that we can truly deliver on that commitment to make sure that we deliver on everything that we say. We also need to make sure that we stop violence before it happens in the first place. That's why we must focus on respect and consent. We need our young Australians, we need our children to understand that they must grow up being respectful of each other, because only then will we embed respect and consent into the national psyche so that we actually can start reducing the number of people and eventually end up with no Australian. I mean, Australia with a future Australia free of gender-based violence is the Australia that I think every single person sitting in this chamber aspires to achieve. So we have to deal with prevention, but we also have to deal with early, early intervention. We must meet this um, crisis early on. So we need to focus on making sure that we are addressing perpetrators. Um, we cannot only deal with response, no matter how important response is. We must deal with early interventions. Of course we must deal with response. That's why we put $260 million into a, an NPA over the next two years, to make sure frontline services were able, are able to respond. That is, 450 organisations have benefited from the $130 million that was provided last year. We continue to invest in things like safe places so women and children have got a safe place to go when they make that brave decision to escape a violent relationship. But we also need to make sure where we can, we should be keeping women in their homes and their children in their homes so they have the support mechanisms of their family, their friends and their school. 
The perpetrators are the ones that should be punished for what happens here. We must, wherever it's safe to do so, make sure that the woman does not become the person who's punished. We must make sure that it is the perpetrator that is held to account for their actions. And so, keeping women in safe in their homes where it is able and safe to do so, we should focus on, and we will. Um, we also need to make sure that when women do make that brave decision to escape violence, that we provide them with the resources to set up a safe place when it isn't safe for them to stay home. That's why our escaping violence payment program that was announced during the budget provides women escaping violence with $5,000 so that they can put that towards a start to make sure that they can create a safe place for themselves and their children. But we also need to make sure that we stay with women who are victims of domestic violence through the entire recovery play phase. We need to make sure that we support them to get well and we support them back into work. We need to understand that recovery is also tremendously important. So to the Chamber can I say this government is absolutely committed to drive towards an Australia that is free of all gender-based violence. We are absolutely committed to it, and I believe that our track record of investment suggests that we are. We are very close to the finalisation of the next national plan to end violence against women and their children. And the most important thing that I believe that we need to do is to make sure that these are the voices of victims and survivors that inform what we do going forward. Their voices, they're the brave, brave women and children of Australia who have come forward and told their stories must inform the next national plan. And so what I would like to say today to the women and girls of Australia, this government is listening to you. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, uh, President. Today is International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. The greatest and most direct impact of family violence is on our women, trans women and sister girls. Violence against women, particularly First Nations women, is not inevitable. It can and must be prevented. We must work together to do this, all of us, not just across this parliament, but every single one of us. Violence against women is not a woman's problem. It is a social problem. This is why every single one of us has to play a part in the solutions. To be effective, solutions to ending violence against women, particularly our women, our matriarchs, must be both culturally safe and holistic, because the solutions must be carefully safe. They must be self-determined by our women, for our women. We need self-determined solutions at every stage, from prevention to early intervention, response, recovery and healing. Every single response must take a holistic approach that addresses not only the immediate problems we face but also the underlying socio-economic factors that we did not cause that contribute to this violence. There can be nothing about us without us. This is why any solution for it to work must be culturally safe and self-determined. Mainstream approaches to ending violence do not engage with the issues surrounding cultural trauma caused by dispossession, land theft, the forced separation from our families and the attempts to destroy our cultures. These are all legacies of colonisation and they must be reckoned with. First Nations women want a stand-alone national plan and a stand-alone national summit where we can inform that plan. Self-determined and to ensure we include community-controlled family violence prevention legal services health services and other Aboriginal community-controlled health organisations. Finally, all violence prevention responses must take a human rights approach. 
centred on our rights to self-determination and facilitate the necessary cultural healing needed to be successful. Cultural healing that is based on the strength and resilience of our people and cultures must be at the heart of any violence prevention measures. Australian Greens, through my colleague Senator Cox and I, acknowledge and hear the cries of our women and children. We hear the cries for systemic change to prevent any more black women or black children being murdered. Today we are proposing a motion which uh, Minister spoke about, and I might add that um, our conversations over the last 24 hours have been uh, It's incredible how we can get stuff done in this place when people take the time to listen and to have the support of the government into an inquiry on missing and murdered Aboriginal women and children in this country is historic, I believe. And I want to thank the government, particularly the minister, uh, for listening and for acting on such an important issue that our women have been fighting for for so long. Our women have the right to live their lives in safety, with full human dignity and free from all forms of violence, including family violence. So I pay my respects and I honour our women and the struggles and the trauma that they face every day. And I particularly honour those who've lost their lives. And after uh, Senator Cox and I spoke to the minister last night, we talked about women in our families who've been murdered, who've had no justice, no justice, because they weren't important enough for investigations to happen around those murders. And the woman that was murdered in my family was carried by her perpetrator and dumped on the front lawn of her mother's house in Morwell, Gippsland, Victoria. Because there was some substance abuse involved in that family, the police response was that they were drunks and no one was held accountable and that woman, my cousin, was left dead on the front lawn of her mother's house in Morwell. So I'm going to use a minute to just sit in silence and reflect on all of those women and children who've died at the hands of not only the system that didn't protect them, but by the perpetrators um, who did the wrong thing and aren't held accountable. So uh, I, I respect the chamber and ask the chamber just to have a moment's silence. Thank you. Thank you. That's the end of my contribution.
Minister Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, it's possible I have a funny feeling that the two of us may have been about to rise and say something very similar. Uh, Mr. President, we have heard uh, some incredibly uh, thoughtful, uh, heartfelt uh, contributions across this chamber, important contributions and reflections uh, on a very important issue uh, of relevance to our society in Australia and of relevance right around the world, uh, particularly uh, in some nations that I know Senator Payne and Senator Wong in particular uh, reflected upon. Mr President, it's right uh, that we have heard those contributions, and it is also right that we have listened to those contributions. And by we in particular, I reflect uh, upon the men of this chamber. To date, in this debate, uh, we have heard uh, from the many thoughtful, powerful, leading women who lead our nation. And we are fortunate across all of our parties to have these voices here with us. It is something this chamber should be so proud of in terms of the changed reflection uh, that has had and been occurred across here in the composition of this chamber, even in my time here, uh, but particularly over an even longer period of time. While it is right that we listen as men and that we hear the voices of women, it is also right that we take responsibility, that we show leadership and that we not be silent on these matters. And that as men, we too should be clear that change is needed. The change is needed of culture and that change comes from leadership, from our own behaviours, by the setting of example, by the calling out of what is unacceptable, by making sure, as current campaigns indicate, that we stop it at the start. That we stop it at the start in terms of domestic violence, in terms of gender-based violence, in terms of violence uh, that does afflict the lives of far too many families. That we stop it at the start because we know from the research the intergenerational aspects in relation to gender-based and family-based violence. That in doing so, Mr President, uh, we take the stand as men alongside women alongside all in ensuring uh, that we heed uh, the messages in this motion uh, that we don't just listen but that we act. And Mr President, I thank uh, the women of this chamber uh, and the many women advocates across Australia and particularly the victim survivors and their families across Australia for the advocacy, uh, for the persistence, uh, for the dedication that they have shown uh, and for the manner in which over a long period of time, so many women have helped to change attitudes, to change awareness and to make sure that we all understand the need to take the greater sense of responsibility. To give assent to the motion, I ask that senators rise for a moment's silence to acknowledge those who have lost their lives and those who are survivors of domestic violence. I thank the Chamber. We will now return to the order of business. I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, Crimes Amendment Remissions of Sentences Bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Scar. Uh, Mr President, I rise in continuation with my remarks with respect to this piece of legislation, the Crimes Amendment Remission of Sentences Bill. And at the commencement of my re remarks, I referred to a very troubling case of a Mr Brookman, who was convicted under the Crimes Foreign Incursions and Recruitment Act for services he provided in Syria. He was convicted of those offences and sentenced on 23 June 2021, but there were 342 emergency management days of remissions immediately deducted from his sentence, which resulted in Mr Brookman being immediate, immediately released. And it wasn't until 6 July 2021, some 13 days later, that an interim control order could be uh, imposed 
with respect to Mr Brookman to mitigate the risk that Mr Brookman, given his past offending, represented to the community. And I think, Ms. Madam Acting Deputy President, that that example brings into stark relief the issues which this bill is seeking to address. And there are five further matters which I want to deal with in terms of uh, the continuation of my contribution. The first is for this place to note that we're talking here about federal offences and persons convicted under federal offences. The reality of the situation is that this issue of remission arising from so-called emergency management days only occurs in Victoria. Only occurs in Victoria. So there is an inequity, an inequality in terms of the application of those remission days across the country. And I put it to you, Madam Acting Deputy President, with respect to federal offences, convictions under those federal offences, the application of remission should not be dependent upon which state jurisdiction a particular prison, prisoner is in custody. The second point I want to make is around the uncertainty that the use of emergency management dates presents with respect to release dates. And we saw that in stark relief in terms of the case of Mr Brockman and the uncertainty, the uncertainty which is presented when we have the application of these emergency management days. The third point I want to make is the 342 emergency management days, which were uh, remitted off the sentence of Mr. head sentence of Mr Brookman, were in fact arising out of the COVID pandemic emergency. And the COVID pandemic emergency and the impact that it had on Mr Brookman whilst he was in remand was actually considered by the sentencing judge. So the application of an additional 342 emergency management days represents a doubling up a doubling up of that being considered in terms of the sentence to be served by Mr Brookman. It wasn't as if, it wasn't as if that the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic was not considered. It was in fact considered by the sentencing judge and in her sentencing remarks. But the reality was there was no uh, appreciation at the time of sentencing that this additional 342 emergency management days would be taken off the sentence. Uh, previous speakers, in particular Senator Thorpe, has referred to the retrospective nature of the legislation. And I think uh, this was a very good point to raise because the, the practice is, and the practice should always be, that as a general principle, as a general principle, uh, legislation should not seek to have retrospective effect with respect to matters such as this. However, that is a general principle, and it was carefully considered carefully considered by the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee when we conducted our review of the legislation. And I'd just like to read paragraph 2.31 of our report in this regard. And to quote, the committee draws to the Commonwealth Government's attention concerns raised during the course of this inquiry about the retrospective application of the bill. The committee notes, however, that on balance, and these matters are always a question of balance, the committee notes, however, that on balance these concerns do not outweigh the clear advantages associated with ensuring greater certainty that sentencing decisions for federal offenders are not reduced or amended. This is particularly the case when these offenders continue to pose a serious risk to the community. Moreover, the committee notes that the bill would not authorise the removal of remissions granted to offenders who have already been released from custody. So those are two key points, I think in relation to the consideration by this chamber of the retroactive application of the bill. Firstly, that it doesn't seek to impose retroactive application to those who've already been released. That's the first point. And then the second point, with respect to those who have not been released, this chamber has a duty, an obligation, in my view, to balance the retroactive application of the bill on the one hand with the threat to community on the other. And in my view, in this case, as an exception to the general rule, the balance falls in favour of the passage of this bill and to ensure that we don't have any more cases such as Mr Brookman convicted for performing so-called services in Syria, convicted for six years and eight months imprisonment 
only to find that with the application of 342 emergency management days of remission, he was immediately released into the community without the federal government having an opportunity to seek an appropriate control order in the circumstances. And with that, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, I commend this bill to the chamber. Okay, Minister. One moment. Thank you. And I thank senators for their contribution to the debate on this important bill. The Crimes Amendment Remissions of Sentences Bill of 2021 will enhance community safety by addressing the unacceptable and unjust consequences of remissions that Victoria is granting to federal offenders during the COVID-19 pandemic. The effect of Section 19 capital A, capital A and the application of emergency management days in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic is that many federal offenders incarcerated in Victoria, including terrorists, child sex offenders and drug traffickers, are receiving substantial discounts off the sentence expiry date set by the sentencing court. Removing the automatic recognition of these remissions known as emergency management days, will ensure federal offenders serve the sentence as set down by the court at sentencing, regardless of which state or territory in which they serve that sentence. It will promote community safety and achieve certainty about the release date for offenders. I thank the Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee, the Senate Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills, and the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights for their careful consideration of the bill. The government welcomes the recommendations of the Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee that the bill pass and does not accept the recommendations made by the Australian Greens in its dissenting report. The government agrees with the committee that, on balance, the concerns about retrospective application do not outweigh the clear advantages of ensuring greater certainty that sentencing decisions for federal offenders are not reduced or amended, especially where offenders continue to pose a serious risk to the community. The bill restores certainty about the end date of a federal offender's sentence, and so the matters relating to retrospectivity don't change that in the slightest, and it allows agencies and prisoners to plan the rehabilitation process ahead of their release. The circumstances that allowed high-risk federal offenders to serve shorter sentences than those set down by the courts in Victoria must not occur again. Keeping Australians safe is the government's highest priority, and this bill ensures that offenders who are in prison from the time of commencement will not receive any remissions off their sentences and will instead serve the sentence that the court considered at sentencing was appropriate for them in light of their circumstances, their offending and their risk profile to the community. The bill addresses the significant risks to community safety and unacceptable and unjust consequences of high numbers of emergency management days being granted by Victoria during the COVID-19 pandemic. Once again, I thank senators for their contribution to the debate and I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. <clears throat> so the question is that the bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Is division required? Ring the bells.
it's Mickey? It's Mickey, yes. Okay. Right, yeah. I'll leave you there. Then. Yeah, no worries. Stop the bells. So the question is that the bill be read a second time. The eyes will move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint Senator McGrath for the eyes and as teller for the eyes and Senator McKim as teller for the nose. Senator McKim. The result of the division is eyes 23, nose 7. The question is resolved in the affirmative and I'll call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Crimes Act 1914 and for related purposes. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. I move that the bill now be read a third time. So the question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Crimes Act 1914 and for related purposes. Thank you. Clerk. 
Government Business Order of the Day number two, Social Security Legislation Amendment, Remote Engagement Program Bill 2021, Second Reading Debate. Senator McAllister. Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Social Services Legislation Amendment Remote Engagement Bill 2021, and I move the amendment that has been circulated in the name of Senator Brown. This bill and its remote engagement pilot program was the government's first test of its commitment made to First Nations people on closing the gap. Let's be clear, it has failed the test. The Prime Minister was very happy to stand in the parliament and talk all about the government's new partnership with First Nations peoples. This is what he said, to fundamentally change how governments and First Nations people work together to achieve reform. But this bill does not measure up because the government failed to consult with the people affected by the bill. This bill discredits the partnership agreement the government made with the Coalition of the Peaks and the First Nations people that they represent. And it's very on brand, isn't it, for the Prime Minister? Always an announcement, never a deliverable. Rather than consulting with First Nations people, rather than delivering a remote employment service that would create jobs and economic development, rather than addressing the underlying challenge of living in remote Australia, the government has de decided to delay any change to the status quo and conduct a two-year pilot program. This is years after senators in this place, myself, Senator McCarthy, Senator Dodson and others, participated in a wide-ranging Senate inquiry into the CDP, when the then minister, Minister Scullion, told us that he was going to reform the CDP. Where are we? A pilot program, further delays. Living in remote Australia is becoming increasingly more challenging. On average, remote Australians have shorter lives, higher levels of disease and injury, poorer access to health services compared with people living in metropolitan areas. And this is caused by multiple factors. In addition to a lack of real jobs, there is a lack of adequate housing and a lack of access to essential services. These are real challenges. AIHW data from 2018 shows that almost one in five Indigenous Australians are living in chronically overcrowded housing. Nationally, 18 per cent of First Nations people, compared to just 5 per cent in the general population. And the level of overcrowding increases with remoteness. Over 20 per cent of adults in regional areas and over 48 per cent of adults in remote communities. And the highest levels of overcrowding in Australia occur in remote Northern Territory. Based on the 2016 census, about 27,600 Aboriginal Territorians live in overcrowded houses, of which 10,700 of those people are considered homeless. And this lack of adequate housing and overcrowding affects every aspect of community life. It increases the level of domestic violence, of suicide. It impacts on mental health. It increases a lack of safety, of poor hygiene and the spread of disease. And during the time of the COVID-19 pandemic, addressing the issue of overcrowding has never been more important. This problem is well known at all levels of government, and it is a continuing national shame. This bill continues that shame. It is an immense disappointment. Last year, the government signed up to revise targets in the national agreement on closing the gap, including a reduction of overcrowded housing. This bill fails that test. Nothing will fundamentally change for CDP participants in remote communities. What remote Australians, without consultation, are being offered is a two-year trial of new ways to undertake work-like activities. We don't know what work-like activity means, but we do know that it won't mean real jobs. We don't know who will be eligible to participate in the trial. But we do know that these volunteers must stay on JobSeeker. The new remote engagement program is just another work for the Dole scheme. It is not a new employment service. It's unbelievable that the government continues down this path. It will not be replacing the CDP with a program targeting job and skill development. It's just undertaking a rebranding exercise. The two-year pilot is a rebranding exercise. It is the CDP by another name. A Labor government will replace the CDP with a genuine remote employment program, one that puts in place the best elements of the community development employment program. 
a program that creates real local jobs with proper wages and conditions and offers meaningful community control and a pathway to self-determination. When the CDEP was operating in remote Australia, job seekers could do more than just receive their unemployment benefits. They could take on real local jobs, created and administered by local First Nations communities, and be paid at around national minimum hourly rate. The CDEP offered a genuine alternative to being on welfare, and there were flow-on benefits for remote communities, meaningful control, a pathway to self-determination. The scheme operated under a flexible funding model that allowed communities to complete self-identified projects. This government appears to genuinely have a problem with the idea of Indigenous self-determination. I remind the Senate that the CDP was designed and implemented by this government. It is a broken and discriminatory program, and it's been operating under various iterations since 2015. It's a remote work for the Dole program. It's much harsher, with many more compliance requirements than it's expected in job seekers in other regions of Australia. And I've seen with my own eyes the humiliating conditions that participants are subjected to. Humiliating conditions for grown men and grown women, literally working with garbage in some of the centres that I visited. Time and time again, the government tries to fizzle, fiddle with the requirements of the CDP to make it less onerous, but it cannot be fixed. The Senate inquiry into the effectiveness and appropriateness of the CDP found that, that project was an abject, found the program was an abject failure. Expert witnesses to that inquiry argued that the CDP was discriminatory and that it actually acted against job creation. The CDP was acting as a pool of cheap labour. And these experts also said that the CDP was damaging because more than 50 per cent of all penalties imposed on job seekers across Australia were for people on CDP. The repeated breaches and imposed penalties resulted in the loss of income payments, causing financial distress and increasing poverty. I can well recall people fronting our committee and explaining that in their community many people just disengaged because the endless compliance requirements, the humiliations, the breaching meant that it was just not worth it. Financial distress and poverty resulted in more local crime and increased family violence. And all these outcomes are well known. They are not unknown to the government. They are acknowledged by Minister Scullion when he promised to change it years ago. Why is the government being so stubborn? Why does it continue to reinvent and rebrand this failed program? Why doesn't it listen to remote Indigenous communities and leaders? Well, I fear that it is because the government believes it knows best for remote Australians. It was just two years ago when the government said it would get to the bottom of remote job seeker concerns on CDP by undertaking an evaluation, 2019. And that evaluation found that most participants found that the C thought that the CDP had been bad for their communities and that the high penalty rates were discouraging people from participation in these work-like activities. Here we go again. Same program rebadge. Rather than responding to the concerns raised by First Nations people, the government comes into the parliament with a bill that offers more of the same. The Aboriginal Peak Organisations of the Northern Territory, APONT, told the Senate committee inquiry into this legislation that what the government still fails to understand is that CDP participants are already trained. They have worked and will work if there are jobs available. And data shows that nothing is changing for remote Indigenous communities under a Work for the Dole program. APONT also tell us, and I quote, that over the last decade the employment gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians and remote Australia has grown and that the poverty and social harms that arise from this have increased. I'm not surprised because the evidence from all of the providers that we spoke to in the inquiry some years ago were that even when people undertook training, the provider didn't maintain a register of the training that they'd completed. Even when a job did become available in the community, the provider had no way of identifying which members of that community would be suitable for that work, because actually tracking what had been accomplished in the work-like activities wasn't a part of the brief for these providers. What a disgrace. 
Labor has many concerns with this bill and with its pilot program. And they are primarily that it is just another government delaying ta tactic. It does not challenge the real tackle, the real, it does not tackle the real challenges of living in remote Australia, and it just kicks the issue down the road till after the next election. It brings back just another work for the Dole program and not a genuine remote employment service. But the bill does one thing. It will establish a remote engagement participation payment a supplementary payment for volunteers to their income support. And this payment, up to $190 a fortnight for 104 weeks, will be offered for undertaking these new work-like activities. Not for very many people. It's for 200 participants in the four identified pilot sites. This is not a reform, it's a delay. Only the minister knows what the compliance regime will be attached to this pilot, but we do know that participants will not be offered the normal protections of other workers, like wages, leave, entitlements and superannuation. They will not be offered traineeships or apprenticeships. They have no guarantee of a real job at the end of the two years. And the lack of detail in the bill means we do not know whether the pilot program will be discriminatory or compatible with human rights. And the minister asks us to take this government on trust. But it has broken so many of its promises to First Nations people. The most recent being its failure to deliver a voice to the parliament and a referendum on constitutional recognition in this term of government, and its absolute failure to roll out a national vaccine strategy for First Nations people. And it cannot be trusted to improve the lives of First Nations participants on CDP. First Nations people do not need the government to adopt this delaying tactic. They are very clear. They want to be listened to. They want the CDP to end, and waiting two years is too long. They want action that addresses the challenges of remote living, challenges that affect their lives and are holding them back. A Labor government will end the CDP. We will listen to First Nations people and put in place a program that generates economic growth and creates job opportunities, because there is no substitute for paid employment. Labor respects the closing the gap approach to policy and program development. We will work with local Indigenous organisations on the kind of local programs that will make a real difference. And our programs will be implemented via Aboriginal community controlled service providers and include large scale Indigenous employers in remote Australia. Their expertise will be central to the design of any new employment program. This bill says it all. It reveals that the government has a problem with the idea of First Nations determination. And yet again, it has not positively responded to the views of First Nations people. Yet again, they have adopted delaying tactics as a means of tackling a major problem, offering the parliament a slight nothingness as the way forward on addressing a big issue. You don't need a pilot, a two-year pilot, two years of delay. First Nations people have been saying telling this parliament, telling this government clearly for many years they want a new employment program implemented across the country, one that helps address the underlying challenges that are holding them back. What's the use of a trial in just four remote locations when a good employment program should be flexible enough to be tailored to the needs of every community from the beginning? Remote Australians are tired of waiting. They should not be asked to be patient and wait. The situation in remote communities is dire. And we won't stand in the way of the passage of the bill. The participation and payment will provide a benefit for some small number of CDP participants in their communities. But for the other 29,500 plus active CDP job seekers, those unable to volunteer for the pilot, nothing will change for them. They will not receive the participation payment and they remain on the CDP until sometime in the future. After the next federal election, I imagine, most likely, to 2023. This is not a good outcome, and it's not how a Labor government would approach it. We will listen to First Nations people. We will work with them on a program that gets people into local jobs, gives people hope, and helps end poverty in remote communities. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, uh, President. I wish to speak to the Social Security Legislation Amendment Remote Engagement Program Bill. This bill proposes a pilot for a follow-up program to the current community development program, or what we call CDP. 
It proposes to trial new approaches to delivering employment services in remote communities. The Australian Human Rights Commission has many times raised concerns that the CDP could be inconsistent with Australia's international human rights obligations. The Australian Greens welcome the move to replace the CDP, but we are concerned that this new proposed program is repeating the same mistakes as the CDP. As part of this pilot program, the government is introducing a new payment of between $100 and $190 per fortnight for a maximum of two years while people do work-like activities for up to 15 hours per week. This new payment will be topping up other income support payments that people may receive. The problem is people in the program contained in this bill are not even going to get the minimum wage for the work they are doing. This pilot program also does not give people a living wage or industrial protections because they are not considered to be employees. During the inquiry into this bill, we heard from the Australian Human Rights Centre and the Northern the North Australian Aboriginal Justice Agency that, and I quote, the bill creates another work for the dole framework and is a missed opportunity to trial genuinely alternative approaches based on creating jobs and promoting the right to fair and just conditions of work. The framework established by the bill, predicated on the concept of conditional welfare, thus risks repeating many of the mistakes of the CDP." End quote. The government tells us they are proud of co-designing programs with First Nations people. They say that these pilots will be co-designed in partnership with the pilot communities and that the new payment will be trialled alongside other approaches to supporting people into work or training. We can't say if the principle of free, prior and informed consent, as set out in the United Nations declarations on the rights of Indigenous people, has been followed in choosing the pilot communities. What is being done here is actually not co-design. You can't call a program which has already been designed by the government and then gets trialled within communities as being co-designed. If this government has a genuine commitment to the goals of self-determination and community-based governance, First Nations people need to be not just at the table but at the steering wheel from the very beginning. We need self-determination, but also the resources to succeed. The Australian Greens are concerned that this program only focuses on building skills and providing work experience, but it does not address the underlying causes of unemployment or underemployment in regional and remote areas of our country, which is the actual lack of economic and job opportunities. People can't be job ready if there's no jobs. The government needs to provide good, sustainable economic empowerment. First Nations communities and elders, leaders and organisations have long demanded that all levels of government work in true partnership with First Nations people. They are already really good ideas out there on how to do that. Just ask. Ideas that come from First Nations people. Just ask. The Aboriginal peak organisations of the Northern Territory have put forward their proposal, <coughs> Fair Work, Strong Communities. Under this plan, 
12,000 jobs in community-controlled organisations would be created while valuing the strength, resilience, cultural, environmental and community care that is done every day in our communities. I foreshadow second reading amendments in my name and I also advise the Senate that we will be supporting Senator Brown's second reading amendment. It is a bit rich, however, that the Labor Party are now all of a sudden claiming that they are the best friends of our people in rural, regional and remote areas when they have come to this very chamber to support the destruction of country in the Northern Territory. Is that double speak? This is why we need Greens in ba balance of power. We would kick the Liberals out and pull Labor in to do the right thing for our people instead of just talking the talk. We need to fundamentally change our approach to thinking about First Nations people in this country and trying to find self-determined solutions and listening to those solutions. We need a treaty. Simple as that. We don't need a voice to parliament. We don't need a referendum. We can do a treaty without those things and make that part of the negotiation. We need a treaty. Decades and decades Aboriginal people have fought, marched, rallied for a treaty. Have you ever heard of a blackfella marching and rallying to jump into the Australian constitution? I haven't, and I've been going to these rallies since I was five. A treaty or treaties can acknowledge the ongoing and historical injustices of colonisation that have caused our communities to be impoverished. And a treaty can also show us the way forward as a nation. You talk about uniting. We have a party called One Nation. We do need to unite and we need peace. First Nations people want peace. A treaty would protect the rights of First Nations people, genuinely. It would also protect our land and cultures and it will allow us to self-determine our own destiny. It would establish a proper framework of how we can come to decisions together and it will lead to much better outcomes. It is time you move on from making decisions for, for our people. You've got to stop making decisions for us. I don't make decisions for your family. Why do you make decisions for mine? Why can't we make our own decisions? We know what the solutions are. And you see, even with how we can work with the government and we can create solutions together, that's what a treaty could bring this whole nation. It is time you move on from making decisions for us. Let us make our own. And the Australian Greens cannot support this bill in its current form. Thank you. It being almost Senator O'Sullivan, did you wish to start? For no, I think we'll just move on. It being almost 11:15, uh, we will move to Senator O'Sullivan a little bit later on, and we will move on to notices of motion. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day, Senator Fear of Auntie Wells? Thank you, Mr. President. Pursuant to notice given yesterday on behalf of the Standing Committee for the scrutiny of delegated legislation. I withdraw notices of motion proposing the disallowance of five legislative instruments as listed at item five on today's order of business. Thank you, Senator Ferrivanti Wells. Uh, is there a report from the selection of bills committee? Senator Smith. 
present the 13th report of 2021 of the Selection and Bills Committee, and I seek leave to have the report incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Question is the Senator Rustin. I seek leave to move um, together um, to amendments to the Selection and Bills Committee. Is, uh, is, is leave granted? What, what, what are the two of it? Yeah, I was about I, to read them. Yes, okay. It, oh, sorry. <laughs> I, uh, I move the following amendment. At the end of the motion, add, and the Autonomous Sanctions Amendment Thematic Sanctions Bill 2021 not be referred to the committee. And I move the following amendment. At the end of the motion, add, and in respect of the Religious Discrimination Bill 2021, the Religious Discrimination Consequential Amendments Bill 2021, and the Human Rights Legislative Amendment Bill 2021, the provisions of the bills be referred to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee for inquiry and report by the 1st of February 2022. Is leave? I beg your pardon. Okay. We've had a request that they be dealt with separately, and they will be dealt with separately. But leave is granted to move. So, Minister. Sorry. I have moved them. I, I move the amendments then. Okay. Well, we needed actually to grant leave, sorry, Minister, so we will now need to formally. No, you had leave now to move them. Read them again, or yeah. you're happy for them to take them as stand? Just move, you can just move them. I move the amendments. Thank you. Okay. I, do you. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. If I could just on indulgence for clarity, could you indicate that the, quest, the, the, the question on these motions will be put separately? Yes, you, you have requested that the, the, the matters be addressed separately, and they will be addressed separately. So I call the minister uh, to move another amendment. To deal with we'll, first, okay, yeah. we should deal with these amendments. So first of all, so, oh, some debate. Send, uh, thank you, thank you Mr. Senator President. Gullard. Okay. I wasn't sure that the selection of bills report had been moved. Yes. Right, it has been moved. Okay, so that clarifies that. Uh, look, the uh, opposition doesn't have a problem with the, f the amendment the government's moved on the autonomous sanctions amendment thematic sanctions bill 2021. Um, but in respect of the religious discrimination bill 2021, we do um, have an issue with that. Our preference would be that this matter go before a joint select committee, which I advised I cannot move an amendment to that effect at this part of the program. Mm. Um, we do believe that on a bill like this, where there are, you know, it has been an issue that has, uh, you know, attracted interest from a number of different stakeholders, that it would be good if the parliament dealt with this across both chambers, um, with people from both chambers being able to participate in that inquiry. Uh, that would be our preference. I would say, and I'm, I'm reading the room that uh, perhaps the government has the numbers for this, that a reporting date of the 1st of February really doesn't show any genuine interest at all in actually having a genuine inquiry into this um, report or the ability for stakeholders uh, to, to participate in an inquiry like that. I mean, it's essentially saying, yes, we will con conduct an inquiry, but it will only be held over the Christmas holidays after a year like this. And I think that shows a lack of, you know, seriousness from the government to deal with this in a way that brings people together, which um, you know I think is our preference. And we've no noticed from the way the government has chosen to conduct um, the discussions around the preparation of this bill that they haven't reached across the chambers to other parties in this place. They haven't invited people to the table to assist with the drafting. We didn't have a copy of it till it was released publicly, and that was after three or four days of media speculation and brief, briefing out to the media about what was in it and what wasn't in it. So I think from our point of view there is a lack of genuineness from the government about dealing with this in a way that is in the national interest as alone to, um, to some political interest. And 
um, the reporting date just seriously um, supports you know, my view on that, that the 1st of February really is not long enough uh, for a suitable inquiry into this matter. Senator Carr. Mr President, I'd like to say a few words on this matter. Since I'm the Deputy Chair of the Committee and there's been no consultation with the Committee, none. Now, I'm not known for a person that does not commit fully to my job. I believe I've been here, uh, my record throughout this last year of the pandemic has been equal to anyone in terms of my attendance. Uh, this committee has a very heavy workload and we have, I believe, fulfilled it conscientiously and not sought to duck our responsibilities to this chamber. And now we're being told, without consultation, that irrespective of what you're doing at the moment, that you can do this bill over the Christmas break. Now, it would seem everyone else in this place, this building, is entitled to spend some time with their families, is entitled to enjoy some respite from the hurly burly of this place apart from the members of this committee who haven't been spoken to. And if anyone was to suggest that this was a simple matter, that this was legislation that can be dismissed with on the papers, they would be sorely mistaken, given that the government has taken the better part of three years and many attempts to get it in some sort of shape, you would have thought they would at least have the courtesy of talking to the people that are now expecting to actually undertake the parliamentary review of it on behalf of the chamber. Now, I haven't started on that. You see, in the last two days that the documents have been available, the last two days, there's been a flurry of information being provided by the different interests concerned with this bill. Because it's not just the question of the rights of the religious, it's also the question of the secular community. And we are discovering that there are different points of view about that. But what would you expect if you're going to start to prioritise human rights? You're going to say some people have rights at the expense of others. Of course there's going to be a major dispute about that. But you think you can just sweep that under the carpet? You can just slide that away over the Christmas holidays and no one will notice? Well, think again. It is a gross, gross abuse of this chamber and of the processes of this chamber to try to pull a swifty like this. Now, I expect nothing less, I suppose, in, in some senses, that a controversial matter like this has taken so long to resolve within the Liberal Party or the National Party, you'd expect us to all sign up to it. Well, that's not going to happen. There's got to be a proper process to allow people in this community to have a view about these things and express it properly. And you've got to have time for members of this committee to be able to make an assessment of those views and report back to this chamber in a proper manner. The 1st of February is what you're saying. You are treating this parliament with contempt to suggest that that's going to be an adequate time to examine the complexity of this issue. In my own state, there are going to be views expressed about whether or not these matters are in fact legal. I read numerous reports in the press today as to whether or not this matter should be subject to a High Court challenge. There are varying views within the religious communities about these matters. But you expect us just to tick and flick a matter on these, of this importance over the Christmas holidays? That is the contempt at, heart, at the heart of this. 
the contempt of everybody in this place. And I say to you, those that think there's a quick, easy settlement here, you are buying yourself so much trouble, you don't begin to imagine that it can be fixed by a sleazy, slimy little arrangement like this. And that's what it is. Senator Carr, resume your seat. Senator Rice. This is outrageous. Here is a piece of legislation that has been in the making for years, which we know from having just seen it in the last <coughs> day is actually going to increase discrimination, not reduce discrimination. And yet the government is trying to just quickly get it out of the way to try and pretend that that's not the case. It is so disrespectful to the whole Australian community who, are go who have an interest in this legislation because it's complex legislation. Because on the one hand, we've got the Prime Minister saying it's all going to bring us together and it's going to protect people of faith. And on the other hand, when you read this legislation, you see that it is actually going to increase discrimination, allow people to make offensive statements and to get away with it. It is going to be legislation that overrides a massive, a massive um, overreach by overriding all the state and territory anti-discrimination legislation. It's going to allow further dis discrimination in schools. Whereas we had the Prime Minister promising that he was going to reduce discrimination in schools and not allow students to be expelled because of their sexuality or their gender identity, this legislation is actually going to consolidate that position. It is actually going to give schools more ability. It's actually going to encourage them to actually be using the provisions in this legislation to be expelling students and to be sacking teachers on the basis of their gender identity or their sexuality. This in itself is bad enough, but we know that that's this government's agenda. We know, OK, that's the government's agenda. That's, they're putting it on the table. They believe in it. We don't, but they believe in it. But let's leave, have the committee inquiry, which is what we do in this Senate, to be able to thrash this out, to be able to get all of the views of the community, of the many, many stakeholders. And it's not just the LGBTIQ stakeholders. It's people with disability. It's women. It's people of minority faiths. All of these people, they want to have a say because they are affected by this, by this legislation. This legislation allows people to make offensive statements against people with disabilities. It allows people in the street to come up to people and say that your disability is a punishment from God. This legislation will allow people to make offensive statements against women, to tell them that they should subject the, to, their, um, to the will of their husband. It allows people to make offensive statements against single parents to say that their same-sex relation, to say that they're having children out of wedlock is sinful. This legislation allows people to make offensive statements against same-sex couples. For a lesbian to have a colleague to continually say to her that you know oh, well, I'm going to pray for you to find you a husband. This is the sort of thing this legislation does. So at the very least, we need to have a decent inquiry. To, to make this clear, to thrash this out. And yet we have a government that has the gall, a minute before we are considering this issue, to then distribute an amendment, to then table an amendment which says that we are going to have an inquiry that's going to be completed by the end of January. How disrespectful to all of those members of the Australian community who want to have a say. Because what that means is that if we're going to have an inquiry that um, reports by the end of January, any hearings for this inquiry would have to be at the beginning of January, just to, you know, when people are on their summer holidays. It is outrageous. It is absolutely outrageous and just so disrespectful, but typical of this government who have just got it in their head that this is the direction they want to go to ride roughshod over the interests of the vast majority of Australians who actually want to see legislation that decreases discrimination. People want to see a country where everybody is able to live their lives free of discrimination. They do not want to see legislation that is going to increase discrimination against women, against people with disabilities, against um, LGBTIQ Australians. So absolutely the Greens are going to be opposing this. What we had hoped through the selection of bills process last night, we reached agreement that we would defer what committee and what the reporting date was going to be until 
um, until next week. It gives a bit more time to talk through these things sensibly. But no, the last minute, just before midnight, we had this, this amendment from the government, this disrespectful amendment. So I have, also, I have moved an amendment uh, to, the amend to the selection of bills report to actually say that— um, Senator Rice, your time yep. has expired. Sorry, Senator Patrick Walsh on his feet. Yeah, thank you, uh, um, Mr. President. I, I won't be, be long. I, I do think we do. We should reflect on the comments of Senator Carr, just in terms of uh, uh, the burden that uh, this reporting date will place on people who wish to submit to the committee. It will also uh, burden uh, the members of the committee themselves. But I don't think we should forget the secretariat as well, who will have to work all the way through what is traditionally a rest time for. Uh, everyone in this place. Uh, this is a bill that is, and, and I, I don't want to prejudge anything, uh, but this is a bill that is like a can of worms. We're going to have to un we're going to have to take the worms out, straighten them up, and then put them back in some order because it really is going to take a lot of effort because of the differing opinions that will be, uh, you know, coming in through the submissions and already uh, are in the minds of senators. Uh, it would make a lot of sense to defer this uh, reporting date, at least until some time in March, uh, I think is, w would be wise. And I, look, I can speak for myself, uh, and I'm pretty confident uh, I've got a feel of the crossbench in, in relation to this. Uh, 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 you know, with, I mean, Senator Lambie may, may speak for herself, and, uh, but I was also part of the organisation for the, for the other crossbencher. Um, if, if you don't do an inquiry properly, I certainly won't be voting for, for, for a bill, and uh, I can see that Senator Lambie, Lambie is indicating that as well. So you roll the dice in respect of that. Why not just go to, to, to March uh, and let everyone have a proper inquiry? President. Senator McKim. Um, thanks very much. Uh, Senator Rice has uh, circulated an amendment to, um, uh, to the motion currently before the chair, which is um, to, at the end of the motion, add, and in respect of the religious discrimination bill, the religious discrimination consequential, consequential amendments bill, and the human rights legislation amendment bill, the provisions of the bills be referred immediately to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee for inquiry and report by the 2nd of June 2022. Now, I'm going to move um, that amendment, Chair, but I want to seek leave to amend the date in that motion. Is leave granted? He can just move an amendment to the So all you need to do is move an amendment. All you need to do is move an amendment to Senator Rice's motion to, to Senator Rustin's motion amending the date. Okay. Well, I move, I move uh, an amendment uh, using the words I just read out, but with the date of the 21st of March. Very quickly, in support, uh, in speaking of support of this, um, there seems to be a, a general agreement across, right across the Senate, that the that these bills should have a Senate inquiry. I think everyone has that position. So what we're discussing now and what we're asking the Senate to consider is actually a genuine inquiry. These are complicated pieces of legislation. They will have a significant impact if they pass on the lives of a large number of Australians, in particular um, people living with disabilities in Australia, our LGBTIQ plus community. But it's not just those folk. It is a large section of the Australian community and of Australian society that will have their lives meaningfully impacted by these bills. And we should not be making significant changes to um, the discrimination framework, the anti-discrimination framework that exists in this country, without giving them giving the issues raised by these bills a thorough exploration, not in a quick and dirty inquiry, as the government is suggesting, but in a proper, a proper Senate inquiry where these complicated issues can get the airing 
that they deserve. And we believe that a reporting date of the 21st of March would strike that balance. Minister, you were seeking the call earlier. Minister Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, uh, indeed, this legislation is, uh, is legislation that, uh, that has been uh, subject to numerous rounds of uh, public consultation. Um, it, is, uh, it is not legislation that has uh, been unseen uh, previously. Uh, the vast majority of the legislation, the vast majority of this legislation, has been well versed with the different um, uh, different stakeholders in relation to this bill. Uh, the government, in committing with the introduction of this bill, uh, did make clear that we also viewed the further consultative processes of a parliamentary inquiry, of a Senate inquiry, uh, to be a very important part uh, of adding value to those pre-existing consultation processes uh, that have been undertaken, Mr President. Uh, so that's why we have sought, uh, on the day of the introduction of this legislation to the parliament, uh, to, in good faith, ensure that it is referred for inquiry, uh, consistent with that commitment uh, to continue to undertake uh, consultation. I've heard Mr President uh, comments uh, around the chamber in relation to the timing and duration uh, of the inquiry. Um, uh, I understand that, uh, that the Christmas period is, uh, you know, does involve, of course, the holiday seasons for many Australians, but I do note that the referral period is a nine and a half week uh, period uh, between now and the 1st of February, Mr President. Uh, the, uh, the, there's, so, so Senator Carr in particular doth Order. protest a little too much, Mr President. Um, uh, others have made thoughtful contributions, but uh, Senator, oh, I, I will be Senator Lambie, fear not. I will be. Um, Senator Lambie, order. At, um, uh, thanks for the gratuitous advice. Um, uh, but Mr President, uh, the, uh, there's a nine and a half week period in this regard, and now committees, of course, Order. Committees, of course, are able uh, to make their own recommendations and determinations through that process, including in relation to additional time uh, if a committee itself so determines. Uh, but it is also the case that, uh, that the government uh, wants to get uh, the advice and the feedback from a Senate committee process in a manner that, uh, that can enable consideration of this bill uh, by this parliament. Uh, and, uh, and so we have sought, as I say, to act on the very day of its introduction to the parliament and uh, to provide for that referral in the conventional Order. way. Senator Carr, you know full well that the vast majority of bills are referred uh, without talking to the committee before. Um, you've been, you've been here Carr. so long that you Order. know that uh, well and truly to be the case. It is, <laughs> it's a fact, Senator Carr. It's a fact. Um, uh, so, uh, Order, Senator Carr. Oh. I can only imagine, Mr. President, what Senator Carr would have called it had the government not supported referral to a committee. And so we are supporting referral Order. to a committee. We are putting forward that referral in the conventional way of, in the conventional way of sending it to the Senate Legal, Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee, uh, the standard process for consideration of legislation. We're doing so, providing a nine and a half week uh, reporting period uh, for uh, for that committee. Uh, and of course, as I indicated before, you know, the members of that committee, in terms of their consideration of all aspects of this, you know, are at liberty to make their reports to the Senate, obviously on the substance of the bill, but also in relation uh, to if they deem further time to be necessary in relation to working through such matters. Uh, but the government uh, does wish for the parliament to ideally hear the committee's views and the feedback from the committee uh, prior to. Um, uh, the consideration of this bill, uh, but to enable sufficient time for the bills to be considered by this parliament. Senator Roberts, I believe, is seeking the call. Senator Roberts, can you hear us? I can, Mr. President. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. This is uh, to do with the uh, referral of Senator Hanson's bill to the committee, right? I, I've had difficulty tracking. N not, yet. not yet. Sorry, uh, Senator not yet. Roberts. Okay. We have not moved. To I'm that sorry. Yet. I'll, I'll, I'll pay closer attention and so jump in when, are there when any I seek the call when that comes. contributions on this matter? If not, I will start by putting the amendment moved by Senator McKim 
to the motion moved by Senator Rustin. Um, those who agree to that. Um, oh, Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll move an amendment to Senator McKim's amendment uh, to insert the date 15th of February. But where it, wherever it is. <laughs> Just give me some. All right. We will start with Senator Wong's amendment to Senator McKim's amendment to Senator Rustin's motion. The question is that that amendment be agreed to. Make it very clear. This is Senator Wong's amendment for a reporting date of the 15th of February. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Ring the bells for four minutes. That's question time. That's question.
stop the bells. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Wong to the amendment moved by Senator McKim to the motion moved by Senator Rustin be agreed to. Eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart, teller for the eyes. Senator McGrath, teller for the nose. There being 25 ayes, 25 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. We will now move to Senator McKim's amendment, uh, which changes the reporting date to the 21st of March. Uh, I will move that amendment to the motion moved by Senator Rustin. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for. One minute. Four minutes.
stop the bells. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator McKim to the motion moved by Senator Rustin be agreed to. Eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart, teller for the eyes. Senator McGrath, teller for the nose. There being 23 ayes, 27 noes, the question is resolved in the negative. I will now put the substantive motion as moved by Senator Rustin. Those, of, uh, those in favour of the motion say aye. aye. Oh. oh, sorry, so this is the substantive motion as moved by Senator Rustin on government sheet one. Okay, we okay? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. no. The ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bell for. One minute. Stop the bells. Uh, the question is the motion be agreed to. Eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator McGrath, teller for the eyes, and Senator Urquhart, teller for the nose.
There being 25 ayes, 25 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I will now, Senator Carr, Senator Carr, I will now put uh, the motion moved by Senator Rustin on sheet government, uh, sheet government two, sheet GOV two. This is uh, to do with the autonomous sanctions amendment. Those in favour of the motion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Now, time for the debate has expired. I will just confirm that senators still wish to move additional amendments. Senator Gallagher. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. I move the amendment uh, relating to the corporations. Do I need leave to do that? Yeah, no, I see. No. Oh, I move. Um, oh, we, want, we have no time to talk okay. to them, so just move the. Yeah, motion. I move the amendment that's been circulated in my name around the corporations amendment, improving outcomes for litigation funding participations bill 2021. The question is that amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. no. The ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. However, I will just give the whips a couple of moments. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart, teller for the ayes. Senator McGrath, teller for the noes. someone behind combat. There being 24 ayes, 26 noes, the question is resolved in the negative. Now I will move to an amendment. I'll allow people just to resume their seats. But move to an amendment from Senator Hanson. Uh, Senator Roberts, the time for the debate has expired, so there will be no opportunity to speak. I understand. Oh, Senator Dunningham is moving that amendment. I move the amendment on behalf of Senator Hanson as circulated. The question is that amendment be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Hanson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say oh, ayes will pass to the right of the chair, noes to the left. I appoint Senator McGrath, teller for the ayes. Senator Urquhart, teller for the noes. There being 26 ayes, 26 noes, the question is resolved in the negative. One final amendment from Senator Lambie. Do you wish to proceed with that amendment, Senator Lambie? Uh, thank you, Mr President. I move the amendment circulated in my name to the selection of bills. Thank you, Senator Lambie. The question is that that amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for... To assist the chamber, I will put the question again. Uh, those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Lambie be agreed to. Eyes will pass to the right of the chair, notes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart, tell her for the eyes. Senator McGrath, tell her for the nose. There being 25 ayes and 26 noes, the question is resolved in the negative. I will now put the substantive motion as, as amended, uh, as moved by Senator Smith. I think it was Senator Smith. It's a while ago now. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Cox, I believe you are seeking leave. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> I seek leave to move a motion and make a one-minute statement to refer to a matter to committee as circulated. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I move the motion. Uh, today, uh, I have uh, moved a motion that has been circulated on the UN International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. This important motion is history making and it's history making because in this place we have the opportunity to refer to the committee an important issue an important issue on this day for first nations women and children who have been missing and murdered this issue has continued for generations generations of families and communities that have been affected. And just this morning, you've heard my colleague, Senator Thor, stand and in her speech talk about the personal connections that we have for women that have been murdered in our families. In the media, Senator there's been Cox. lots of controversy. Senator Cox, I'm sorry your time has expired. I will now put the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Senator Urquhart. Thank you. Mr President, um, I withdraw general business notice of motion <clears throat> number 1283, standing in the name of Senator McAllister. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. I now proceed to the placing of business. Senator, Rustin, uh, Senator Dunning. I move that today government business orders of the day, as shown on the order of business, be considered from 12.15 pm. Government business then be called on and considered till not later than 1.30 pm. And general business notice of motion number 1281 be considered during general business. Uh, is that motion agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clerk. Government Business Order of the Day number 6, National Redress Scheme for Institutional Child Sexual Abuse Amendment, Funders of Last Resort and Other Measures Bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, thank you. 
introduces two changes from the list of changes that the scheme needs. Namely, it allows governments to take on the role of funder as last resort if no organisation exists to claim against and does not have the financial capacity to participate in the scheme. And it improves the, name, the naming and shaming rules for institutions that do not join the scheme. These changes are yet another example of the government being dragged years too late to things that could have been done immediately to improve the lives of victim survivors. Nevertheless, these changes do represent improvements to the scheme and will be supported by Labor. At the same time, these changes will not result in a scheme that sees Australia live up to its promise to survivors. The list of important and necessary reforms is much longer than what is addressed in this bill. From the second anniversary review of the scheme alone, the recommendations the government has failed to act on is too long to get through in the time allocated today. Labor has spent years calling for the introduction of an early payment scheme to ensure that the elderly or unwell do not miss out on redress. The government finally came to the table a little earlier this year. It should not have taken years for the government to come around and do the right thing. It is particularly sad how long this has taken because it doesn't even cost anything. It just brings forward part of people's payment. While adopting early payments was an improvement to the scheme, in practice it is still leaving too many people behind. Labor is hearing too many reports of elderly survivors not receiving their advance payment or having that payment delayed. It's important that the government get the advance payment scheme working efficiently. Survivors have waited long enough, and some do not have much more time left. The scheme as it operates today is simply too slow to provide justice to survivors. Apart from the time taken to process applications and provide advance payments, the scheme too often takes too long to handle revocations themselves a delay in process. Survivors deserve a scheme which focuses on their needs, their experiences, on speedy access to justice, not just on proceduralism and box ticking. The scheme also, as it stands, fails to provide the ongoing psychological support that survivors have been calling for. The Royal Commission originally recommended this, and the changes in this bill do nothing to address these needs of survivors. In many cases, people are being provided with as little as $1,250 to cover future counselling and psychological care. Many survivors will likely need counselling and psychological care from time to time throughout their lives. A redress screen that took the needs of survivors as its first focus would provide lifetime psychological support and counselling. That is what Labor has been calling for because that is what survivors say they need. The government always claims that the changes needed to make the scheme everything it should be requires agreements from the states. They're right. It does. And that is not a reason to stop trying. That is a reason, in fact, to take action and show leadership. The government needs to actually do the work with the states to see an increase in the payment cap, a fixed assessment matrix, an end to the indexation of prior payments, because that is what Australians expect and that is what survivors deserve. And if the minister has found any state governments resisting doing the right thing, well, tell us. Tell us who they are. Don't let them stand in the way of this country doing the right thing by survivors and doing it now. Minister. I presume there's no other speakers. Are there any other speakers before? on this bill? No, I presume the Greens are not speaking on this bill. In that case, I will then. Minister, you have the uh, call. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, I thank Senator McAllister for her contribution on this important piece of legislation. Uh, the bill, as has already been outlined, will amend the primary legislation for the National Redress Scheme for in Institutional Child Sexual Abuse. The bill ensures survivors of institutional se uh, child sexual abuse who were unable to access the redress scheme due to uh, the institution responsible for their abuse no longer existing or the institution being unable to meet the necessary requirements to participate in the scheme can now, as a result of this, seek redress. This was a significant recommendation of the second year review and on that basis I commend this bill to the Senate. The question before the Senate is that the bill be now read a second time. Those to the opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the National Redress Scheme for Institutional Child Sexual Abuse Act 2018 and for related purposes. Minister. Minister, no amendments, as I understand. 
Yeah, I've got it. No amendments having been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. I move minister. The, thanks, Mr Acting Deputy President. I move that the bill now be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the National Redress Scheme for Institutional Child Sexual Abuse Act 2018 and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day number 7, Offshore Electricity Infrastructure Bill 2021 and two related bills. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. Well, if there is one thing that this government excels at, it is that they never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. Whether it's a vaccine rollout in a pandemic or addressing climate change, this government always seems to be a day late and a buck short. And offshore wind is no different. But let's put aside that they're late to the party and let's embrace the fact that they showed up at all. This legislation will finally allow offshore wind to begin in earnest in Australia. These bills establish a regulatory framework for electricity infrastructure in the Commonwealth offshore area. The bills would allow the construction, installation, commissioning, operation, maintenance and decommissioning of offshore wind and other electricity infrastructure. And just like solar, where Australia could become the Saudi Arabia of solar power, become the wind superpower as well. We have one of the longest coastlines in the world and we are, after all, an island nation. There is so much potential. And the energy providers are already there. And once again, as with most things, energy and climate related, the government is playing catch up. There are more than 10 projects waiting for the government to bring on this legislation so they can get on with the job. And those projects have massive capability. Star, off the south of Gippsland, when complete, will produce enough energy to cover 20 per cent of Victoria's current energy needs. One single turn of an offshore wind turbine can provide as much energy as a whole day's worth of rooftop solar. These turbines can turn 15 times each minute. And some of the best wind resources are located just off the coast of the regions that have powered Australian, and, uh, Australian industry for generations. Gippsland and Latrobe, Newcastle and the Hunter Valley, Illawarra, Gladstone and central Queensland. These regions have the strong electricity grid infrastructure, the ports, the railways and, most importantly, the populations for new energy and new industry. These communities and their workers have the most to gain from a thriving offshore wind industry. So it's not just the energy created that benefits Australia, it's the jobs as well. The turbines need maintenance and there's a network of ships and ports required for that maintenance. Green Energy Partners have two projects they are looking to start exploratory work on, off the Illawarra and off Newcastle. They want to use Port Kembla as a construction hub. The government likes to talk up technology, not taxes, but here we see them late to the game again when it comes to offshore wind technology. I actually think uh, it was probably a decade ago that I had the very good fortune to go to the United States and do some work on uh, energy transition. At that time, there was a coalition of energy providers up and down the east coast of the United States working to establish the regulatory arrangements for offshore wind. A decade later, we're finally getting around to it. Why so far behind when there is so much to be gained? Now, there are some issues with the bill that we don't feel are adequately addressed. The Senate committee examining this bill, including the government senators who lead the committee, made some suggestions that it considered were important to the legislation. And these include amending the objects to better uh, objects clause. I'm sorry to better incorporate electricity transmission and exports. Australia can be the battery of Southeast Asia, especially after we harness the opportunity of offshore wind. We need to have in mind not just the domestic uses of this power, but the opportunity to export to other nations. The committee also recommended an amendment on the consultation requirements for declared areas, and we agree with the committee that the consultation requirements should include the Minister for the Environment, affected state and territory governments, energy planning authorities and developers. There should also be greater transparency and timeframes incorporated into the declaration process, and the committee supported further consideration being given to these matters. The Senate inquiry had two additional concerns that weren't reflected in the final report. In particular, Labor has concerns over the bill's work health and safety framework. The committee heard substantial evidence that the government has not adopted the harmonised national workplace health and safety law in the bills. 
Instead, the committee heard that the government has amended those laws into an essentially unrecognisable state. If we don't have a harmonisation of these workplace health and safety frameworks, we may end up with a situation where a worker would be subject to one regulatory regime onshore, a second while in transit on a vessel and a third while operating on an offshore renewable project. That poses confusion for everyone involved and it presents risks for workers and employers. Now, to be fair, there is disagreement on these points, including between the department, the regulator and stakeholders representing both employers and workers in the industry. But given this significant difference of opinion, Labor urges the government to urgently undertake further consultation, both on the content of the workplace health and safety provisions and their coverage. If the government chooses not to do that, and there is a change of government at the next election, which I certainly hope there will be, Labor will undertake that work. Our national platform is clear. Labor will improve and harmonise the workplace regulatory frameworks covering workers in offshore clean energy. Now, Australia has some years to get this right, during the feasibility period, before construction begins, and it's crucial that we do. Labor's second concern is that the bill does not require local benefits to be included in merit criteria for licences. When the Minister of the Day is considering whether to grant an offshore electricity licence, he or she should be required to consider benefits for local workers, businesses, communities and First Nations peoples. The committee heard it was important for this requirement to be reflected broadly in legislation in order to allow and ensure that they are reflected in detail in the regulations. So Labor would also welcome the government considering a legislative amendment to ensure benefits for local communities where these new industries will be situated. But in summary, we welcome the bills. We called for them. The government promised them, then delayed them. And while we don't seek to hold up the passage of these bills, they would benefit from further amendments. Business needs, needs certainty and swiftness. Workers need proper workplace safety frameworks, and the opportunities for local communities and workers need to be considered and included. Senator Waters. Uh, and I rise to speak on the offshore electricity infrastructure bill. We need this bill to create an offshore wind industry to help us drive coal and gas out of our energy system. We need this bill in order to build the international transmission networks that we need to replace coal and gas exports with clean energy exports. It will only be abundant, dirt cheap, clean energy that will enable us to attract manufacturing back to Australia and transform our coal and gas reliant regions so that they remain economic powerhouses that export our sun and our wind to the rest of the world. Australia has around 2,000 gigawatts of offshore energy that we can harness. Now, to put that into perspective, Australia's entire grid is around 55 gigawatts of capacity. So we're talking about 40 times Australia's current energy use blowing right now across our offshore waters. However, this bill does need improvements, and we have amendments circulated that do three main things. Firstly, to ensure that our abundance of renewable resources are matched by an abundance of Australian jobs. We want a local content clause to ensure that wind companies that commit to securing Australian workers and Australian services get preference in securing, uh, securing offshore titles. Secondly, we would like to make, our amendments would make clear in the objectives of the Act that the purpose of the bill is to encourage clean energy exports, and thirdly, that the section on financial assurances required of clean energy projects doesn't come into place until a similar regime exists for oil and gas assets. The government has well; they've said they've committed to doing this, but they're dragging their feet. So once this bill passes. Offshore wind projects will have a higher burden of financial assurance than oil and gas projects, which of course are far more dangerous. Such are the favours that oil and gas companies enjoy in Australia under this government. The Liberals love red tape when they can wrap it around things that they don't like, like clean energy that threatens the profits of their coal and gas donors. However, we understand we don't have majority support for those amendments, and we do want to facilitate the quick passage of this legislation. I understand that Labor supports the intention of our amendments, and we will continue to work closely with Labor in future parliaments to ensure that this bill is improved on, uh, particularly in relation to the work health and safety provisions that the government refuses to improve. However, we don't want to jeopardise this bill's quick passage. There are projects that need this bill to pass so that work can progress over the summer, like the Star of the South, which will replace Australia's oldest and dirtiest coal plant, Elorn, in Victoria's La Trobe Valley. That project will replace 85 per cent of the supply that Elorn currently produces. 
That's Australia's dirtiest and oldest plant, whose life was extended in a secret deal by the Victorian Labor government. This project proves that we don't need it and that the contract to prop up coal should never have been written. But in conclusion, harnessing the abundance of our offshore wind resources, um, we can drive the cost of energy down, potentially close to zero, giving Australia a competitive edge to bring back manufacturing to our shores and to ensure that heavy industry can continue in a carbon-constrained global economy. The biggest winners of this bill and the clean energy transformation will be regions like Gladstone in my home state of Queensland, Gippsland and the Hunter in Illawarra, deep water ports with heavy industry. These nearby rich offshore wind resources will provide those regions with the clean energy needed to create hydrogen for steel, ammonia for export and power heavy industry and manufacturing at dirt cheap prices. This is an important step to drive coal and gas out. We keep it in the ground and we support this bill's passage through the parliament. Senator. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, and I rise to speak on the Offshore Electricity Infrastructure Bill 2021. Uh, this bill establishes a regulatory framework for offshore electricity infrastructure to finally allow the construction of offshore wind and other electricity infrastructure. And this bill is so long overdue, delayed by the chaos and the division of this government. Chaos and division in delaying this very vote. Uh, chaos and division in delaying a real climate action plan. Uh, chaos and division delaying the good, secure jobs that this new industry will deliver. There are a dozen offshore wind proposals around the country at various stages of readiness, just waiting for this step from the government, this long overdue step from the government. Uh, and these delays are completely unacceptable because this is a global race. Uh, there is a global race on to bring the opportunities of the global transition to green energy right here to Australia. It's a global race that we are at risk of losing because of this government, because of the division in this government, holding the jobs of the future to ransom. Uh, the first of these projects that is absolutely ready to seize this moment, this moment in time, uh, is in my home state uh, in Victoria, and it's the Star of the South project uh, in Gippsland, uh, a region that is crying out for the jobs of the future, crying out for this government to take swift action to deliver those jobs of the future. Uh, the Star of the South project will provide 20 per cent of Victoria's energy needs and power 1.2 million homes. It will invest $8.7 billion into Victoria um, over its lifetime, with the significant majority of that investment being in Gippsland and in the Latrobe Valley. Um, but most importantly, this project will create jobs in an industry that has a bright future ahead of it. Uh, and just yesterday, we saw the type of leadership and vision uh, that this industry and these communities uh, need, uh, not from our Prime Minister, uh, but from the Andrews Labor government. Uh, it was on Tuesday that the Victorian government announced a $40 million funding boost for offshore wind projects, the largest single offshore wind announcement in Australia's history, in my home state in Victoria. Victorian coastlines are amongst the best in the world for these projects, and the Andrews Labor government are positioning Victoria to lead that global race. Meanwhile, the Morrison government they haven't even started running. The Morrison government had the chance to deliver jobs with the Ryan Corner Wind Farm project to power the Snowy Hydro project. And of course, this government missed that chance. Keppel Prince in Portland is the only manufacturer of wind turbines in Australia. Uh, and this manufacturer was primed and ready to go to provide those turbines to deliver the content for the Snowy Hydro project. But instead of using local content, uh, instead of using local manufacturers, instead of using local companies, uh, that project will be using imported products and overseas companies, uh, because that is how the Morrison government does its business. Um, this is a decision that has already cost 40 jobs in a small regional town that desperately needs those jobs. Uh, and 
This kind of um, approach from the Morrison government has the potential to cost so many more jobs uh, in this global race for the renewables jobs of the future. Um, this was a chance for the Morrison government to deliver good jobs in green energy, and like so many opportunities, they squandered it. Uh, instead, they lost those jobs. Uh, and this is what we can expect from any Morrison government move to a renewable energy future. No commitment to local content, no commitment to local jobs. It's as simple as that. Workers know what they're going to get from this government. Um, a glossy document, uh, but no real plan to deliver the future job opportunities of this global race to Australians. Uh, unlike this government, Labor has a plan. We have a plan to see Australia become a renewable superpower. Um, a Labor government will invest $20 billion to rewire the grid. We will make electric vehicles cheaper. We will support 10,000 new apprenticeships in the energy trades of the future. We will have 400 community batteries powering 100,000 homes. We will invest $15 billion in a national reconstruction fund, creating exactly these types of jobs and cutting emissions in the process. And we will make sure that our regions are at the centre of this change. We will make sure that our regions are at the centre of this shift to becoming that renewables energy superpower. Uh, that is our plan because we should be a country that makes things here uh, and because we need to win the global race and bring the jobs of the future right here to Australia. Does any other honourable senator, senator wish to make a contribution? I'll give the call to the minister. It appears not. Well, I do thank senators for their contributions and commend the bill to the Senate. The question before the Senate is that the bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Offshore Electricity Infrastructure Bill 2021. Offshore Electricity Infrastructure Regulatory Levies Bill 2021. Offshore Electricity Infrastructure Consequential Amendments Bill 2021. An amendment has been circulated, therefore we are in committee. Oh. Okay. President, um, the Greens are not moving their amendments. As the amendments are not being moved, does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. I ask minister. that the bill be now read a third time. The question before the Senate is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Offshore Electricity Infrastructure Bill 2021. Offshore Electricity Infrastructure Regulatory Levies Bill 2021. Offshore Electricity Infrastructure Consequential Amendments Bill 2021. Government Business Order of the Day number two, Social Security Legislation Amendment Remote Engagement Program Bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate and on the amendment moved on behalf of Senator Brown. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much. Mr Acting Deputy President, I rise today to speak on the Social Services Legislation Amendment Remote Engagement Programs Bill 2021. Uh, this bill will build on the Morrison government's commitment to reform employment services and is a critical component of the national agreement on closing the gap. It is one of the many uh, during this sitting period that the Morrison government is progressing to advance the cause of regional Australians, especially, uh, especially Indigenous Australians. <clears throat> Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, this is a bill that I am particularly glad and, and proud to stand up and speak on today because this is a reform that I have been championing actually for over a decade, uh, long before I came into this place nearly two and a half years ago. Uh, I, I commend the government for bringing this on and this bringing this introduction of this bill, and I am proud to be part of a government that puts in place uh, such sensible reforms in this area. This bill enables remote communities to co-design their implementation of government services, a real voice of government, a real voice to government, beg your pardon, if you will. Uh, Mr 
Acting Deputy President, this bill will help reform remote employment services, and it will do it in a way that sees the ongoing rollout of these services adjusted by feedback from populations of remote communities. The reforms will also be piloted in partnership with remote communities, ensuring that support is available to aid in the rollout. This bottom-up design and implementation is what communities for a long time have been asking for, and it's what we are delivering. Those opposite love to play lip service when it comes to the idea of a true Indigenous voice, but when it disagrees with their blinkered world view, when communities cry out for things like the cashless debit card, for example, they run a mile and return to their top-down Canberra-based decision-making model, more concerned with appeasing latte lefties than actually listening to communities. I'll have more to say about the cashless debit card in a, in a moment, but Labor's lies in that area really need to be called out. But for now, <clears throat> and back to the positive reform that is the Remote Engagement Program Payment Bill 2021, this bill will provide the framework allowing new approaches to welfare and employment services provision to be piloted in remote communities ahead of a wider implementation of the government's budget commitment to the Community Development Program, the CDP, which will be replaced in 2023. Now, lessons learned from the pilot sites will inform the design of the new program to be rolled out in 2023. Initially, we estimate around 200 job seekers, 200 eligible job seekers across the pilot sites will volunteer for this payment. The collaboration supported in this bill will allow communities to develop programs that are appropriately flexible, enabling the building of skills and capabilities of the people in remote communities. Importantly, this bill will not see a return to the old training for training sake model that really uh, has been a, a blight across much of these sort of programs. In fact, it will move our service delivery in the opposite direction. I've seen the hopelessness that can be overcome when people get a job. I've seen the hopelessness of people uh, undergoing training for training's sake and it not leading to anywhere. We know that many people have dozens of qualifications yet no job prospects. Equally, I've seen the positive life transformations that can occur when someone gets a job. Uh, over the decades, governments of different stripes have tried different approaches to employment services delivery in remote Australia, and we're constantly learning what works and, importantly, what doesn't uh, in both urban, suburban, regional and remote environments. We know that one size does not fit all. Many of the, de the more detailed aspects of this new approach will, will be set out in legislative instruments and policy guidance. For example, any additional qualification criteria for the supplement <clears throat> and the exact rate of payment, allowing this flexibility to adjust as lessons are learnt in communities' ideas as communities' ideas change over the course of the pilots. Uh, this is best practice, and it's going to allow first-hand experience to guide the implementation of services. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, Australians living in remote communities face complex environment changes, uh, challenges, uh, different from those that are experienced in the city, uh, even in regional areas. Remote areas cover 75 per cent of the Australian landmass. However, there are fewer jobs available in remote areas. We know that. Uh, with less than 2 per cent of actively trading businesses located in these regions. The key reform that this bill introduces is a new supplementary payment that will be made to eligible job seekers in, in, remote, in, in the remote engagement pro, uh, program pilot community so that they can engage in activities or placements like having a job. Uh, the placements will build participant skills in roles that will deliver goods or services to benefit local communities and provide a pathway for job seekers to be able to find a job. This bill supports the government's commitment to work in genuine partnership to co-design and with Indigenous Australians. The new payment <coughs> will be paid at a fortnightly rate of between $100 and $190 per fortnight and will be additional to certain primary income support payments and other supplements uh, for eligible job seekers. The new payment will not be subject to the income test laid out in the Social Security Act. It can be paid for a maximum of two years, at which time the government will have finalised the replacement to the more wide-ranging CDP. Madam 
uh, be, pardon me, Mr. Uh, Acting Deputy President. Why would anyone want to stand in the way of this? Unless, of course, you're just politically motivated to do so. Uh, but we know that this is just how the Labor Party likes to operate. Like we, the, the reality is, the reality is there is uh, a situation where uh, you know we've got communities that want to be able to engage in the design of their own program. We heard, and I listened carefully to Senator McAllister's uh, uh, speech earlier, where she talked about Labor's position. And the reality is, uh, this this is a program that allows an opportunity for communities to be able to design the program themselves, for them to be able to have in input into it. There was criticism that there's not enough detail in the bill. Well, what does, I mean, it would be quite disingenuous of the government to put detail in before you've actually engaged in the co-design process, because that, the whole idea of this bill is to enable that to start so that you can then engage with the community, design and then implement based on that feedback and their design. Uh, so that's why there's provision within this bill to be able to do it by instrument to be able to have uh, uh, provisions uh, that will be dealt with at a later stage once that design process has been worked so that it then can be implemented. But we know that Labor are uh, often you know, politically motivated and uh, it's shameless, uh, just like with their uh, regard to the cashless debit card. Now, <clears throat> I want to call out the Labor Party for their shameless and baseless scare campaign. You would all be aware of it, uh, the lie that the government is going to force somehow pensioners onto the cashless debit card. This scare campaign is ironic because the government proposed an amendment to ensure that pensioners stay off the cashless debit card, and Labor voted against that motion. That's the record in this place. And why did Labor do that? Were they afraid that their scare campaign wouldn't work if they voted to actually prevent pensioners from going onto the cashless debit card? This deserves to be called out. This deserves to be called out. Yet, on the other hand, Labor have committed to scrap the card. Now, I've worked for over 10 years dealing with this in close consultation with communities and community organisations to see this card implemented. This card has seen a reduction in crime, a reduction in domestic violence, a reduction in ambulance call-outs, a car that takes cash out of the hands of drug dealers, and Labor wants to scrap this card. They cite rights as if, the, 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 as if government welfare in cash form is some form of right. We on this side of the House care more about the rights of children to be fed and for women to be safe from domestic violence. Labor's capitulation, capitulation to the left-wing base on this issue is shameful. It will see outcomes worsen in our regions, undergoing years of good work. And shame on them. Now, in summing up, I return back to what this bill is about. It enables remote communities to co-design their implementation of government services, a real voice to government, if you will. As I said, I listened carefully to Senator McAllister. And I'm not going to stand here and say that the CDP program is perfect or that it's a flawless program. In fact, in my first speech in this Senate, I spoke about the fact that there needs to be significant reforms across the whole employment services area. And I've committed myself, while I'm in this place, to be part of the discussion and part of the design and part of the movement to see the necessary changes that are required. But we don't get this from the Labor Party. And I sat through the, the inquiry, and uh, Senator Chandler is here as well, uh, the, the chair of the uh, Finance and Public Administration Committee that, that had a, a good look at this, at this program. And we, we heard from uh, communities on the ground. We heard from uh, individuals that are going to be dealing with this program. And you know, there's actually quite some enthusiasm about the opportunity to be able to design, be part of the design of this program. Uh, yet, you know, Labor just take the political point score rather than actually dealing with uh, the opportunities that are here. Now, I welcome uh, support for this bill, but in doing so, you know, they just want to make a cheap shot. They just want to make a cheap shot. Uh, 
This bill will help reform remote employment services. This is a good thing. This is a good thing. It needs to happen, Mr Acting Deputy President. There does need to be reform, and the government's committed to that. But you've got to be able to design it and prove it up first before you really move forward. And this bill enables us to be able to do that, to be able to put in place, in consultation, in co-design with the community, the things that they recognise would work for them. We know that when you run a program from a Canberra, you know, top-down driven kind of model, you end up running a program to the community. And that never works. But we've got to run the program with the community. So this provides this, and I take the interjections. This provides the opportunity for the community to be part of the design for a program that works for them. It is the, the height, the height of paternalism to suggest that that communities, you know, by, by way of this sort of uh, um, uh, disruption, that, that communities won't uh, aren't, won't know what's good for them. They're part of the design of this program, and that's a good thing because it's going to get us better results. We've got to see better results in these communities. The reforms will be piloted in partnership with remote communities, ensuring that support is available to aid in the rollout. Now, this bottom-up design and implementation is what communities have been asking for for a long time. I spent a lot of time well, this you know, year's been a little disrupted because uh, every time I come over here I have to go back home and in the Quarantine. It's limited the amount of time I've get to go around the communities. But just before, uh, just before we were last here, the previous time I had did have a couple of days where I got out into Leonora and Laverton, and I uh, engaged with the service providers out there, engaged with the community. Literally sat uh, on the the red dirt out there with a, a bunch of young fellows that were engaging in an employment program, and there is a real desire to see reform in this space. And I think these, the reform that uh, is enabled through this bill, it, it's welcomed by the communities because it's going to make a real difference. This bottom-up design and implementation is it's what communities have been asking for for a long time. Now this is enabling us to do four or five uh, pilot sites, and that, that's a good thing. I, I'm looking forward to the day when we can roll it out to even more communities, even more communities. That's going to be uh, even better. But you've got to get it right. I mean, the, the, the opportunity that this pilot provides is to trial different things, to, to, to get feedback, to, to you know, at times uh, make a mistake and learn from that and, and, and work out how we can improve on that to, to get that design so that we can then take it out to the entire country, to deal with the 50-plus uh, CDP regions across the country and ensure that there is a program that actually meets the needs of the communities. But importantly, gets people off of welfare and into a job. Anyone that says to you that there are not the economies in these locations is actually misleading uh, or they're, they're, they're misunderstanding the opportunity that exists. Where there is a population, where there is a community, where there are people, there is an economy and there is an opportunity. We've just got to stop this business of having lowered expectations for these communities. It's the racism of lowered expectations which is going to hold back this nation and, in particular, these communities. And we've got to expect, like they do, that things can be better, that they, when they're in the driving seat, can make the difference. Thank you, Mr President. Senator McCarthy, you have the call. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, I can't uh, remember ever being in a position to congratulate this government but congratulations to you for finally realising that the community development program is an utter failure. Despite the expenditure of millions of dollars, the CDP has failed to deliver employment, economic development or a sustainable future to remote communities. It's taken this government six long years to realise that the CDP just isn't working. Six long years of participants in remote areas pointing out to this government the fatal flaws in this program that did not lead to jobs, opportunity or community development. What it has led to is entrenched poverty, hopelessness, hunger and despair. It's actually caused damage to remote communities and participants cutting people off from income support, putting additional strains and stresses on families, eroding self-respect and dignity 
by taking a draconian punitive approach. The CDP is discriminatory and it is broken. First Nations communities, people and organisations along with Labor have been saying this for six years and it's not just us who have been continually drawing attention to the failures of CDP. This government has always known there are fundamental problems with its remote community employment model. But instead of listening to the people on the ground and the experts, it just fiddle around with the program for six long years, fixing nothing and further entrenching poverty in remote communities. I've been asking questions about CDP since I was first elected to this place in 2016. It was one of the very first major issues raised with me by Territorians and it's still one of the major issues people talk to me about as I travel across the Territory. And in spite of all the efforts and tweaking and fiddling, the complaints and the issues are still the same. CDP is punitive, pointless and keeps people poor. The CDP has been a discriminatory program since its inception and the majority of participants in the scheme are First Nations people in remote communities, more than 80%. The requirements and obligations imposed on CDP participants were more onerous than those that applied to job seekers and income support recipients outside the CDP regions. And because they were more onerous, CDP recipients were in breach of their obligations and suspended for payments for longer and more often than non-CDP participants. The federal government's own review of its remote Work for the Dole program in 2019 found that the First Nations CDP participants were three times more likely to be penalised for non-attendance and were penalised more often. They went without income for longer periods and were less likely to be exempted on medical grounds despite a much higher burden of disease and illness in remote First Nations communities. Poor mental health or physical health, disabilities or other personal problems also meant people were more likely to be penalised. The most penalised cohort were men under 35. These are men with families, with dependents who are cut off from income support with no other means of getting money to support themselves and their families. And many people, particularly young people, were completely disengaged from the income support system. And once breached, many did not re-engage with the social security system and many young people did not engage from the get-go, discouraged by the onerous obligations and sometimes meaningless activities. The 2019 Federal Government report found social problems had increased since the introduction of the CDP, including an increase in break and enters to steal food, predominantly by children and young people, an increase in domestic and family violence, an increase in financial coercion and family fighting, and an increase in mental health problems, feelings of shame, depression, sleep deprivation and hunger. Feelings of frustration and stress were reported in trying to deal with Centrelink from remote communities with limited online and telephone access and few opportunities to engage face to face. The report, your report, said the CDP had the opposite of its intended effect to get people off welfare or sit down money. In fact, it said quite clearly that the research found no evidence to suggest penalties were an effective way to generate engagement in the program. The research found that for some job seekers, penalisation had the opposite effect to be demotivating and disempowering participants so they did not engage. And there was no evidence that the CDP had an effect on the number of participants obtaining a job. Now remember, all this was laid out clearly in this government's own evaluation in 2019. And I bring this back to the Senate to remind you of all the moments you've missed as a government to actually get this sorted. You had the evidence well before of CDP's failures. In 2017, the National Audit Office said the CDP cost almost twice as much as the previous Work for the Dole scheme. It cost $10,494 per person to deliver CDP at the time. 
while the previous Remote Jobs and Communities Program cost $5,071 per job seeker. We knew from the ANU Centre for Aboriginal Economic Policy Research in 2018 there, that there had been a 740% increase in financial penalties since the CDP replaced the previous Remote Job and Communities Program in 2015. 740% increase. And that remote workers were 25 times more likely to be penalised than non-remote job seekers and 50 times more likely to have a serious penalty imposed, which meant up to eight weeks with no payment. This government was even under attack from its own over the CDP, with former Indigenous Affairs Minister Fred Cheney calling it a national disgrace. Mr Cheney said, and I quote, there was a total carelessness shown for the hardship inflicted on remote Aboriginal people and the damage being done by this denial of the facts. In my view, this policy is a national disgrace, he said. It is a reversion to the attitudes of the past. It's another assimilationist, bureaucratic, irrelevant approach that will inflict more hardship, hunger and dysfunction on Aboriginal people. It's not community building, it's the reverse. The more I see of it, the more I think we're reverting to the habits of the 1940s and 1950s. So Mr Cheney was very clear of his criticisms of the CDP and they were published in October 2018. Did the government take action and dump the fundamentally flawed CDP? Did it go back to the drawing board? Did it actually work with First Nations people and communities to design a scheme that might actually work? Of course not. What they did was again fiddle around the edges, continue to allow people in offices in Canberra to design and implement a program for and about remote First Nations communities. In 2018, the government introduced minor changes in a new compliance framework, despite every submitter to the Senate inquiry being opposed to the bill. The flawed CDP continued in remote communities. In fact, the current Minister for Indigenous Australians was quite glowing about the CDP in October 2019, describing it as delivering better results on all fronts. He was also very positive about the 1,000 jobs package brought in as part of the March 2019 CDP reforms, the fiddling around the edges bit. This was the program which was supposed to support the creation of 1,000 new jobs for CD participants in remote Australia. As of May this year, more than two years after that program was started, the multi-million dollar program, it's created not 1,000 jobs, only 400 jobs. But the government is adamant that 1,000 jobs, or that is really 400 jobs, the program will continue. Again, just not learning from what is really wrong about this program. It's like they don't want to listen to First Nations people who are telling them about what works and doesn't in remote communities. And what they've been telling them from the very beginning is this CDP is flawed to its foundations and no amount of tinkering around the edges can change that. A new First Nations-led model centred on creating fair and decent jobs and treating people with respect is greatly needed. I was so proud in 2019 when Labor committed to scrapping this CDP and replacing it with a program that would co-design, a program that creates real jobs, meets community needs and delivers meaningful training and economic development. And I'm extremely proud that this is a policy we will again take to the election. This bill does not do that. It falls short in every single respect. It does not create a new employment program. What the government doing, what the government's doing is creating another welfare model. They will pay a very few participants extra income support money that will still be subject to quarantining to participate in job like placements. The focus of this placement will be on skills and vocational training only and not traineeships or apprenticeships. With no apparent pathway to employment, it's unclear how the pilot would generate jobs for a community unless it already has economic activity and job creation capacity. This will not address 
the existing challenge of on-country job creation for those young people leaving education. And it will further entrench the status quo of the existing CDP by paying individuals to participate in work for the Dole activities. This policy approach reflects the government's continued failure to recognise that many people on the current CDP are already trained, have worked and will work if it is available. This bill sets up a two-tier system across remote communities as those outside the employment pilot sites do not benefit at all. The details of what happens outside the pilot sites is scant. There is no advice or detail on the time frame for the rollout of a replacement payment post for June 24. And while the government has again squandered an opportunity to establish a real jobs program for remote Australia, the new payment offers a financial benefit totaling at least 5,200 for some participants. And these participants are some of the poorest and most disadvantaged people in the country. And this government is not creating jobs in remote communities. They're not looking at all the evidence and lessons they can learn from their past mistakes. In fact, the minister has to this day never owned up to the CDP being an absolute failure. He's never said that when introducing this new program, why he's dumping the CDP, what the problems have been, what lessons he's learned from sticking to a punitive scheme they knew was causing harm in remote communities. The issues with this bill and the failed CDP were put very succinctly to the Senate inquiry into this bill by Dr Josie Douglas from the Central Land Council. And Dr Douglas said, and I quote, Aboriginal people are tired of the endless cycle of poverty, punitive welfare and policy changes that just come out of the blue. In the 21st century, it's simply not good enough to have the bureaucracy design yet another version of a file program. People, young people in particular, need to be able to experience having a job and getting the skills and experience that that offers Otherwise, we are condemning future generations to a pathway of misery, a pathway of nothingness. My greatest fear is that this government continues down this pathway of misery to nothingness. Generations of young men and women in remote communities are not getting the opportunity to experience the dignity of work and proper wages. This legislation doesn't put in place a program that will create jobs, give control to First Nations people and communities. The Morrison government had an opportunity here to make a difference in remote communities, to work with stakeholders who have been putting forward ideas and alternatives to the CDP for five years, or for years, I should say, to put in place a program that will create jobs in remote communities that will provide people with skills, that will lead to hope and opportunity to co-design a program that includes this legislation that is not imposed, where First Nations people and organisations have a seat at the table. But this bill does not do that. It provides that once again, only Labor, or it proves that once again, only Labor will scrap the CDP and work in genuine partnership with First Nations organisations and communities to create a remote area program that does create job opportunities offers community development that provides a pathway out of the nothingness and misery that eight long years of this government has imposed on remote Australian communities. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. I'll go now to Senator Pratt, who is coming to the chamber remotely. Senator Pratt. This legislation is just another version of the flawed and much criticised community development program or CDP. While Labor supports this bill because it involves a supplementary payment that offers a financial benefit for a small number of remote job seekers, it is still very much part of a broken system that does not support job creation or support quality of life in Australia's remote Indigenous communities. We believe in Labor that Aboriginal people need to be afforded the right to self-determination, and this cannot be achieved through the CDP, which is incidentally still very much running uh, for, you know, around for 40,000 Australians. The original CDP is a farce of forced labour. 
for those who need support as opposed to the disrespect they are being shown by this government. Back in 2015, when the government uh, brought in these new programs, it was justifiably then criticised by Indigenous stakeholders. Criticised as broken and discriminatory, and that view has been upheld in the time that communities have had to live with it. Why should someone have to work in the most remote places of Australia without the same proper wages and conditions as other Australians? One of the CDP's most egregious failings is its removal of choice. People are simply forced to work in ways that take away a person's sense of self-determination and agency, and this does nothing to support someone getting into secure work. The discriminatory nature of this kind of work for the Dole system uh, has meant breaches and extreme rates of penalties have been applied causing great levels of disadvantage. And if you look at the data, uh, particularly given the cost of living in this, these communities, these penalties are extreme. And under these schemes, we see being paid as little as $286 a week. And this can mean a decision about affording fuel or food for that week. The penalties in this system are much higher than those suffered by Urban Australia's Job Active program, and people are 55 more times likely to receive a serious penalty. This is incredible when you look at the uh, lack of access that you have in remote communities to being able to walk into um, a Services Australia office to um, plead your case and get these kinds of issues resolved. There have been substantial negative impacts on remote communities. It's placed downward pressure on legitimate job creation by creating a pool of thousands of people who have to work without proper pay and conditions. Much of the work they do is similar to that uh, that is properly paid by local government and by not-for-profit organisations. But of course, it's not being credited as much as such meaning in terms of the work that's done in these communities. So people's future job prospects are being undermined. We run in these kinds of pro programs a very real risk, and we've seen this happen, of damaging already flourishing Indigenous jobs. And still over the last decade, the gap in employment um, between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians uh, in both employment and other outcomes has indeed grown. And I'm sad to say these government policies, the CDP, has contributed to this gap, contributed to our failure to close the gap in all of the uh, important um, close the gap indicators. This in turn exacerbates social harm and distress. This is the government's problem uh, in terms of its attitude to social services yeah, in remote Australia. They, the government thinks it has something, uh, that something has to be made so unpleasant and be so dehumanising for people that they can't through getting the help they need. Uh, and they therefore seek to avoid the system entirely, which is what happens in many remote communities where people just opt out from getting unemployment support, uh, income support, and of course it drags down the whole community's standard of living. We see here the millions of dollars that have been ripped from Services Australia over the years as well. Has this stopped poverty? No. Has it made it possible for people to pull themselves up by their bootstraps? Certainly not. It has meant that people across Australia have been kept in a state of distress and poverty by a government who cares more for saving money over supporting Australia's most vulnerable people. But in fact, when you look at the statistics around things like the INDU card, at the fact that it's cost $5,000 per person that's on the card, why not direct that money directly into service improvement in remote communities and paying people proper wages. We've got some 40,000 participants on the current CDP and over 
80% are Indigenous. Most of these people will be staying on this current CDP program until at least 2024 when the pilot version of this program uh, that we're debating today is reassessed. This is simply not good enough. We already know that this scheme is broken and that it's not working. It means that thousands of people are staying on a scheme that a Senate inquiry found as far back as 2017 that it had failed, failed to deliver on its stated intention uh, of addressing the lack of employment opportunities in remote Australia. That committee found as far back as then that it needed to be abolished and redesigned. So here, four years later, we've had a government that hasn't be even begun to listen. Uh, it is an entirely useless approach to have wasted all of these years when, frankly, any good sense analysis showed you that the program was not going to succeed. Aboriginal organisations have been criticising uh, these programs, but also giving constructive proposals, which the government has failed to listen to. This stubbornness has meant that the government is now only bringing forward this trial now in 2021. We know in its beginning stages it will have 200 job seekers in the program, which will mean that people on job seeker could earn extra money on top of their job seeker payments of between $100 and $190 a fortnight. That's a good thing and therefore it's a reason not to oppose it. But I will be watching very carefully at the penalties and at the way this program is being delivered. I don't want to see uh, this government make an already bad situation worse and that has been their very clear record. Participants in the new scheme will need to work at least 15 hours to receive their payment, meaning that including the regular job seeker payment in their income it would be equivalent to the minimum wage. Despite the imitation of actual employment, though, participants remain participants and they're not deemed to be an employee for the purposes of workers' compensation or superannuation. Again, this is simply terrible. It is not good enough and there is no reason that these workers are working uh, for a minimum wage for a job like this should not have the same workers' compensation and superannuation as other people. In focusing on being job ready and job like, with placements being expected to build skills and provide vocational training, the caveat being that traineeships or apprenticeships will not be available. Again, this is simply not good enough. How can you be, say that your program is here to get people job ready and be job like? and build skills without actually delivering the training uh, programs that are, enable, are going to enable people to step through. How can this government claim to focus on anything approaching getting people job ready when they're not offering a pathway to training? We've already overseen the plummet of from some half a million places in 2021 when there was a Labor government and after many glossy announcements and grand gestures this year, uh, these places uh, in um, apprenticeships are now a mere 330,000. That's one in five apprenticeships and traineeships that have disappeared under this government. And we know that it's worse in these regional and remote communities. Less apprenticeships and traineeships means less job opportunities for Australians and now less skilled workers for Australia's future. Businesses, especially in regional Australia, are crying out for skilled and qualified staff. But this government doesn't know how to support the development of these skills. We know how expensive it is to get a plumber out to a remote community, to get an electrician out to a remote community, to get people with building trades. Why aren't you investing as a government in the skills of these communities? It might make complete sense to this government that, that it's refusing to spend appropriately on skills. Because maybe you want to create a generation of young people who've not had the opportunities that they should. There's simply no uh, logic to the parameters 
uh, in this legislation that you're putting forward. It makes complete sense that a government like that is blaming those same young people who are out in remote communities without industry, without business, without the opportunity for training, to blame those young people themselves for their outcomes. Remote Australia is being hung out to dry, skills and training wise, by yet another new system coming in here, a system that does not invest in the skills and training that it purports to want to fix. All it does is offer another stick and another set of criticism. There's no job creation or economic development Stop. here of any truth. Um, we have a government that's displayed fundamental understanding of on-country job creation Senator for Pratt. young people leaving education. Thank Se you. It being 1.30, we'll move on to two-minute statements and Senator Pratt, remotely. Okay. We might try Senator Pratt once more. Senator Pratt, are you still online? Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I bring to honourable Senator's attention the incredibly successful sporting club Hub Gymnastics, which is located in Adelaide's southern suburbs. Hub Gymnastics was established in 1985 by a group of volunteers and has since grown to over 700 athletes with a waiting list of over 300 who are desperate to join. Gymnasts of all ages are welcome to the club and they enjoy great training from head coach Emma Murray and her team. I pay tribute to Emma for her incredible dedication to leading the coaching of all the gymnasts as well as her amazing drive in growing and advocating for the club alongside its president, Marie Moran. Last week end, I visited their gym, which is named after Emma's father, Paul. Paul was instrumental in building the club. Sadly, Paul is no longer with us, but he has left the community a great legacy. The club is a living testament to his incredible efforts to promote gymnastics. On the weekend, Hub Gymnastics held its annual recreation day. The gym was abuzz with activity, in particular gymnastic displays for proud parents and family members. I like to think that there was an Olympian amongst those participating on the mats. I also had the chance to hear more from the club about their need for expanding their facilities, especially to accommodate the 300 keen gymnasts waiting to train at the club. An upgraded and expanded facility for hub gymnastics has become a necessity and I intend to continue working diligently with my state colleagues and the local council to ensure Hub Gymnastics' vision for the future comes to life. I thank President Marie Moran and Head Coach Emma Murray for their kind welcome and hospitality. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Today is International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. Every day should be eliminating violence against women. Our women have the right to live their lives in safety, with full human dignity and free from all forms of violence, including family violence. The social, cultural, spiritual, physical and economic impact that family violence has on our communities is devastating. The greatest and most direct impact of family violence is on our women, First Nations women, trans women and our sister girls. At the heart of family violence lies both individual and communal grief, loss, disempowerment and trauma caused by colonisation and dispossession. The only central way to end violence against women is through a community-driven, self-determined approach that prioritises cultural hearing, healing and restore the inherent strength, dignity and self-determination of our families and our communities. 
healing that is based on the strength and resilience of our people and cultures and driven by our self-determined organisations is the only, only thing that's going to work for our people and our communities and our women and our children. Self-determination is about our own destiny and deciding our own destiny. Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak just in support of maritime workers and the Maritime Union of Australia. They've both been negotiating good faith for a new enterprise agreement for almost two years. Maritime workers have been heroes in the pandemic. They've been kept essential supplies going in and out of Australia, at risk of their own well-being and coming into direct contact with vessels arriving from high-risk countries. And in some cases, like at Cube's Fremantle port, without even being provided with PPE. Now they haven't had a pay rise in two years, while companies like Patrick's have been making a fortune off their backs. In the last four years, Patrick's fees to customers have increased by 363% in New South Wales and a whopping 1,031% in Western Australia. Yes, 1,031%. And massive increases across the rest of the country. That money isn't flowing through to workers. That money went to a $68.5 million dividend. That money has gone to a $3 million pay rise for Patrick CEO Michael Djokovic. Whenever maritime workers attempt to bargain in good faith for their fair share, this government calls them thugs. Well, I'll tell you what thuggery like, looks like. It's giving yourself a $3 million pay rise and paying a $68.5 million dividend while your essential workers have had a two-year wage freeze. This government has overseen the worst eight years in Australia's history for wages growth. Senator Roberts, remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. I want to refer to speeches that you gave yesterday and also Senator Thorpe. In your speech, you mentioned the term far-right extremist or extremist. Every third or fourth line, that enshrines separation. Five times in just 18 lines. Senator Thorpe used the term white privilege 11 times on average every fourth line driving hate and conflict. Now, in private talk with Senator Thorpe, and not meant to be kept private, but personal talk, she recognises to me that the Aboriginal industry is doing enormous damage, but she doesn't say that in public. What we've got is gutless, woke bureaucrats shoveling money continually to keep the gap open so that the people in the Aboriginal industry, both black and white, can make money off it. Care requires data and facts not emotive slogans and labels. Care requires understanding. Senator Thorpe talks about climate and Aboriginals, the UN and Aboriginals, property rights and Aboriginals. They are not the same. These very things are hurting the Aboriginals, but not as much as the resort to labels. Keeping people locked in victimhood makes them dependent so that the Greens can control them. I have never heard anyone condemn you for your race, your gender, your background, only for your incitement to division and hatred. You have the privilege of being in the Senate and representing Australians, but your rhetoric is dividing and on basis of race. Yet every Australian recognises we all have red blood, regardless of our skin colour. We all have a human spirit that we share with every human, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of background, regardless of prejudices. And it's about time that people in this parliament, especially in the Greens, started to recognise that we should be united. We are one Senator people. Senator Roberts, your time has expired. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to raise serious ongoing concerns about Victorian Labor's proposed pandemic management bill. Labor's proposed lockdown laws, even after Labor backtracked on some of the worst parts of the bill, are anti-democratic and extremely dangerous. 
The bill, if passed, would allow unchecked power to be granted to the Premier and the Health Minister. Not only can a pandemic be declared even when no pandemic exists, though it must be now declared on reasonable grounds, it still allows the Premier to rule by decree, imposing almost any restriction without appropriate oversight by the parliament or the courts. Fines for a breach of a health order are outrageous, some $45,000. One of the worst aspects of this bill is that Victorians can be detained indefinitely without charge, with no right of appeal to a court. The power to review the detention of a person will be moved from the Ombudsman to a government-controlled scrutiny of Acts and Regulations Committee, which is a farce. It defies the rule of law and represents a fundamental breach of human rights. So, in effect, the Premier throws someone into jail and decides through a committee he controls when they can be released. As a Senator for Victoria, I say this is abhorrent. Victorian Ombudsman Deborah Glass says there is a role for parliamentary committees, certainly a role for the scrutiny committee, but it's not enough in my view, and I think concerns have rightly been expressed around the legal community in relation to the need for a greater level of independent oversight. As Victorian Liberal Opposition Leader Matthew Guy has made clear, a coalition government will rip up Labor's new lockdown laws and kill the bill. Thank you. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. For close to four years now, I've been raising the issue of unsafe pet food, the pets who have died, the manufacturers who were responsible and the governments who have failed to act. Four years. Four years of delay, four years of inaction, four years without anyone taking any form of responsibility. I have been told time and time again that state and federal ministers intend to meet to discuss reforms. Most recently, they were due to discuss it at the start of November. But it seems those intentions don't mean much. In fact, they don't really mean anything. Again and again, I find out that these meetings never happen or the issues don't get discussed or given the priority they deserve. The same thing happened earlier this month. They now want a cost-benefit analysis of reforms that, as I understand it, are only the lightest of regulatory and non-regulatory steps they can possibly take. The lightest. We've already waited four years since dogs started dying of megasophagus, and three years since the Senate inquiry that I instigated handed down its report. Three years. That report recommended mandatory standards and labelling and improved recall and particularly public reporting systems. These slow-acting agricultural ministers don't seem to understand how important this issue is to pet owners, to our constituents. After three years, we don't want light touch and indecisive action. We want results. We want to know that what happened to those 100 dogs in 2017 and 2018 won't happen again. The federal government and its state and territory counterparts should be acting with urgency. But like an errant new puppy, they are chewing up paperwork and have dropped the ball. Senator Griff. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, how can how can the people of Australia trust the Morrison government to deliver for them? Uh, this is a government that is absolutely divided. This is a government that is in disarray, and this is a government that is distrusted by the people of Australia. Uh, this government is divided right at the time that Australians need their government to get them over the line and through this pandemic to lead them to the brighter future that we all need right now. Uh, and instead, this week in the parliament, we have government members crossing the floor to vote with One Nation. Uh, we have government members threatening to withhold their votes, um, if only they could figure out exactly how to do that. Uh, we have complete shambolic disarray in the parliament this week. And this is, on top of all of that, a government that is distrusted. It is led by a Prime Minister who has been caught out again and again being loose with the truth. A Prime Minister who in this very parliament has been exposed as believing that the truth is optional. 
We have a Prime Minister who this week has had to front up to the parliament and retract his lies. We have a Prime Minister who says one thing one day and then the complete opposite the next. And then he says he can't remember what he said. The people of Australia do not trust this Prime Minister. They do not. They do not trust a Prime Minister who can't make up his mind whether he condemns the violent protesters or whether he actually understands their frustrations. Uh, but one thing is for sure, the Australian people rightly expect better now. Uh, they expect better than a government that is divided. They expect better than this disarray, and they want a government that they can trust. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Have you ever worried about where your next meal was coming from? Wondered if you could afford the bread and Vegemite so your kids could eat for the next week? I have, I can tell you, and it sucks. And one in six Australians have been living that reality this year. Many of them found they couldn't put food on the table for the first time in their lives. They're relying on the goodwill of their community to get food in their kids' bellies before they head to school in the morning and come home at night. The Green Bean Cafe in Launceston is pitching in to help. Paul and Tracy open their cafe once a week at dinner time for anyone who needs it. They do these meals out of their own pocket because they've seen people struggling and they want to give back. They don't want any thanks or to be given anything for their efforts. They just want people to pass on their kindness and they want them to know they are open to be fed. It's not just about a hot meal, though. I have to say the meal is pretty good. It's a place for people from all walks of life to have a chat and have a safe place to be. These community co-ops and services are filling an important gap in their community, gaps that, are bigger, that, that bigger food banks and charities cannot reach. We can't let our fellow Australians fall through the cracks. Good people like Tracy and Paul are willing to help make sure that doesn't happen, but we just need to give them all the support we have. I have noticed in going around Tasmania very quickly that there are different uh, cafes and that doing this sort of stuff. It would be really nice for the state government to find a building in these city areas where people and charities can exchange days that all they need is a kitchen and they need a fridge. That's it. And somewhere these people can sit down and have their meal and some talk time. One building is all they're asking for, and there's no reason Tasmania can't provide this. You can have CWA going in one day to feed them. You can have uh, a business owner going in the next. There's plenty of people out there ready, prepared to do this. They really just need a facility. So if the Tasmanian state government can think about that, that would be fabulous. Thank you. Senator Dean Smith. It's our constant duty as Australians to remember and honour our Anzac heroes who fought for and secured the freedoms and way of life we enjoy today in Australia. Physical monuments remain one of the best ways for us to ensure their brave sacrifice is not forgotten by communities across our country. In the spirit of this, today I'd like to recognise in this place the newly opened Remembrance Park in the Shire of Bruce Rock in the Wheatbelt region of my home state of Western Australia. The park was officially unveiled on the 6th of November and I was very sorry, very disappointed that other commitments meant that I couldn't attend in person. But I was delighted that my good friend, the Shire President Stephen Strange, supported by the local community, was able to come out in support of this wonderful initiative. This beautiful tribute to our Anzac past was made possible by the Morrison government, funding through the Local Roads and Community Infrastructure Program and the Saluting Their Service Program. The project is part of the Shire of Bruce Rock's Main Street revitalisation strategy, upgrading the existing remembrance sculpture into a park complete with artwork, interpretive signage and landscaping. For many, many years, Bruce Rock and the community of Bruce Rock has welcomed into their town many, many Vietnam, uh, Vietnam and Afghanistan War, Afghanistan War veterans. As the son of a Vietnam War veteran, I'm delighted and excited by the hospitality that this community continually provides to ex-service men and women. Fittingly, the new memorial features a plaque adorned with a Benjamin Franklin quote, which states, there was never a good war or a bad peace. I look forward to my next visit to Bruce Rock and the communities across WA's Wheatbelt districts and seeing the memorial for myself in person. Again, I congratulate the town and the community of Bruce Rock for their wonderful warmth. Senator Patrick. Thank you. In 
A debate this week about the government's delayed response to national cabinet questions, I criticised Assistant Secretary Angie McKenzie of PMNC for refusing to accept the ruling of a federal court justice that national cabinet is not a committee of cabinet. I said Ms McKenzie was incompetent and politically partisan, and I stand by those remarks. Today I make the point that uh, McKenzie is not alone. Under Secretary Philip Gachin's PMC has become hugely politicised. PMC was once headed by uh, public service giants like Sir John Bunting, Sir Geoffrey Yend, Mike Codd uh, and Michael Keating, more recently Peter Shergold, Terry Moran and Ian Watt. Things have changed. Secretary Gachin happily presides over a politically corrupted agency for a Prime Minister obsessed with secrecy and lacking respect for democratic accountability. The institutional decline and politicisation of the top ranks is demonstrated by other senior officers, not notably First Assistant Secretary Leonie McGregor, Lee Steele and John Reid, who gave evasive and highly unsatisfactory evidence to the Senate inquiry on the COAG bill. Whether through political expedience or cowardice, these public servants had betrayed the standards of uh, which PMC was once an exemplar. If there's a change of government, Mr Albanese would be well advised to sack Gaitchens on the spot. There's a huge task ahead to restore integrity at the peak of the public service. I have no hesitation in calling out uh, uh, incompetence and political uh, partisanship. There must be integrity and accountability within the public service. Senator Watt, remotely. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I join you today from Brisbane, but I can tell you that you don't have to be in Canberra to be able to see that this government is becoming a complete shambles. Uh, what we've seen over the last week with government members voting against the government, fighting with each other uh, and rumblings again about leadership changes on the Liberal Party side just show how distracted the Morrison government has become and Australians are paying the price for this distraction. To take just one example, disaster management. Just this week, we've seen the Bureau of Meteorology again warn that we face La Nina conditions, which means more floods and more cyclones across much of our country. We've seen the first cyclone emerge just off the Western Australian coast. And of course, there are terrible floods wreaking havoc in much of New South Wales and, and other parts of the country. This is a clear reminder that disaster season has begun. This week, I took the opportunity to spend some time in Cairns uh, and visited the Cairns Disaster Coordination Centre with Senator Green and our candidate for Leichhardt, Elida Faith. And we saw some great work being done by locals doing excellent things to make sure that the Cairns region is prepared for disaster season. But unfortunately, their work is not being backed up by the Morrison government. This government continues to sit on what is now a $4.7 billion disaster fund that remains largely unspent. The Emergency Response Fund was announced by this government in April 2019, two and a half years ago. It's been, it's been available to spend up to $200 million per annum on disaster recovery and mitigation. Uh, but in the time that it's been existing, it has earned the government $700 million in interest and we learned this week that it has only actually spent $17 million on disaster mitigation, mitigation projects. This fund shouldn't be a government cash cow. It should be keeping Australians safe. The failure of the government is leaving Australians Senator exposed. Senator Watt, your time has expired. Senator Waters. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. Every new survey shows that trust in government and in democracy is plummeting. Time is running out to restore public confidence in democracy in this country, and yet once again today we saw this government block efforts to establish a National Integrity Commission. This government is the most secretive in history. It is a government allergic to transparency, terrified of scrutiny and desperate to keep its dirty deals and self-interested decisions hidden from voters. It attacks anyone who tries to lift the curtain. Charities and NGOs have helped people in Australia throughout COVID. They've supported those affected by devastating floods and fires. They're helping Afghan refugees rebuild their lives. They're calling for systemic changes to improve people's lives and livelihoods. The government is pushing through laws to make it harder for charities to advocate for change. 
Environmental and climate groups are crying out for action on the climate crisis. This government calls them vandals, tells the children of Australia that it doesn't owe them a duty of care and continues to meet with its fossil fuel donors behind closed doors. The government accepts millions in undisclosed donations to fuel its re-election and to secure cushy post-parliament jobs, but refuses to fix donation laws. Terrified that people are crying out for a change of leadership, the Morrison-Joyce government pushed through laws to make it harder to set up new political parties, and they're making it harder now for vulnerable people to vote, suppress the vote, silence charities and stop candidates. Journalists are threatened with defamation. Ministers sue citizens. The ABC and SBS have their funding cut. If this government doesn't like what you say, it will silence you, unless, of course, you're a religious institution. And they will not, under any circumstance, let us debate having a strong National Integrity Commission. They are terrified of an ICAC because we all know it will reveal how corrupt they are. Senator Abess. Violence of any sort by one human being against another is an ugly, completely unacceptable activity which deserves unequivocal condemnation. Violence is a crime. The law rightly for an orderly, civilised society. So into these self-evident observations the term with which I've had great difficulty, the concept of domestic violence. It's as though it is of a lower category or less than on those who are entitled to believe in the trust and protection of the perpetrator. As I've said before, domestic violence is in fact a crime and should be called out as such. One of the informing experiences of my life was when I joined a group of fellow volunteers to establish a women's shelter in my local area. Serving on its inaugural committee and as a honorary legal adviser for a number of years, I saw and heard first-hand accounts which were simply horrifyingly ugly, not only physically emotionally and psychologically as well. Not only is assault not OK, it's never acceptable because it's a crime. And while I've concentrated on violence against women, I recognise that family violence is a two-way street. But let's also recognise that traffic flows in one direction. Let's also recognise that it exists in all types of relationships. None is regrettably immune. Violence in all its forms is to be abhorred and considered criminal. Especially in our households. Senator Ayres. Well, we three per cent real wages under this government uh, only going government going up, rents going up, mortgages going up. The longer is not the problem. You are the problem. It's the Morrison government that's the problem. Lost last month, more than 330,000 jobs lost. For young Australians, 13 per cent, 1.4 million labour hire jobs, workers stood down to zero hours. That, that's the give me. The effective unemployment rate is effectively at about 15. of this government for the whole long, eight long, moribund years about. Is it going to be about the Prime Minister's character? Well, bring it on. Is it going to be about the Prime Minister's promises to deliver an integrity commission? I mean, bring that an economy that's in the interests of ordinary Australians 
and Australian working families. Every day of the week, every day of the week, as incomes fall and prices rise, away. Senator Pratt, you have around 30 seconds. I'm sorry, Senator Lott. Senator Lott. Well, it being two, well, it's not quite two o'clock. Sorry, I've got. Seconds. We saw from David Little proud this. How Labor's fault? The simple fact is they haven't introduced one. This Pratt, government needs being, to get on with it. Senator Pratt, it being 2 p.m., we will move. President, my question is to the Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. Can the percent of the $260 million promised in the National Partnership Agreement on to frontline services. The Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much. To be able to inform the Chamber today um, that the agreement has been signed with the New South Wales government and the money has been uh, investment well that we've made in frontline well services. But that, well but that's in, uh, in addition. That's That frontline services uh, were able to be able to have the additional resources to be able to those services, uh, but we uh, we made sure that that 130 million dollars went straight to the state. Recognition that the impact of domestic violence and family violence as a result of the pandemic did not. Communities, we put in place an additional $130 million per year. That's $130 million per year, somewhat more than $153 million over five, um, to make sure and services. Uh, in, in return for this, we have asked the states and territories to provide us with information. Demand. And I acknowledge today um, New South Wales has uh, come forward and what actually is the issue? Because as I said this morning in my contribution, eliminating family, sexual and domestic violence in this country is Federal government, state and territory governments have a responsibility to, and we will continue to work. In October, this minister promised that there would be a meeting of the women's safety. Important things that will be addressed at that meeting will be the draft of the next national plan. To the minister still intend to keep her promise? Minister. Thank you very much. Um, obviously getting together a, um, a group of very busy ministers across the country sometimes is not a and everybody in this chamber and everybody uh, listening. The absolute priority of this government is to make Uh, the draft will be uh, consulted through the appropriate mechanisms, which are the, uh, the advice through the, uh, the victim survivor groups uh, and also through the Women's Safety Minister's Task Force. We will meet all of the necessary targets and timelines so that it is in place along with the action plans. 
national plan and associated plans to commence on 1 July 2022 when the existing plan Australians believe that the Morrison-Joyce government will deliver any of its promises on domestic violence when it has failed Minister. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, I am not going to take that kind of ridiculous statement than any other government in keeping Australian women safe. On the fourth action plan, and I'd like to ask the chamber: Does anybody know how? Twelve-year plan put in place with bipartisan support by Julia. One cent invested in the first action plan by those opposite, and they come in. Australian women who need the support nice, nice that work. this government is totally committed to doing two something that anybody on that side has any credibility in. Senator Askew. Senator Rustin. Noting that today is the International Day for the Elimination Commitment to addressing this critical issue. The Minister for Women's Safety, Senator. So her ongoing interest and advocacy on this particular issue. Well, today it is really that family, sexual, and domestic violence is on our nation. One in four Australians. Australian women experience physical violence at the hands of a partner since they reach the domestic violence is absolutely devastating on survivors. That is why we made a dollar investment in the 21-22 budget. And whilst those on the other side will seek to What I would say is look at our track record. We are addressing this issue and we will continue to do so. Uh, escaping violence payment, a program which was the first of its kind in a national scale. A violent relationship by providing them with $5,000 of supports to make sure that they have got a platform Heard a number of really positive stories about women who have accessed that support. We also hosted the first ever national or that we provide the resources in all areas of responsibility, whether it be leadership, the national partnership agreement, providing safe places so women have got somewhere to go. to every single Australian. We are, are listening to you and we are acting. Minister, how important is listening to the voices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait women Mr President, well as policy makers we must not just listen, we must recognise and girls and empower them to develop and deliver programs yeah. for their own deliver the final stages of Commissioner June Oscar's Women's Voices project and real and tangible results plan. And this will include a summit that will be chaired by Commissioner Oscar. Is obviously delivering the extraordinary important issue of family, domestic and sexual violence. We
it's important not just as a government but as a country we reaffirm our commitment to supplementary thank you can the minister update the senate on how the government is protecting Minister. Order. Mm. Order. Violence against women and children is everybody's business. And if we really are. We must give people the tools and the education to understand how their behaviours. about respectful behaviours and around consent. And that's why we have announced that we are investing the start campaign. To be able to call out disrespectful behaviours and attitudes. Evaluation Community, with more than two thirds of Australians actually recognising this campaign and respect, we must make sure every Australian knows how to do that and does it. Representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Yesterday, the Minister told the Senate that Mr. violent and threatening comments directed at Premier Andrews and Catherine King MP. Morrison had in fact done nothing, and it was Mr Joyce who had done so. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Well, Mr Christensen is Oh, that's Senator, Senator. Order. Senator. Comments on Mr. Christensen's telegram posts have been Who made that decision? Minister. Of, uh, of those accounts are, which I would assume to be the member for Dawson. On my right, Senator Ayres, a supplementary question. About his call. Minister. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, I think Mr. Morrison spoke to to, uh, to those remarks, uh, uh, Mr. Christensen, uh, Mr. Morrison. Order. in relation to his view Order. that every single person should obey the law. Order. Morrison made very clear in the House right. in relation to a question on and this on matter. Right. Order, Senator Rice. Thanks, Mr. President. My question is to the was for gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and gender diverse students who faced being expelled. Their PM understands and is going to take action to fix it. Attorney General, it's been students. Are you rushing through legislation that's going to increase the ability to discriminate against LGBTIQ students rather I call the Attorney General, Senator Cash. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Rice for the question you have put in relation to the religious discrimination bill that the Prime Minister today introduced into the House of Representatives. 
it is actually wrong. You would be aware that Australia is a religiously Act. We have a racial discrimination act. We have a disability discrimination act. But what we currently don't have Order. in this country is protections for people of to fill that gap. So discrimination act. And these, these protections or exemptions for religious bodies have been supported by both sides of parliament. In fact, in 2013, when Mr Dreyfus was the Discrimination Act, but ensured at the same time that the protections for religious bodies were maintained. But in relation Act, Mr. President. This is about protecting people of the summation you have put to the Senate, Senator Rice, is a question. The, the Prime Minister said he was going to take action to protect LGBTI. can't report before 2023. Students who started high school in 2018. Minister Stoke on radio this morning was very clear that this bill will continue to allow to schools to another time where the Prime Minister has lied to save his political skin. Order. They clearly. Prime Minister. Uh, Senator McKim on the point of order. Yeah, just briefly on the point of order. Senator Rice was asked. There is, there is no protection merely in asking a question. To withdraw the last part of the question, and then I will allow the minister to answer. Just, you just withdraw. Thank you, Senator Rice. The Attorney General has the call. Discrimination bill would only prohibit discrimination on the basis of only operate in relation to that prohibition. Religious bodies have, and as I said, that the Labor Party supported himself recognised. Discrimination Act, Mr. President, the exemptions would continue to apply to religious bodies. Senator, I have made it very clear to the ALRC. We have a very clear experience because of their sexual identity. Minister, Se Senator Rice, just before you I should have let you restate the question, so I apologise for that, but let's move to your second supplementary. Legal for someone to tell their sporting teammate that it's sinful for them as a single mother to have a child uh, is lesbian, needs to find a husband, and it will be legal for someone to say that they don't recognise their the Attorney General. Bide, Senator Rice, and I would hope we could all Order. agree with this. That simply stating the fact that you don't have a belief in good faith in and of itself. The way you have put it, you're implying it would be a malicious statement, it would be a statement perhaps with intent to intimidate. 
quickly, Mr President, is not acceptable. But I would believe in Australia that the ability of people of to freely discuss their religion or lack of religion, to freely be able to Order. explain their religion, Mr. President, that each and every one of us can support. Just before you start your question, Senator Keneally, I will remind you do need to be able to listen. Mr President, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Mr Morrison stood up this morning to say that because of his Jewish faith. LNP MP George Christensen has previously appeared on a neo-Nazi podcast on his telegram, referencing the Great Reset and global elites as well. Does Mr. Morrison think these anti-Semitic posts from Mr. Christensen are not serious enough to even warn the Order. Order. Senator Sazelja, Senator Wong. Senator Birmingham. Order. Thanks, sir. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, well, Mr. President, uh, Cash was just discussing uh, around the topic of discrimination, discrimination, uh, or indeed I have no place, whether it be or their race or their faith. Um, and uh, on all of those matters, uh, they rightly deserve a number of uh, assertions uh, in relation to what, uh, what is uh, being posted by the member for Dawson. But, uh, but and I'm sure Senator Keneally, uh, if she wishes, uh, can certainly provide them to me uh, at a later point. Uh, we would condemn uh, any such uh, actions that uh, promoted anti-Semitism, just as we um, uh, promoting any sense uh, of uh, lack of tolerance of people of any other faith uh, or of respect. President, I seek leave to table a copy of the social media post that I just referred to. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. My supplementary. Mr Christensen has posted about Premier Palaszczuk, inciting comments featuring images when a noose was needed, sharing details of which ven venue she visits, suggesting someone harass her, asking where Lee Harvey from a tree. Does Mr Morrison think Mr Christensen's posts are not serious enough to even warrant a conversation? Order. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr President. Uh, well, Mr President, as I said uh, before, I said many times uh, to condemning uh, those who Order. seek to incite any violence, a lack of the fact that we Order. do not accept. We do not accept. Uh, violence or intolerance, uh, particularly on grounds in relation Order. to attributes the nature of which I spoke of before. Uh, Mr. President, uh, uh, you know, Mr. President, there are clear, uh, there are clear. Um, Senator Keneally has referenced some of those Order, earlier this Senator week Keneally. in terms of if certain matters had been referred. Uh, again, you know, Senator Order. Keneally copies of them in Minister, advance. Minister, your time has expired. Please resume your seat. Senator Keneally, a second uh, supplementary. I seek leave. To there being Thank no you. objection, leave is granted. 
Will Mr. Morrison now speak to Mr. Christian? of violence and anti-Semitic sentiment for his own Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, as, uh, as I indicated earlier, um, that both the National Party has spoken Order. to him. Mr. Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Andrews Labor government in Victoria has refused to rule out mandating COVID-19 government support COVID-19 without written parental permission. The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator. Uh, thanks, Senator Roberts, for his question. Uh, Mr. question Mr. President, um, have a COVID 19 vaccine. Um, are that's, that's part of the process by which we've uh, put in place um, those receiving the vaccine to provide a consent. Now, of course, in some circumstances, uh, put, uh, worked with the states to require some members of the workforce system and some frontline workers people working in uh, circumstances but we have said as much as possible it should be a voluntary process mr president and i think the australian people have demonstrated participate in the vaccination program we're over 90% First dose and in their droves to get vaccinated. And looking at the figures this morning, Mr. President, to take up a booster shot, which is a bit over 500,000, who five percent of those have turned up to pick up a, to, to have a booster shot, Mr. President. So overwhelmingly, I think. of uh, the importance and the value. Senator Roberts, a supplementary question. I thank the minister for his answer. Governments are unable to force COVID-19 injections on school children in Australia. The Australian government continues to work cooperatively with the states with states and territories have within their own realm uh, overwhelmingly from a national perspective the position of the Australian government. Should be uh, a voluntary program, uh, and as I've uh, Australians have overwhelmingly demonstrated their desire to be vaccinated because they know that we have them, their families, and their communities, and that's important, uh, Mr. President. And I would urge all. Time of has expired. Senator Roberts, a second supplementary. That he did not support governments forcing injection mandates. Yet state and territory governments are 
What measures has the Morrison government taken to ensure that Australian federal, state, protection mandates? Uh, very early in the answer to the primary question. Um, for Australians to provide consent or in the circumstance of a minor, a child between a consent to be provided. Uh, that's, that's the circumstance that comply with that process, that there is a consent provided uh, and would be take, taken into account as a part of that process. Uh, my experience the Air Workforce sector, for example, those that received medical exemptions was about 0.3%. when providing Minister, vaccines to Australia. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Henderson. Security Senator Hume. government is supporting the economic prosperity of Australian women as we reopen Australia the COVID-19 pandemic. The Minister for Women's Economic Security, Senator Hume. The future prosperity of Australia's women. On this day, where we recognise the President acknowledged that the Morrison government is very much backing Australia's women to reach their full potential. Participate fully in the economy. The Morrison government has put money, our money, put put money where our mouths are, investing 3.4 billion, including investments in women's safety, their economic security, and their health and well-being. Recovery from COVID-19. Under this government, the women's workforce participation rate is on an up. impacts of lockdowns and the pandemic. Mr President, we are achieving this by creating more choices. The Morrison government has invested $1.7 billion to improve the affordability of childcare by increasing the children. We know, Mr President, that these are the parents, the majority of whom are women who We also have removed the annual subsidy cap to support the choices of Australian families when it comes to changes are estimated to directly benefit around 250,000 Australian families, adding up to the equivalent of around 40,000 $1.5 billion every single year. Our focus is always on practical outcomes that make a real Inspired Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline to the Senate how the government economic future? Minister. Thank you, Mr President. Mr. The, Mr. President, the Morrison government understands that the the standard setter. And that's one reason why we're supporting more women into leadership positions and the jobs for the future. And it's a lived reality and a priority in order to create the digital economy. Paid sectors of our economy. Our government is committed to ensuring that there are more talented $2.4 million over seven years to support more women with higher level STEM qualifications. Flexible micro credentials. 
universities to offer scholarships and identifying STEM fields with the highest growth potential to support women into the jobs of the future leadership and development program Minister, where we committed a Minister, further 39.8 million dollars. Your time has expired. Senator Henderson, a Ex second supplementary. ...of a collaborative approach across government and industry in reducing barriers to improve women's economic President, again, thank you, Senator Henderson. The Morrison government recognises that reducing the gender pay gap requires targeted policy and part. But before I talk about what's, what's ahead, let me point out where we've come from. When we took office, the gender pay gap was 17. Point two per cent. Now there Order. is more to do. There is Order. more to do, and as a government, we believe. Not put in place for show. We believe in implementing policies that shift left. that dial. Not policies have real substance. Minister. Order on my left. I couldn't possibly hear what the minister was saying. Minister, you have the call. Thank you very Order. much, Mr. President. Senator That's Keneally. why we put in policies in place that actually to give millionaires, millionaires free childcare, millionaires free Order. childcare instead. Instead, that's why review of the workplace gender or equity agent to determine how government can further encourage the private sector to do its bit. Has expired. Order. Senator McKim. Thank you, uh, President. My question is to the minister representing the minister for who were issued 449 visas were of three months duration and are about to start expiring. DFAT advice during the four in Afghanistan who hold Australian visas should not attempt to leave Afghanistan due to the dangers of advice are now safely in Australia. But those who followed the DFAT advice and stayed in Afghanistan are what is doing is advising them to apply for other classes of visa. The 449 visas represent a life you cannot in conscience snatch away. Will the minister do the right thing and extend those 449 visas from the Taliban that was offered three months ago? The minister representing the Minister for Immigration, Senator Cash. Thanks, Senator McKim, for the question. And, uh, Senator Kim, I hope you would join with me in acknowledging that Australia does have a long and most in need. Uh, in terms of the safety in particular of locally engaged employees, uh, Australia's mission in Afghanistan that has done Minister, an outstanding job. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator McKim on a point of order. Thank you, President. The point of order is relevant. Locally engaged employees that was most emphatically not part of the question I asked. I asked Senator McKim, I am listening to carefully to the minister's answer. She has only been going for a very a chance to bring you back to the question, but I am listening carefully. Thank you, and Senator McKim, what I was saying was is why, on the 18th of November 2021, the Australian government announced that the subclass 449 visa Australia's mission in Afghanistan and their families, who had not yet arrived in Australia, will be extended. Subclass Order. 449 holders who are certified locally engaged employees of the Department of Defence, the Department of Police and Order. 
other persons with working relationships with the Australian side the locally engaged employee program who are granted a subclass priority in Australia Senator McKim a supplementary question uh, very little or no comfort there we foul any uh, Afghan national currently in Australia but what are you doing to ensure they have access to family reunion and pathways to permanent residency? Will you help these people and their families to leave them in limbo with the threat of being returned to Afghanistan hanging over their heads? McKim, again, I would hope you would acknowledge that certainly when it comes to the safety of those uh, who Australia is doing what it can and we have put in place what is a high priority for our government. In that regard, I do commend uh, for her involvement in this process. Mr President, for evacuees who have already humanitarian visa. The Department of Home Affairs they will continue Senator McKim on a point on relevance. This question is not about evacuees. This is about any Afghan national business. That was very clear in the question. Very clear. I, and I can't believe the minister hasn't got a brief on this, Senator by the way. McKim, you, don't know. you have brought the minister back to the question. I'm listening very carefully to the minister's answer. Um, requirement to uh, answer the question. Um, and I would give you the call. Thank you. And Senator McKim I will seek to get it. I am trying, however, to provide you with the relevant information that I do have in terms of, in particular, the permanent part refugees. Um, and as I immigration law change to allow Afghan evacuation for nine visa to, to apply for an offshore humanitarian visa. Senator McKim, a second. There are just under 7,500 waiting to have their partner visas processed or permanent residence. Some are in hiding in Afghanistan at risk of imminent death. Many thousands have been waiting for to issue them 449 visas so they can come to Australia and be safe while their substantive visas are being processed. Again, Senator McKim, the government, as you would know, we recognise the importance of family reunion for refugees. Um, you would also know that our humanitarian program reunites refugees and people who are in refugee-like situations over Senator McKim, a point uh, of order. Once again, on relevance, this is the question was not about refugees of Australian citizens and permanent residents who have not Senator about refugees or humanitarian Senator entrance. McKim, I ask you Senator to draw McKim, the minister to the question. I, I will allow you to draw. I do not yet believe that I can say that. The minister, the call, and I am the Senator Wong. I'm Mr. Ruling. President, I'm sorry. There is no point of order. I am ruling that. No, I'm ruling there is no point of order. Right. I'm listening carefully to the answer. Before you formally rule, or if you haven't, uh, just uh, put put uh, to you, uh, Senator McKee. 
different class of visa to the class that the minister is speaking about, it is not relevant. And I make that submission to you, consistent with our about your role in calling the minister to the question. Senator Wong, I, um, the minister has. Question. I can. I do. Not minister is being directly relevant. We call the minister back to the question, and I am listening carefully. Attorney General, you have the call. Thank you, and Senator McKim. Um, if I can get any, we do not want any information in relation to engaged employees, etc., more generally. But to the extent that I can get further information from the minister, I'll do that. Senator Chikane. Representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Is the Morrison Joyce government prepared to consider an override of existing Rennick and Antic? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and as I indicated in my answer to um, Senator Roberts earlier, Government has always been through the vaccine program that vaccination as much as possible should be a voluntary process. And stated in my answer to that question, we are at almost we are we're in excess of 86 per cent second dose. And as I indicated to the chamber before, of the 508,000 Australians who are eligible. Over 375 of. Mr. Please resume your seat. Uh. This position that you know, obviously, short, sharp questions are much uh, do require a greater degree of relevance. Sen Not about vaccine. Australians getting vaccinated. It was a simple question about whether the government is prepared to consider some coalition senators proposed. That was the only topic raised. Uh, I, I, I will agree with Senator. A fairly narrowly phrased question. So Senator Birmingham, sorry, were you seeking? No, sorry. Question. I am listening carefully to your answer. I do note that you have only been speaking for a short part of your answer so far. Uh, I will bring you back. The thing I said was that the Australian government's position the way through has been that as much as possible the vaccination program for Australians should be. Uh, Been supported by health advice, and that that has been worked through with the states, and the states have put in place through public health orders supports order for, public, for health workers, for uh, frontline health workers, for aged care workers, for home care workers, uh, and circumstances where the health advice has indicated that we have supported the process of mandates, Mr President. But we have said all the way through Minister. Resume your seat. A point of order, Mr President, my point of order is relevant. Uh, again, uh, just making the point that it has not yet gone to the very existing vaccine mandates. Mr. President, well, on, uh, on the point of order in this regard, Mr. President, uh, the uh, the opposition is now seeking to dictate the terms in which uh, you uh, you did. Bring the minister has been directly addressing issues in relation to mandates as they apply. Clearly, been addressing those issues Senator in Wong. relation to mandates and the voluntary application of the vaccine rollout uh, that 
may be seeking a yes or no type answer uh, is not, uh, not indeed, as many presidents have ruled very clearly, how a minister answers the question. Uh, the answer needs to be directly relevant to the question, and Senator Colbeck, by addressing issues, relevant. Senator Wong, on the point Thank of you. Order. On the point of order, that last submission to you is clearly not consistent with precedent. And if you Secondly, we are not seeking a yes or no answer. We simply want to know, want him to address the issue of override. And that was the question. I've been listening very carefully to the minister's answer. That is being on this, but I am happy to give the call back to Senator Colbeck at this point if he wishes to continue. I will, as I was just doing, restate the government's position again, uh, which has not changed. The, that the vaccination program for Australians should be a voluntary program uh, where at all possible. Through AHPPC and the National Cabinet, the Federal Government, the Commonwealth Government has supported uh, some The Australian Government has not changed that, that this should be a voluntary Minister, program where at all Minister, possible. Your time has expired. Senator Chikane. If the government sought any advice. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as I've indicated a number of times already, um, and I'm prepared to do again, to uh, voluntary, Mr. President, the mandates Order. that are being applied in states and territories are law, not Commonwealth law. Uh, those the, the Commonwealth's position. In respect of those, is that the man in identified high risk settings, events, and contexts, and should be given effect through state and territory public health orders? Which Minister, but our position Minister, throughout. Minister, please resume your seat. On President, a point of order, yes, Senator On direct relevance. Uh Has the minister sought any advice? And that was the heart of the question that I asked. I'm listening carefully to the minister's answer. You've brought to the minister's answer. Minister, you have the uh, and I've indicated to you through uh, uh, that the, the the circumstances under which I will take on notice whether there's been. Senator Ciccone, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Will the arrangements which allow states and territories to enforce vaccine mandates in order to secure? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, Senator. McKenzie indicates the state's house. Uh, however, the government's position with respect to the vaccine rollout has not changed. Chikoni asks me the same question in a different way. It doesn't mean that I'm going to have to give a completely different Order. answer. Uh, Mr. President, the government's position is completely clear, Mr. President. Uh, we, we, we have a position that's been consistent all the way through. That the, the vaccination program, except for the circumstances that I've in, Mr. President, Wong. it's a clear Senator Wong. and it's a consistent position that we have provided all the way through, Mr. President. The same question in a different way doesn't mean that I'm. Davy, thank you very much. The Minister for Employment, Workforce 
cash. Can the minister please outline to the Senate how the Liberals and Nationals in government are putting businesses to have the confidence to invest as we secure Australia's economic recovery from the COVID-19? The Minister for Employment, Senator Cash. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Davey for her question. And in particular, I'm uh, small businesses, uh, and in particular, in the lead up to Christmas, where each and every one of us uh, should be looking to spend whatever money we can Senator with our Australia, Mr. President, as we the Australian economy, Senator and in Ayers. particular. Please resume your seat. Senator Ayres, I have called you to order by name three times. Cease interjecting. Thank you very much, Mr. President. From Senator Ayres across the chamber, these business economic recovery. Now, Senator talk about employment. Well, can I tell you, Senator? O I tell you, Senator, on this side of the chamber, we were always happy to talk because since we were elected to govern, the Treasury said unemployment would be. You look at where unemployment is now. It is because of the policies put in Senator place Ayers. by the Morrison and that so many more Australians. In particular, what we want to do is say a big Order. Because, colleagues, as you all know, those on the other side, the closest they've ever come to a small business is to close it down. Close small businesses across Australia. Done to all of the small business people Order. lose jobs. That's and making Order. sure, Mr. President, they have a job. Senator Davey, uh, Attorney General, I would remind you to direct your remarks through the chat. for that response too. Can you also explain how taxes has helped to create more jobs? Businesses across Australia. This is a continuation of Government. We will do everything in our Australians themselves. Order. They're able to keep more of their own. It's in direct contrast, colleagues. Direct contrast. Their gift to the Australian people. Would have legislated it with the help of the Australian Greens. Three hundred. In additional taxes, and Mr. President, added to that policy. And just weeks ago, we saw Labor was planning higher taxes on 300,000 family business for business in this country. Please resume. Supplementary. Thank you. Why is it so important? to support small and family businesses the small business led economic recovery that we're on sorry no attorney general you have the call thank you very much mr president Again, we back small and family businesses and businesses generally in Australia. they are 
are the job creators in this country. Governments don't. In Australia, prosper, grow. Or we will never be Senator Davey on the or side. For some reason, and yet business, business are the. to back our job creators every step of the way. If there is a place that will ensure that they have the capacity to create more jobs for Australians, Mr President, that is exactly every Minister, single Minister, step of the Minister. way. Senator President, my question is to the Attorney General, Senator Mr Morrison promised, and I quote, I will be are introduced as soon as practical to make it Why do the Morrison Joyce uh, The Attorney General, Senator Cash. made. Uh, the Prime Minister was very clear in the word. In the first instance, we said that we would refer to, to the Australian Law Reform Commission. Order. The reason we have done that religious bodies in discrimination law across Australia. time, we implemented the religious freedom of that. The Prime Minister himself introducing representatives the religious discrimination of faith and those not of faith the Prime Minister has been very, very clear. I have formally written to the Australian Law Reform Commission clear the government's duality oh. when the attorney general's assistant minister senator stoker and i quote look i'm not going to split hairs over Senator Cash agree with Senator Stoker that protect uh, order, order. Attorney General. Into this chamber and demeans bill and all that it stands for. It is deliberately, probably for a political I have tried to depoliticise this and political bill that could get Order. Senator Sheldon, you will be aware because it who in 2013, when a member you actually were the ones, and we agreed with you, exemptions to religious bodies. Shame on you. Order, order. Uh, Senator Sheldon. 11th of October. Order. Senator Wong. Mr. Morrison promised to change the law to protect LGBT nation, and I quote, 
before the end of the year. Confirm at the earliest the Morrison joint. and 23 made his promise attorney general for religious bodies including religious educational institutions you did nothing whilst you were in government as I said in 2013, and did add some protected attributes to the sex. Including religious educational institutions currently had, would be Order. extended. Order. So, saying that you want to compare. You have ever stood for the Prime Minister. No student Order. should. Be Minister. To exit the chamber. Callister. Deputy, and I want to recognise the victim survivors, both too many of whom were taken from their friends and families by this violence, impacted by this violence, and I especially want to acknowledge discrimination of violence. We know in this chamber. Violence, sexual violence is rife in our community. And we know that the pandemic, in many ways, for me, the minister said that the impact of violence didn't end during the pandemic. Correct. But what she didn't and it has worsened at a time. and action on this issue from the government. One woman is... We know police are called to domestic violence incidents every two minutes. Violence is a leading preventable... ...for women aged 15... Victims of violence. It's in abuse and especially in controlling behaviours. In October 2020, the Women's Legal Service in Adelaide reported 50 calls from women earlier that year. All that we know, the Ab take seriously the task of delivering leadership. And the women's budget with great fanfare. But six months later, we are still waiting for the draft national plan. The funding promised by this government. by funding shortfalls in legal aid. Support to safely do so. 
here from the federal government in Canberra. It exists where we've seen the only domestic A close relationship with Catherine House. I know Senator Farrell seen the incredible and important work they do for some of the at the federal level and the state level. We hear platitude, but what we've failed to see delivered. But over years and years, indeed decades and decades, to support women, to support and I am so proud who have just announced that a Labor government will fund 500 Sexual Violence Commissioner to give victim survivors levels in our community. For many women and families, it remains a safer place. We must drag this horror into the light of action to protect women and families. Labor is committed to this. In government, we will any longer. Thank you, Senator Mariel Smith. The time has expired. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy President, and for raising this very international day for the elimination Family, sex, to, to doing all we can. Family and domestic violence. From we need to educate our young people. What coercive control they, from a very young age know how to see it has provided funding, and contrary to what Senator and has delivered a landmark three statement in the 2021-22 budget. This had a record two billion investment for women uh, since 2013. The latest women's budget statement. The National Summit on Women's Safety includes investing over five years to establish a domestic family. Now, as I've said before, this commission in this issue, but it does establish all community groups to provide a crucial. Because uh, Senator Smith referred to uh, the Labor Party's commitment for five all well, that sounds commendable on this. Where the funding for that is coming from? Well, from the existing billion dollar investment that the Morrison government has made to Work with the territories 
cancers. We are working with them. Partnership agreement. That our response is targeted. Quite rightly, that the response in our in Sydney or Canberra. So rather than rather than Canberra dictating 500 new workers and we'll we'll employ them, we'll put them in the, in our offices. Our government's approach is we are to provide safe accommodation where needed, to provide perpetrator interventions and helplines and counselling because that, that eliminate violence against women in for all of our community. violence because across Australia every single Australian knows family and domestic violence but it is still not any victims of domestic violence who do not come forward and we Our government is committed to providing that support. Thank you. <clears throat> I don't it's the opposition. So who's got the call? Yes, Senator. Oh, sorry, Senator McCarthy. <laughs> and I rise to take note of the government's response. Senator McAllister has told the place national crisis and a national shame. We are calling for action from political leaders. They travel the thousands of kilometres from Alice Springs. Front line of family violence, and they showed survivors of family violence that. We well, that was three years ago. We're now eight years into this coalition government, and they still don't see. Doing things, making announcements, and promising. Women's budget, a reaction to the nation, which were taking place right across the country. So they promised $260 million in domestic and sexual violence. How much of that has been? A cent. I would say to those budget might. Instead, we've seen delayed announcements. National plan, which was promised by November. The minister did say today it is in the final stages of its draft. Only five days left in November. Uh, this government has failed to take action. 
and here in the Northern Territory, which experiences the family violence incidents per day in the Territory, and violence related homicides per First Nations women account for 89% of twice the rate of non-Indigenous women. Stop just talking about it. Priority. I'm proud to say that Labor does have a plan Commissioner. This was a recommendation of a recent House for a separate to end violence against women and Labor will allocate an additional 4,000 units of social housing to women violence and to older women Australia Future Fund. We will also crisis and transitional establish 10 days paid domestic violence leave have to choose between her job say all sorts of things in this area uh, in particular this year is to have on the women's places right across Australia to combat family violence. One set of the two. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Senator McGrath. Oh, thank you. in that often House of Reps is, is seen as, as a, a place of but what we've seen over the, uh, this particular debate but the debate earlier is appropriate and that as, as much as possible across the, the political spectrum, and while there may be different approaches to that for those that, that who, who may be listening, that the, this chamber is at one at understanding that there is a, 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 pan, a pandemic, a, a, a perverse uh, that has been going on, and it is it should be reassured. Uh, we should be assured by that. And and today is has been National Day for the Elimination of Violence. That a, a woman he personalises in a way, but but someone's you know and one in one in five women has has experienced uh, and many of us in this chamber would mean that we, we do know people. Uh, experienced uh, su such violence of have made it harder 
those, those families to, to seek levels of, of resources towards towards their economic security what women achieve their, their full potential at a record 1.1 billion dollars in, in women's safety and territories to increase the capacity of and crisis services. Next national plan to end violence against women and children. One of the aspects is that we should not just make a, a problem of, of a problem that is a women's problem or it's a men's problem. It is a problem all of us have a role to play. And, and, and tick to such and tick to such. To, to try and, and end this scourge and widespread agreement of three years to deliver the final stage. And as Minister Rustin said in her, in her answer, uh, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, we are listening to, to the voices of our action plan to end violence against This action plan will be the primary mechanism. Senator McGrath, your time has expired. Thank, thank you, Deputy President. Senator Grogan. <coughs> uh, thank you. We've against women and a lot of statistics uh, to the unacceptable number of women to sexual violence, physical violence, forms of abuse. The COVID-19 has exacerbated this families safe. Just last night in Australia, we had our special operations responding to an alleged assault on a woman that resulted in a four-hour siege. Now let's just think about living with Anxiety, no fear about what terror she must have experienced. Experienced over what you can only in her own home, a place that she should be able to rely on. Violence against women culturally or socioeconomically. We've seen the number of reported in South Australia and also across the rest of the Far too many women are continuing to live their lives in fear. Australia refugees report turning away and help. And currently, those who are at risk of experiencing domestic violence often cannot access services or support services as one of these horrendous 
Women's organisations say that while they advise women to contact a crisis service at the point of services they can access, in the earlier stages, there is no form of in Australia at this time. So many women languishing in these We must look at this issue. We must elevate its status when the national government. We see them talking a big game in here while cutting critical funding to elevate the issue of violence because we have an order that, um, or decision of the Senate earlier today that at 3.30 we would move to the disallowance. So before I move to Senator Patrick, by, so I'm just moving. Uh, we take note of answers. Those are I'll call the clerk. This is the Senate number one. Standing in the name of Senator Patrick. Motion to 2021 measures number two, regulations 2021. Senator Patrick. Thank you very much, um, Madam Deputy Sorry. President. That the Senate uh, disallow the Australian Charities and Not for Profits Commission Amendment Regulation 2021. Uh, as they amount to a, a prohibition of freedom of political communication and expression for actions. Engaged, uh, and that they may have engaged in. Quite simply, the intent of this regulation is to stop charities from engaging in lawful advocacy. Uh, I've just, you know, had a bit of a blanket. That's my mistake. No, so. no, uh, and on th th thank you, uh, uh, Madam uh, Deputy Chair. Uh, I'm uh, quite simply, the intent of this, uh, these regulations is to stop charities from engaging in lawful advocacy. Millions of Australians donate, volunteer and otherwise are involved in charities every year. Climate change, domestic violence, homelessness, refugee issues and a vast range of other social issues. Charities have raised, uh, raised issues and continue to advocate on issues such as black deaths in custody. These regulations would have huge consequence on the ability of charities to speak up and advocate on what they represent and are part of. Penalties on charities for any minor offence than any other corporate citizen. Committed an offence. The commissioner only needs to believe they might. And if he does, they can be. So we have been, charities being told, uh, being held to a higher standard than any, any other organisation. All their activities and advocacies as political activities. So there's a huge contrast here. Uh, uh, sit in uh, to draw attention to an issue and the charity gets to We can have car park rorts, we can have blind trusts, we can have misappropriation of, of, uh, of uh, uh, a and that all gets See Mr. Gaitchens and sent to 
the dirty little secrets uh, uh, committee of that uh, was established under Tony Abbott and, and basically ensures that if you want to write you simply uh, have it funneled to that committee and we won't see it uh, see the results for the next concerningly these regulations would hold a charity responsible even where an unknown member of uh, of the facebook post and encourages people to participate in a demonstration say a sit in that would be grounds for deregistration have a chilling effect on charities. It's obvious that this is intended to silence uh, public discourse and action on political Australian communities they assist. And I, am I being alarmist here? No. I refer every, everyone, all, all senators, to the scrutiny of report. They are absolutely concerned about what I've just talked about. Charities will have no choice but to stay silent down. And the and deliberate method this government has chosen in order to wield more control and avoid being held to account. Shutting down debate, criticism and avoiding accountability um, and other uh, they feel necessary to get themselves back into government. The government justifies these reasons in the charity sector. Like seriously, charities are one of the most trusted sectors. Certainly more than uh, politicians, and yet uh, this is what's been yielded at them. To suggest that the public's confidence in the sector is patently false. Is there any institution that requires new laws to increase? Not in this uh, sector. The minister made further amendments to these regulations, additional reporting requirements, and clarify uh, that the uh, types of summary offences to cover offences related. do not alter the substantive effect of the regulations subject to this disallowance motion. I want to have expressed grave concern about the regulations. So the Bernardus Australia CEO Deidre Cheers says, we're currently children in need. If we uh, have to even turn just uh, one of those children away uh, due to increased costs, Fred Hollows Foundation CEO Ian Wishart says Fred Hollows was well known for speaking out and demanding action from political charities to advocate for those who don't have a voice. These laws limit the ability of charities to raise important issues. They have no place anywhere in participation and basic human rights. Anglicare Australia. Charity is, uh, is not just about helping people in poverty, it's about exist. That's why we need these rules are designed to stop organisations like Angl Anglicare Australia from speaking up for our communities and down for arbitrary reasons. Uh, there are not, they are not just an attack on charities, they are an attack on democracy regulations and then these attacks for good. They are wise words and I ask senators to pay attention to them. Regulation. Uh, if we look at uh, our own uh, committee uh, th uh, that looks into uh, these regulations, this regulation and, and its concerns, uh, it just is uh, uh, plainly obvious that the government has gone 
necessary regulation, and I uh, urge the Senate to assist me in having it disallowed. Senator Billick. Deputy President, my apologies. We have broad support and respect throughout our giving Australian survey found that 8.7 million Australians, over 40 per cent these are not for profits, providing in value. And Australians also give generously to charitable causes. Around $3.5 billion in tax deductible donations. And it's of little surprise that charities are so for the purpose of promoting public good, whether it's helping vulnerable and disadvantaged Australians, tackling poverty overseas, rights, recording and preserving history or heritage, or protecting and caring for the natural environment. Even if there may be We also need to recognise the vital in helping Australians uh, get through the COVID pandemic. When lockdowns and restrictions are in place, charity difficult circumstances to meet jobs and income and delivering meals. of the COVID pandemic could have been much worse I thank Senator Patrick for bringing on this disallowance motion. The regulation he is seeking to disallow charities. It's another battlefront in the coalition's ongoing war on charities. And it is a war. Let me outline the coalition campaigned for years against the establishment of the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission, and they wasted the government. Failing at that, they appointed Mr Gary Johns to hit the ACNC. Now, Mr Johns has a history of accusing them of what he called impure and referred to the Indigenous Reconciliation Charity recognised as the officially sanctioned propaganda arm. At the time Mr Johns was appointed, sent, and I quote, a signal to charities that were only the start of the war. Since Labor introduced Coalition has slashed its funding in to help recruit and retain volunteers, even though unpaid volunteering is considered to be worth almost $17 billion billion to the whole economy COVID pandemic. Now about the charity fundraising Senate inquiry that I chaired. Years before the inquiry was established, the sector was calling for it. And they're still calling for it. It's costing the sector $15 million. The report's recommendations delivered in February 2019 were supported by coalition senators and backed up three years ago. Just imagine if they put the same energy into this regulation. Sadly, the regulation moves to amend the Competition and Consumer Act to ban consumer boycotts for environmental campaigns. The government's foreign interference legislation would have forced many charities to register as foreign agents, 
and stop them from advocating. The government eventually sector and then exempted charities from It's also inserted gag clauses into many social services agreements. And this new regulation threatens charities minor or summary offences. This is a massive, absolutely massive idea. This could be something as simple as blocking a gate to private property and just and even deregister an entire charity large or small. And even more bizarre, summary events is committed can trigger a process could, that could result in deregistration. And if all that is the regulation gives the commissioner the power to take action against a charity because he anticipates a summary offence being ridiculous. Does the government think predict lawless behaviour? It's as if or with the Charities Commissioner playing any commissioner with that kind of power, let alone some to John's. The has described this new regulation as an Australia have raised real concerns that this region them that red tape all charities, regardless of whether they do public advocacy work or not. A recent pro bono Australian survey, 150 dollars every year after. Suffer because the red tape burden this government is imposing is beyond is beyond belief. It's unnecessary. Just for breaking the law. So I'm way gripping the nation. Do you know how many um, charities have been deregistered in the past four years? Two, two of us registered for the kind of activism the government committee agreed that the rules are anti-democratic, much power. Because of this regulation. It will be the height of hypocrisy if those three senators do not support this disallowance. Reports that One Nation senators are considering backing the government and not supporting the disallowance. Is it, can that be right? Let's be so forthright. Freedoms, yet they won't support the freedom policy issues. How could One Nation senators happily consign those same churches and charities to around 200 red tape over the next four years? Less freedom, more red tape. And therefore, unlike charities from engaging in, un in unlawful activities, dissenting voices. Well, the answer is obvious. This government is failing to continue to make savage cuts to overseas development assistance. So, of course, it's a little surprise that when charities speak out, government to hear. But this government, instead of taking on board the advice of charities, decides the best form of defence is waging war on the sector for the past. 
values the important part charities play in public organizations that work at the coal face of social, economic and environmental causes, charities have a wealth of experience and a valuable is vital to, to democracy. Let's not forget that the charity sector kick-started the campaign the insurance scheme, Medicare and marriage equality. Where Australia would be now without these reforms to spearhead those campaigns. Naughty children, he'd like charities to be seen but not heard. He doesn't want charities to have a key role in public discourse. Is government accountable for delivering on social outcomes? Mr. Morrison would like to see charities planting trees and but not advocating. And structural inequality. Healthcare and clean water to impoverished communities overseas. Providing legal assistance for victims of domestic and family to respect for women or for the government to. So hate is how charities war on charities were also declaring a war on the human rights, a war on poverty, and a war on this war must end. There is no charity crime wave and there is no need for this draconian law. So I urge all senators to get on with their important Opposition is all about the government trying to silence its opposition, silence its critics, temp tilt favour. Tilting the stopping people from voting, other legislation that's currently in the House. Huge amount of bureaucracy in order to be able to do that. Regulations will shut charity. To hear these regulations from promoting and having a presence at peaceful. wrap charities up in unnecessary bureaucratic red tape um, and threaten them apply. And we know the penalties are disproportionate and then being shut down by the regulator because of really minor and really inadvertent breaches of the law. But a particular charity because they have been that little bit too much. That's the very and effective punishment if believes that they are likely to breach the. Charities down for something that maybe they might do, might do. Absolutely unprecedented. 
organisations or political parties can be deregistered because a staff member might do something in the future. This on the ability of charities to justice. Operating very fine, thank you. It is going to have a, a huge chilling impact. We have a huge array of charities right off our charities um, alliance to a we want to salute them all. I think it is remarkable. From the environment groups <coughs> through to Christian, um, conservative Christian organisations, their operations that these regulations are going to be for the sake of the ability of charities to be able to operate. Uh, the government opposes this disallowance. The proposed vandalism, theft, assault, ACNC Commissioner to investigate such breaches, breaches of the law by charities. Advocacy activities, but it is conducted lawfully. Registered charities that are already complying with the proposed changes. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, I'm not sure if that closes the debate. I'll just check with the clerk. Proud to stand up to call for senators to vote to stop this attack on free speech. The place genuflected to religious freedom and is assistant treasurer. Any attempt of religious charities to speak up against actions of my colleague from Tasmania. campaign commenced with charity a government that talks out of two sides of its mouth dog whistling this disallowance it is an unnecessary and drastic and the reality of charity that that we know that they do the idea that Organisation was suspected of committing a crime is totally. Nor found guilty of an offence. An entire charity should be deregistered if just one of their staff, all their volunteers, engages in minor vandalism or trespassing. Charity cannot provide evidence to show they've taken reasonable promote or support unlawful contact. Reminiscent of Lukashenko's Belarus. Benevolent action by people of faith and people do good for their fellow Australians and they The scales in its favour. Trans program in sight. They want to keep the charity. Of a piece of regulation from the government is all about.
that we are here is well and truly made clear. Of the Centre for Public Integrity. That the government's using to put this really bad piece in action. Businesses and industries are being made by the executive with parliamentary oversight or other forms of accountability. It's on a runaway government that wants to take out the charity. enough to rot all the money that they've done through the Building Better Region reports. Now they want to reach and senators should vote against it. So the question Patrick be agreed to those of that opinion say I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bell.
question is the disallowance moved by Senator. Point Senator Rocket, tell her for the eyes. Senator Davey, tell her for the nose. The result of the division is eyes 24. We will be tabling in consideration of committee reports and McGrath. I'll just get you. Uh, thank you, uh, Senators. If you could leave the chamber in a timely Senator Ferranti Wells, uh, uh, if that's okay. Thank you, thank you, Senator. Deputy President, I present delegated legislation monitor sixteen. The report. Uh, Mr. I rise to speak to the tabling of the committee's delegate. I would like to take this opportunity to again highlight the committee's significant concerns about the exemption of delegated legislation from disallowance by the Parliament. Since this time, delegated legislation which impact on the everyday them is the overseas The committee has commented on and determination to remove the automatic exemption in another country from the overseas concern that this instrument not only engages several of the including freedom of movement conferral of allowance it is the committee subject to appropriate parliamentary oversight. By continuing to make instruments under the Biosecurity Act, which are institutional role as the primary institution responsible for making law is undermined. The committee has been pandemic, but has not received the committee has continually been advised. to take urgent action to manage the pandemic. The committee 
necessary for governments to take urgent and decisive action. Also have effective over finally tabled its response for the inquiry into the exemption of delegated legislation from parliamentary oversight. These government responses were tabled interim report was tabled in December last year. The committee is insulted, I repeat, insulted consideration included constructively with the government for over two years, yet there has been little to no shift in the attitude of the government. The responses do not give due consideration to the support for the recent change scrutiny of exempt instruments or the Senate parliamentary scrutiny and oversight unless there are of the 18 recommendations has only agreed with one related times of emergency the committee is deeply concerned that the government has advised that it does not support any Related to providing that instruments to disallowance. The response makes several is appropriate for instruments made by the committee. In the have taken unprecedented steps to contain noting that there is a time of the disease and to manage human health risks it needs the ability to take urgent in Australia and subsequently the However, the committee has consistently made the point that the Decisively, as it does not impede the immediate commencement and enforceability of an instrument. In addition, incomparable overseas jurisdiction. The government also argues that the includes controls on the making of delegated legislation, and that in the case of an emergency determination, the for a limited period or human biosecurity emergency period is flawed as the allowance. In addition, also exempt from disallowance, and there is no Parliament not to make specified delegated legislation disallowable reflects the urgency required for such measures and the to protect Australia. The However, the biosecurity five hours in each house, and the focus of this debate was not related to those human biosecurity emergency provisions significant scrutiny. The response undermined certainty, as people could not established that the instances of the disallowance by the parliament is very low. Would be well aware of any impact that disallowance
Senate would disallow an instrument that would put at risk human health sector is so remote as to be fair. This process is an opportunity to work in a constructive manner. On it by Parliament. In relation to instruments made under the Biosecurity Act, the committee considers that the disallowance process is apt scrutiny of the use of emergency powers and would operate to ensure that such powers are not misused. Finally, the government responsibility mechanisms to ensure this, including Senate estimates and questions on notice. Accountability mechanisms do exist. I emphasise that our system of representative democracy requires elected representatives to scrutinise and, if necessary, it in its response to the final inquiry report of the 11 recommendations made delayed, considering the substantive concerns. Act. In conclusion, the committee considers put checks and balances on the limitation of the personal rights sections 476 and 477 of the Biosecurity Act, as set out in the monitor, to provide that any further Biosecurity emergency will be subject to disallowance. The committee to moving such amendments to the biosecurity amendment. Comments. I commend the committee's delegated legislation. To the Senate. Thank you, Senator. Affair of Vanti Wells, who's emphasised to the committee a sorry to the uh, uh, in my direct experience demonstrate. There have been, uh, along with the other scrutiny committees of this chamber, a renewed on providing proper the work of this parliament leadership. I uh, can draw the attention of the chamber to he has in fact proposed changes to the standing order to engage the, uh, the there have been uh, that the biosecurity legislation should Biosecurity Risk Bill that uh, will provide to be prosecuted. From April of last year, there have been some decrees that have been issued mm -hmm. uh, around biosecurity, this bill. This and in particular, because 476, it has the effect of in Australia. 
How could it be that such legislation took place? Our discussion in this chamber, circumstances where the word flora and fauna, not about changing the law, any law, in the circumstances where amended or affected through It's not about that government should have the right to act. Subject to parliament conversation. Should a government's action the actions of this parliament, these measures People are very anxious about what happens in the state parliaments. At least in the state of Victoria, there is a requirement by state of emergency. General. And these are measures that have the capacity to override, for instance, to track people using mobile towers. To actually, in the next bill we'll see, force on people. and never question. There is other things. Now, it may well be as to how long they should continue and under what And so the proposition that's Is the inference that has been put to us, whereby the balance between the technical and scientific issue there's always a crossover. It should be asked, is that crossover appropriate? has put us about certainty. Well, you know, the business needs certain trading partner, the People's Republic of China to speak of, yet there doesn't seem to be any shortage of people wanting to speak with the People's Republic of China. So the idea that by the prospect that parliamentary democracy should trade strikes me as fallacious. Parliamentary scrutiny, and of course, about whether or not there was a deliberative act by these mechanisms in train. Well, clearly, it did not happen. Yet we are presented as if it did happen part of this regime. So we now have a situation come down from the committee. The government has responded in a completely con. because it's custom and practice for us to act in this way. So we've seen ago it was about 
occurring about 800 times a year. It's now up to 1,600 times a year. It's doubling over that. This is becoming increasingly a major problem. Allowed it to become a major problem. And the experience has been that we should have transparency and accountability, particularly in times of emergency. The recommendations of this committee are entitled to be supported, and I'll be able to do so, particularly given this in a bipartisan manner. And it actually maintain a control mechanism, not mechanism where there would be proper that the fundamental principles of parliamentary democracy are actually upheld. So I'll go, I'm just going to go in order on the, the, the order of the paper. So I will go, go back to the government because oh. we remember I... Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Government Whip. Additional information received by. Thank you. I will now go to. Mr. Uh, Acting Deputy President, on behalf of the Chair of the Foreign Affairs Defence Committee, Senator Kitching, I present additional information into funding for public research into foreign policy issues. Entry Joint Committee on Human Rights. I present the Human Rights Scrutiny of 2021. And, and at the request of the chairs of the respective committees, I present Excellent. Uh, Senator. I, uh, I present uh, the report of the Finance and Public Administration References Committee. Senate take note of the report. Uh, this is, uh, Acting Deputy President, a substantial, a substantial. Uh, it describes the deterioration. The good work that David Thody did uh, on public service capability, but it is indeed a critical report titled APS Incorporated is about capability in the public service. By contracting to government departments or the routes of critical policy advice to consider. report describes an industry of outsourcing payer dollars and hides its profits in offshore bank accounts but delivers an inferior service and undermines public sector capability. It's an industry that Parliament. It's an industry that redirects taxpayer money that should serve the public interest and hands it to rent seekers. It's an industry that's politicised the very institutions that underpin our democratic system. It's government by man for management consultants. Now there is a giant transparency. companies and consultancy companies, but no measure workers, a shadow workforce, thousands under open a 
pays the damage left by eight years of this toxic vision country. The logical outcome of privatisation and hostility to the independence of the public service and hostility to the servants themselves. It describes the institutions that have been undermined. Some sources of hope it finds that APS staff are diligent and recognised by their vision of public service. It finds that skilled and capable, although their contingency and uncertainty after year after year. And it finds that are committed to the public service, but of course we plan to build on those sources of hope to redirect public institutions to create thousands of good jobs which are APS incorporated must be dismantled. The, the highest rate of labour hire contracting are the Department of Veterans Australia, Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission and the National Disability failures in those departments have generated public scandal. There is a into defence and veteran suicide, into violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disability. Royal Commission into the robo-debt scandal. The situation at the Department of Veterans Affairs deserves particular focus. consultants undermining something that really matters. In 2015, as veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan deployments and hope in a good jobs and a department. However, the federal government's ASL cap to deal with this increasing caseload. And so the Department of Veterans became the largest user of labour hire contracts of the department's workforce was external, including of their frontline claims processing staff. That is entirely unacceptable. Providers totalling over $84 million. That, outsource, that outsourcing has co coincided with a block processing liability claims. And it's been a disaster. Veterans are dying waiting for their claims to be processed. Veterans and the Australian public deserve an answer. Department done? Well, he's commissioned another McKinsey report. Make it up. The department is paying McKinsey. The claims processing, the, the, the claims processing times are blown out. There is a report. It's here. It's free. Unity to recognise the extraordinary efforts that those workers, PS and labour hire, have made to help veterans receive. This failure is not yours. It's a failure of this government. And to the veteran community who rely upon D to do its job, you deserve better than this. Clear for government to act on. 36 recommendations. It builds on the Thody report and, and recommendations are adopted. Rebuild a public service with the capability that are important to the functioning of our democracy and act with independence and integrity. The report recommends doing this in three ways. Firstly,
situations of last resort, make contracts public, the money spent on labour hire by Commonwealth agencies. Two, internal consultancy hub to provide policy expertise to departments and agencies and to oversee the rebuilding of policy expertise. So it's not always contracted out to In fact, uh, Mr Johnson in the United Kingdom is doing exactly that. Develop and fund, finally, the blueprint. The government has failed utterly towards and encourages talent and expand the APS graduate program restore the dignity of the Australian public service, the ASL cap, allow management by department secretaries and agency heads of their budget envelope, uh, accountable for it, stop the ideological restrictions of bargaining. Now, these measures They'll redirect taxpayer money instead to building public sector jobs, many of them in regional areas. They'll improve services and lift confidence. I repeat, these measures are savings measures. There is a that could and should be saved by government to deliver a better service. I thank the fellow members of my committee, as well as the Tyler Secretary, who represent the highest ideals of public service. I want to thank those uh, people and organisations that made submissions in the discussions. Finally, the committee requested staffing Departments didn't respond to this request and have not provided an explanation. And with no surprise, I report to the Senate that they were the Department of Prime Minister and Treasury and the Department of Education, Skills and Employment is a reflection of the politicisation of the upper echelon. Yes. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Patrick. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Deputy. I rise to make a small contribution to uh, this. Good work that's been done by the committee and a lot of really sensible uh, recommendations. So, I thank the chair, in relation to that, I think I might. Uh, my only uh, the report is in uh, Chapter Eight, where. Uh, the committee sort of gives this mild impression of politicisation of, uh, of the APS, and I think I think that's true. But uh, it is worth mentioning that at the very top of the public further, the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister has driven throughout this entire government, throughout throughout the entire culture of secrecy and a culture. Of Political uh, direction, or else. We've seen that uh, uh, things like uh, national, uh, uh, any sort of adverse reports about and, and uh, more particularly the governance committee of cabinet, which is the dirty little uh, uh, committee of the of the federal cabinet. Trash, all of the dirty laundry, using, in fact, abusive uh, processes to do so. And I'm, I'll just foreshadow move uh, an amendment to the COAG bill to make it uh, very clear that uh, those sorts of activities uh, ought to be excluded from any exemption in relation to Cabinet uh, such that. 
those, those sorts of things can't be uh, hidden away for 20 years. Uh, officials incorrectly cabinet in confidence. They talk about anything they provide to a minister actually incorrect. Cabinet submissions is documents specifically uh, brought into a the cabinet are entitled to um, the associated with cabinet but and yet we see time and time again officials claims uh, or suggesting that uh, they'll get a public interest immunity and from a minister in relation to that uh, that that secrecy is top and then we have a situation where even when when the uh, even when the were overturned by someone like Justice White when he dealt with the National Cabinet, the PM and C sit around in a corner, work out what they're going to do, put a bill into the Parliament, the Coag bill, uh, just a completely ill. Justice White was scathing of the Commonwealth, of PM and respect of uh, how they handled uh, the AAT. Primary evidence, just secondary evidence, and indeed, uh, providing false information to the AAT. It turned out that that the uh, uh, that uh, that she submitted to erroneous, uh, mistaken, wrong. Uh, Gaitchens was uh, accused by Justice White of putting down evidence that simply made assumptions uh, and that, was, that were actually being uh, adjudicated by Justice White. It was disgraceful, a disgraceful um, by the Commonwealth, and that's the premier department inside the uh, So we've got Mr. Gaitchen's driving this all the way. Uh, we've got people like uh, Angie McKenzie last week said by with the ruling of Justice White. I think I know what the Her view is one that is, uh, you know, um, believed to, by, by PM and C to trump that of a, a federal court justice, and it's just disgusting. It, uh, it, uh, it's awful stuff. Uh, the attorney ought to be uh, and uh, you know, giving good advice to the rule of law to re maintain the, the uh, precedence and the, the weight that belongs to a, a justice of the AAT. Um, but we've got the, uh, the APS at the very, very top of uh, PMNC simply saying, I'm going to make a decision that overrides that. And that is just showing. Just coming back to the point I was going to make, and, and I'll conclude with, um, is that there is mild politicisation. To the, the Prime Minister's office. Uh, just a really awful place to be. We want to have official for advice, frank and fearless, uh, and complying with the rule of law, and that appear to be happening. 
uh, the problem is it's led from the very top. It's the uh, and uh, yeah, very, very shameful that, uh, that that's occurring. The report, it's actually a very well uh, constructed report with great recommendations and uh, you know, I'd look, look forward to seeing how the government... Thank you, Senator Pat Patrick. If there are no... Leave to continue Leave to continue your remarks. Thank you. Senate to which no senator rises will be taken to be discharged from the but I'll start with page nine, Senator Rees. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. I take note of document near my remarks. Thank you, Senator Rees. We'll now move to Oh thank you. Senator Canavan, want... you wish to take note of one I did of those want to take note of document two. Document number thank two. you. Um, well, I did want to take this opportunity today to stress the importance of the Australian Chamber. Many Australians donate to charities and they want to know that they can trust that those charities. We've seen a spectacle uh, in the Senate where the uh, so called Australian Labor Party has teamed up uh, once again with the Australian Greens uh, to. Uh, than actually uh, supporting law-abiding charities. There is no doubt that there are charities out there who do routinely uh, break our laws. A uh, genetically modified crop, uh, wheat crop, uh, they remain on the charities list. By trespassing on, on property. Uh, we saw in our own Organisation not on the charity list itself, but definitely su supported and, and waved on charities, the Extinction Rebellion movement. They were here spray painting this very. Fine. You get thousands of dollars of fines for not wearing your mask. $20 fine in this country if you spray paint our national parliament. What a joke, and it's a joke that the Australian. I've got a good mate back in Rockhampton, Robert Schwarten. He was a member of the Labor Party. Well, he's a member of the Labor Party. He was a member for Rockhampton. He's a good man. A good man who's often the modern Labor Party has gone. He's got a piece in the Curia Mail today where he's saying it's all good. It's all good. No platform anymore. Uh, well, he has been undermined within hours. Undermined down here in Canberra within hours because within hours of Robert that, uh, that the Labor Party now supports labourers again. They've discovered labourers. Within our of labourers at risk and to side with the lawbreakers of the Labor Party is for these days. They are for those people who like to break the law. They've got their profession. Some of these charities, effectively, their profession is just and they're supported and facilitated by by uh, their willing, willing participants from the Australian Labor Party. So I might mention Australians who are working hard for this nation, earning a wage, turning up for work every day. Support you. They're always going to back the Australian Greens because that's how they get a job. That's how. Care about your job because they only care about, uh, about their job. We are seeing an uptick, an uptick in all of this law-breaking activity. We've had uh, groups, groups uh, tie themselves to coal loaders and trains over the past week in Newcastle, showing a gross, a gross country, disrupting the exports that fund our nation and help us get through this pandemic. Sales are about to go through the roof, uh, uh, leading up to a great trade in superglue because all of these Greta Thunberg followers are going to be out there. Next 
arm them. The Labor Party has just given these groups, by voting against these laws, that would have cracked down on this activity. The Labor Party has just. Party have done uh, today, and it's an absolute disgrace. Because if you want to be a party that wants to be the government of this nation, that wants to establish the laws of this nation, you should be groups that back our laws, that live by our laws, and opposed opposed uh, to those groups who break our laws. It's a pretty simple, and it's a principle that the Australian Labor Party. Uh, has not lived up to date. Show engaged in the juvenile activities uh, of, a, of a university campus. Regard for the hard-working men and women of this nation. I thought the Australian Labor Party might have. louder than words, and today the Labor Party in action thank have you, teamed Senator. up. Uh, Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I also uh, to take note uh, of document to the AC report that Senator Canavan was just um, speaking to, and, he, and, and there we have. Ever seen? Has ever seen? Has um, has just laid his cards firmly on the table, and he's been very. Destroyers of nature, over and above ordinary, who in ever increasing numbers are taking matters into their own hands and bravely standing up for genuine climate action and to. Picture from those very companies that Senator, Senator Canavan is in here to represent, and I salute the activists around this country. Bravely putting their bodies, and in many cases, on the line, not for themselves, their grandchildren, and for the large numbers of people, mostly in the global south. Pay the highest price as our climate breaks down. Us. So whether they be activists uh, around the, around the world, I stand here and I know I do that on behalf of my colleagues in the group and say thank you for your bravery, your passion, and your foresight. And uh, I can't mention those words. In my home state of Tasmania, the Bob Brown Foundation, and again, we see activists, um, uh, uh, people who work and are a former senator and former leader of the Australian Greens, optimistically and in the most feisty and passionate nature in Tasmania, and in particular that. Uh, Cultural heritage, um, um, scenic, um, diverse, rich in biodiversity, ending that beautiful part of Tasmania against the ravages of and the logging industries. And uh, what that they are facing state and Commonwealth governments who are attacking them. And who are also attacking the very activists by writing legislation in cahoots, I might add, with the corporations who are trying to defend, uh, by writing legislation that, um, that uh, puts in place mandatory sentencing laws and other draconians that are designed to curtail people's right to speak. To This, of course, is what happens when political parties like the LNP and the ALP are in the pockets of the big corporations. Those corporations, what for them is a pittance, 
but is in a year to each of those parties in political donations. And boy, does it pay off the big jackpot. They get all their coal mines. They get public subsidies for burning, extracting. of Tasmania and Senator Rice's home state of Victoria for strip mining native forests and destroying um, hundreds of thousands and it creatures in the process, not to mention, uh, not to mention the massive our atmosphere as a result of those processes. Um, I, I warn colleagues that the social compact is beginning to fracture. Not but around the world. And um, governments, Labor and Liberal, sit down with the big corporations and draft all the draconian laws, but they will find over time that the jails just are not numbers will undoubtedly put themselves at risk in order to try Them all. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Ayres. I think I might in a short departure from my temporary role as acting whip. Um, they feed off each other. Their business model, their political business, model, is to engage in this Sorry, sort of rhetoric. Of the Further same to Senator number, Kenneth, number two. I am. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And, and Senator no McKim. one embodies that more. No two people embody that more than Senator Kenneth and, and Senator McKim. Now the truth is, plans as a political business model and shouting at each other may work to garner the very small proportion of the vote that the. Of it. And if you want action on climate change, and if you want to realise our regions, Sorry. and if you want to build industrial Sorry. capability Senator, in this country, Senator is excuse me, Senator Rice, the acting deputy president. I fail. Our Senator Ayres contribution is relevant to considering. Uh, Senator Ayres, yes. I'm if listening. Senator I think I think this debate ability, Senator Ayres, but I really would like to hear your views on the Australian charities and not for it would be a great contribution to, to charity uh, if we stop this debate. It probably shouldn't have started, but I just if people are serious about these questions, the vote that happened today actually was a victory for the independents. It's a pity. It's a pity that Senator McKim and Senator Canavan wanted to divert the discussion into the usual thing. Why people are sick of this carry-on. And if they want jobs, Serious action on climate change, reindustrializing our economies. Says, well, they know what to do at the next election. Well, thank you, Senator Ayres, for your contribution. We'll now move to page ten. And, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, <laughs> I'm a note of uh, document six, seven, eight, nine, thirteen, fifteen, and sixteen on page ten, and continue my remarks. Are there any other contributions on page ten? No, we'll move to page 11. Madam Deputy Senator President. Ayers. Thank you. Madam Acting Deputy President, I move to take note of reports 22, 23, 30, 32 and 33 on page 11 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, uh, Senator Ayres. Um, we'll also move to uh, page uh, 12. Thanks, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I take note of uh, reports and government responses 1, 7 and 10 on page 12 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you. Uh, 
Senate that uh, we are now on committee reports, government responses and Auditor General's reports. Any report or response to which no senator rises will be taken to be discharged from the notice paper. So no other contributions on page 12. Uh, we'll now move to page 13. Thanks again, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I take note of uh, the uh, report and government response number 11 and the audit report number two on page 13 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you. Are there any ministerial statements? Madam Acting Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, I table a ministerial statement on investment. Thank you, uh, Minister a document relating to the order for the production of documents concerning the Scarborough Pluto gas project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Corporation's Amendment Improving Outcomes for Litigation Bill 2021 for Concurrence. Minister. This bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. A first time. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Corporations Act to and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speak. Leave is granted. I move that the debate now be adjourned. Thank you. I'm, I put the question that the debate now be adjourned. All those in favour say aye. All those against no. The ayes have it. Uh, Clark. Business notice of motion number 1281, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher, wages and cost of living debate. Senator Walsh, you have. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to speak on this uh, very important motion from Senator Gallagher today. Uh, because after eight long years of this government, three terms, three prime ministers, three deputy prime ministers, to help the cost of living over the last eight years. And our mind my wages going up at all under the Morrison government. The Morrison government want people thinking about the cost of living as they look to You cannot think about the cost of living uh, and how people cope with that without eight long years of stagnant wages. Eight long years of It has become harder and harder for people to make ends meet, and the government have admitted to deliver real wages growth before 2025. Uh, so that's no hope of wages going up. Uh, in fact, under this government, workers will continue. by the McKell Institute shows that the average Australian worker would be $250 a week $4 a week, to be precise. Order. That's over $13,000 worse off, worse off under the Morrison government. And if this government wants on because this is the number that Australians will remember because there is everything under this government when you have $13,000 a year less in your pay packet but problem under the Morrison government the cost of living is going up the gap between how much you earn uh, and what you're paying, everything is increasing. 
uh, and Prime Minister Morrison has implored voters to pick the team with the right track record at the next election. Uh, and, uh, you may never hear me say this again uh, in this chamber, but on this question, he is right. this government. In the last year, wages have gone backwards by $700. You do the math and see what is happening to the average household. Are 23 per cent higher than they were a year ago. Um, because under this government, petrol prices have gone down. This is the track record of the Morrison government. Petrol prices skyrocketed. It's not just petrol prices that are unaffordable under this government. Uh, who have jobs are still not earning enough to find decent about their wages uh, and the impact on their housing situation uh, is because it's a story uh, that cuts pretty deep uh, and it's a story that is care for 20 years, um, but she is contracted to work only 16 hours. Those hours are not guaranteed and her wages are low, close to the minimum to give her a lease. She can't convince a bank to give her a home loan. Caravan park, uh, and what she has noticed in the caravan park that she lives in, providing essential service to our community who are in exactly the same situation under this government, uh, and because they are stuck in short hour, insecure jobs, um, they are locked out of. jobs with decent wages. And there is driving wages backwards at the same time as the cost of living plan for, um, they don't even admit that it is real. Country. We've heard about this crisis from workers across a range of industries. With not getting enough hours at work and with having to face the rising cost of living on top. On this committee, government senators who have sat there, uh, like I. have bravely told us about what it's really like to have an insecure job um, when evidence of the crisis of insecure work is right in front of their in their dissenting report uh, that it is and I quote a labor lie A labour lie. Um, well, tell that to the workers like Cherie, that just doesn't cost, just doesn't cover the cost of everything that they need to provide for themselves. Uh, that job insecurity is a labour lie, even when the evidence. telling their stories about it to these government senators. Um, this is a government 
job insecurity even exists. This government are seriously out of touch. In the other place, call issues of job insecurity uh, in labour hire, and I quote, made up. Labour hire workers getting paid less than their co-workers doing the same job is a made up issue. His colleagues in uh, this chamber, Senator Canavan uh, and Senator Small, um, both of whom have We heard from the very labour hire workers who are paid less for doing the same. Ad Stokes, who lives in Rockhampton uh, and has worked in the coal mining. A casual labour hire worker, uh, and Mr. Stokes told our Senate. but I have no job security. I get paid less. Full stop. To face with the stories of real workers, they still deny reality. They are facing. They are sick of seeing this government with its eyes shut and its fingers And workers know that if this government can't even admit that there is an issue, because the Morrison government has no plan to fix insecure work in this country. The rising cost of living, they have no plan to ensure working families can make ends meet. Unable to decide which way to move forward. But this government still have another week left in Parliament for this year, so they still have the chance to plan to fix the crisis of insecure work, how they plan to fix the flat wages that Australians have this government. How do they plan to deal with rising petrol prices? How do they plan to get wages moving back to us next week with that plan? Um, but on our side of the chamber, we won't be holding our breath to help workers in this country. Uh, in fact, this government has admitted of their economic plan, a deliberate design feature, and they've spent the last them from fighting for fair wages, keeping them in insecure jobs. But working people in this country are fighting, fighting back. They are not taking joining their unions and they are taking fighting for decent wages and better working conditions. Uh, and in the last week or so we've seen the country uh, and a particular shout out to the workers at Country Road Group. Low paid women workers, many and win proper pay rises and fairer conditions. No thanks to the Morrison government against low wages and job insecurity. And Labor, we are on for more job security and better pay for working Australians. We is a proper pathway from casual work into jobs that are permanent and that are more and a Labor government will always do because there is no future for this country if we do not have a plan for good secure good secure jobs 
under the Morrison government. Senator Bragg. Um, well, it's always a pleasure to make some policy settings. And um, I guess I'd have to begin by acknowledging the which almost makes the point that the government could legislate jobs where jobs are generally created by um, I think maybe one in ten sector. So the vast bulk of the Australian nation work in the government applies in this consideration. And as much as we may like the concept of capital far away from the real economy uh, legislating jobs, uh, it doesn't work. The person that is committed to the principles of the market, markets, because we do believe in regulation where it is justified, what would be the big levers that we would have here in Canberra? to generate uh, and I don't you go around and you could look at the work that has been done by uh, various you know, international on what actually determines a nation's competitive position uh, given Now, I imagine for the next 250 years, uh, Australia will rely upon foreign capital. Uh, this is a so um, with a heavy reliance upon foreign capital, we must always look at these things through the prism of uh, other jurisdictions. Now, I know that there are mixed views about these things, but I think you have to look at uh, the reliance on foreign investment. Or some of the most important data points here. Uh, so your tax settings, your tax complexity, uh, your labour laws, policy settings, how fast you are to respond to changes, all these things are important. Uh, we have been committed to passing incremental tax changes, incremental tax the idea of private investment. Now it has been a subject of much, much consternation before I a more competitive uh, tax arrangement for companies, uh, certainly in this parliament uh, enacted uh, and there is always more that you can do there. As a general principle, most people will just uh, and any attempt to try and simplify the tax system is always going to be uh, time well spent. Could do the most to improve our competitive position uh, would be to simplify. Now, I generally. Unnecessarily political comment. Contributions made in this place that have been written elsewhere that are designed to suits particular organisations. Convoluted labour laws. Uh, we wouldn't need to have uh, as many people. 
Now, on this issue of trade unions, I think there is a very good case for trade unions of low-income people in particular, uh, migrants and the like. Uh, but I do think that they are given to these organisations, certainly in the law, uh, by virtue of the complexity, by virtue of uh, one of the major parties being owned uh, by that particular movement. I think that is a real problem. Uh, it, uh, the idea of a simple small business award should be something that is which protect workers that could be applied across the economy uh, could only be a good idea. And I think that is a real shame. So you work through these things, your tax settings, your tax rates, your labour laws. It is a hard to describe factor, but I generally try and think of it as how dynamic your policy settings are. Interrupted as we speak. Um, I mean, I would say that unless we are prepared to deploy more policy assets space, Silicon Valley and perhaps other huge parts of the economy. Uh, and if you think about the idea that uh, the main enormous knowledge uh, you really need to think carefully about and how quickly you can respond to these changes. Uh, I have to uh, say that I think this week in the House, a bill presented which is going to incentivise or uh, offer the opportunity for people to use as a collective investment vehicle. Now, this was a recommendation of uh, Mr. Mark of the competitive position of Australia's financial sector for the Rudd government. And to their great credit, the Rudd government commissioned that review to enact that recommendation. But, uh, a lot of the reforms that were following the National Innovation and Science Agenda discussion around venture capital in particular um, three or six months. So responses, uh, which probably mean rather than the eleven year time frame, because things will just will just move on. Now um, uh, wages. Now for people that have looked at the budget papers uh, it is obvious uh, that wages growth is a small uh, wages increase projected by the Treasury and the Treasury Secretary has said that that will be eaten by compulsory super. So that is, that is the position. It, uh, to allow that wages growth Increase to be eaten by compulsory super? No, I don't. But again, there are mixed mixed views. About us to have a, a more flexible system where people could put it into super, or they could take it uh, as their wage. As the, the super anyway, moved a lot. It does distort. The Some people would argue that. Uh, that is not your wages. That is some business. Uh, this is a uh, for people who want to uh, pursue uh, a wages policy discussion. Uh, you have to look at 
accession settings. Um, I am very worried that home ownership is getting harder and harder for Australians. I have long been an advocate of allowing people to have access to their super for a first home deposit. Bullet, and anyone who argues it as a silver bullet is is Order. is stretching the truth considerably. There are the difficulty that many Australians face in acquiring a first home, and I. Think an economic debate which is which is to a first time uh, is that the the system we have in Australia particularly when you look at the way that people uh, retire generally have a home they will get access to a home a retirement on the pension Uh, being, being on the pension um, makes that retirement much more comfortable. These are always difficult things to, to go into because there are great vested interests here, whether it's about uh, making the... or whether it is about looking at how superannuation works because, of course, the way that those laws... Uh, industrial affairs, but also into enormous sums of money at stake. A much better discussion uh, if it wasn't for all the vested interests falling over themselves to give us their best, their best view. If you want to talk about wages growth, uh, private investment. Tension in the market, which will ultimately lead to there being that wages growth. And so, as an advocate, investment, I think that is a key. That is a disposition uh, that is critical over the long term. It has always been the case that we will rely upon foreign investment. Hear people say how terrible foreign investment is. Um, because I, I think that they generally don't have the hugely positive role that foreign investment plays in the bush. Uh, there are so many projects in regional Australia which um, And to finish on my old favourite on super, uh, we've had super for almost 30 years and our Senator Roberts, uh, remotely, you have uh, just over two minutes before. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. The speaker's list for this motion speaks volumes about Australians. The opportunity to advance ideas on how we can improve real wages should have brought a queue of senators to the. There are only five out of 70. workers, the Liberal Party, the National Party, the Greens. Senator Gallagher is correct. Australians over the last 30 years. This, though, is where Senator Gallagher's grasp of reality comes to an end. Price index rose from the early 90s until 2008 under Labor, Greens and Liberal national governments. of COVID under Labor Greens and Liberal national governments. The average Australian way of checking how the public sector is masking negative real The midpoint range of wage is a better measure. The median wage has not increased in real terms in Australia for Period. The amount every day Australians three hundred percent. If everyday Australians going backwards, 
It's because the and Labour Greens governments, because these parties have the same policies. Once again, this week, bill after bill has been voted in support. We do not have good government as long as the Liberal Labour, the duopoly, the uni party are in control. In fresh faces from the minor parties. Order it being 5.30, the debate is interrupted. I and call Senator McGrath. I rise to provide the Senator Now, this is not just your average Labor cock-up that they can sort of sweep under the carpet <coughs> like the uh, State Senator Bank of Victoria. Language that's appropriate for okay, I, I'm of failures. Uh, the I want to talk about the the biggest infrastructure fail Paradise Dam is full. Two percent capacity, which is brilliant. So that's one hundred and ninety seven hundred and seventy three thousand nine hundred and forty megalitres of I know this is, is, is welcomed by the irrigators in, 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 the, in the broader Wide Bay and Burnett region, but it is an unfortunate context. The dam's capacity prior to Queensland Labor permanently reducing the height of the wall was. Now, we, we know that Labor just. They are spectacularly incompetent. So, you know, State Labor in Queensland have been there for, for, for a very long time, and my party has not won a uh, for the, the future of, of infrastructure like dams. State Labor don't do anything. Because effectively, a, a coalition. Do Marxists who, who sit at the bottom of the garden? because the Greens don't really understand crops grow because you need water and you need dams for the bizarre arrangement uh, you think you'd give them at least a golf clap for that uh, totally and they've had to to the broader Wide Bay Burnett area because irrigators have not been able to, to have a reliable water supply from the until the rain rain came was at the response of State Labor to this was was the pay for rain. And this is just in, insulting to for those of those who, who believe in, in a deity that the economic future of Queensland is understanding they need to build infrastructure to ensure that the people of, of the Wide Bay Burnett uh, have a legal a, a, a class action a fight to, to state labour uh, to stand up have been let down by acting deputy president in other in other you know damn news uh, to uh, the, the broader site of uh, it's something that's been proposed to be built by Bowen water utility it can be so important as a hydroelectricity capacity to it there's going Minister announced additional federal of the Arena Dam project. So this this project 
to do in terms of making sure We can't do that. We need state Labor to come on board by refusing a relationship with the Greens. Don't like dams. Now, the LNP, who is the mayor of the Whitsun, is going to deliver water security. North Queensland. So we're, we're about delivering where Labor uh, Thank you. I rise to pay my respects. Harassed by successive Liberal national governments. Allowance motions on the discrete and not for profit commission, or at least most of them. The sector plays a vital role in critical services to our community, including. So I've seen firsthand how important the advocacy policy, the impact of changes in our society, and they see what's not. And they are advocacy work and fight for the better outcome for our Cuts imposed by this current Morrison Joyce. Charities make an active and important contribution to our society. Our national discourse would be. Prime Minister Morrison and his party talk a big game. Supporting people's freedoms, but support the freedoms of some people. Organizations, including some of Australia's most well, see, St Vincent de Paul, Anglicare, Fred Hollows Foundation. Services Australia warned that Catholic charities would face an action I wonder how that interfaces with the Religious Freedom Bill The Executive Director of Anglicare was quoted in the Financial Review as saying the regulation was not an attack on charities, but an attack on Regulations have also faced unprecedented criticism and its oversight mechanisms, the bipartisan of delegated legislation. Before recommending that a regulation be is not a step taken lightly by that committee. In particular, the committee expressed concern that the was merely on a perceived likelihood that granting huge discretion to a government appointed commissioner to take action on organisations without the need to follow any guidance. These regulations are not the first attack on the not for
sector for eight long years. And John Howard to crush and silence them, uh, Tony Abbott Profit Commission, and in 2007, John's a man with a history of attacking, attacking charity. Morrison government tries to attack the rights of charities and not for profit. I proudly join with my Labor colleagues in backing the charities and not for profit sector and ongoing relentless Senator and outrageous Brogan, attacks on democracy. Time. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise tonight to speak about. Uh, Uh, brief, uh, but give uh, the chamber an update. Back in uh, two thousand, on the Air Peninsula, and indeed uh, uh, one of the solutions to that water security issue was to be a desal plant. So often happens. Uh, announcement: an announcement was made. Nothing happened for over a decade. A couple of years ago, the state government allocated. Uh, the desal plant at a place called uh, Sleaford in uh, that uh, particular uh, an engineering perspective, and as a result, uh, to establish the desal plant. So. As a result of that, and I, uh, I FOI uh, a, a, a document or thinking, and the lower air peninsula get a lot of their water from. And that report basically says uh, three thousand million and six thousand million. Uh, Water out of the Uli South Basin is not sustainable. So, so that emergency just allocated a proper bay, and Link would know that's that's when you look out uh, from the foreshores, and uh, you're looking out into Boston Bay. One of the uh, things you see about Bay is it actually looks like a lake because there's it's an area that doesn't circulate water very much. So important uh, fishing um, industries in, in Port Lincoln. Uh, but of course, uh, SA water are snooker because there's nothing allocated from the, the, the state government. In uh, the last fortnight, I've written to the finance minister this not as an emergency, but as a vision for the Air Peninsula. That looks to uh, the future. That looks to years ahead. Uh, that looks to the mining, uh, the uh, agri uh, agriculture that's on the Air Peninsula. This uh, and of course the communities. Water is the lifeblood of, uh, of many communities that as we think about the future of the Air Peninsula. Uh, 1940s, 1940 to 44, uh, that cost some government a vision without which we would not have places uh, we wouldn't have water all running through the top of the vision and that will require federal assistance. Unfortunately, people of Port Lincoln, they're at their democratic peak in terms away from a state election and six months away from a federal election, uh, you know, uh, 
can have said, we've got to stop. Let's shift the decision a year from now so we can consider the data. But really, we know how it works in politics. That's us shifting the decision point to after the election. And political ploy. We need to get an announcement out of the South uh, that the desal plant will not be in Boston Bay. The state Liberal Party, and you do not vote for the federal Liberal Party when the federal election finally arrives. Senator, along with seven others of my colleagues, I wrote seeking Australia's diplomatic boycott. I've continued to probe this question at Senate estimates and Olympics by a nation is not usually done because of the regime's love of sport. It is done so the national prestige, the national prestige and the benefits that flow. that the hosting of an Olympics can have to the six when the National Socialist dictatorship benefit by way of domestic and international the world had come to this dictatorship. They were able to sell themselves, unfortunately, as being credible. It is undeserving of that. Its own people in concentration camps, which currently engages religious persecution, and it doesn't matter if you're Muslim, Christian, fellow. religious persecution. What is more, conscience have their organs harvested, a barbaric practice. This regime has written up an international agreement that it signed with the and sanctioned by the United Nations in relation to the free that would be enjoyed by the people of Hong Kong. of abiding by its requirements. Then talk about the Tibetans, the having their rights denied. And then we can talk about this is a regime unworthy of the Olympic flame. And Olympics. When I first made this call, I'm delighted that IPAC, the International Parliamentary Alliance, backs this call. I'm delighted that the United States, the United Kingdom, and Australia, according to media, are now giving active consent such a boycott. I recall some time ago, Mr President, when uh, I was a lone voice in my party room opposing the extradition treaty, proposed extradition treaty to China. Yes, I was labelled racist. I was labelled for uh, preju prejudicing Australia's trade. It was a pretty lonely time at the time. Now, not a single person would suggest that we should have an extradition treaty with China, thankfully, will not be proceeding. Similarly, I trust and dictatorship that is so brutal to its own people that 
countries and peoples that are free to see democracy and liberty flourish around the world. Compete, but let our world leaders, our ministers for sport, our ambassadors, etc., as a show of strength and disdain for this. Senator Mario Smith. Thank you, President. Our lives. It's changed the way that we buy products and the way that we access services. We've seen has been delivering more than 10 million parcels each week. And we've also seen incredible growth on the use of platform-based services like Uber. When consumers change their patterns of behaviour to respond to an event like this, businesses adapt. In South Australia, we've seen businesses adapt, from cafes and restaurants across the state pivoting to takeaway services during lockdowns technologies to continue their classes from home. But in this adaptation, in this change, not everyone has been better off. Some of the global businesses benefiting most from these changes have some of the worst industrial conditions of all. Track records as employers that have failed workers, that is, if they even acknowledge an employment relationship at all. Indeed, some have been out in front championing the rapid growth of insecure work, meaning more Australians join those without economic security, without job security, unable to plan for their families and for their futures. Our desire for convenience, as reasonable as that desire is, cannot be at any cost anymore. And the consequences of convenience anymore. Because we know some of these global companies have been world leaders in abusing corporate power. Warehouse workers, the SDA, has raised the alarm on some of this. There have been reports of workers raising serious health and safety concerns. The And it doesn't stop at warehousing. Amazon is continuing to ramp up its of its package delivery service, Flex. With Flex, drivers use their own vehicle to major cities around Australia, and it looks set to come to my home of Adelaide soon. parking costs or maintenance. This new model of work shifts all the burden for sourcing and maintaining their work equipment and too often find it near impossible to access in our country. The cost of convenience, if allowed to continue without a And that's exactly what the Make Amazon Pay campaign seeks to address, highlighting and fighting It is a campaign supported by over 70 organisations, including unions, non-government their voice. Deputy, oh, sorry, Mr President, during the pandemic, forget the lessons we learned. Insecure work means people are forced to put up turning up to their work. It can make it extraordinarily difficult to cope with changing circumstances, impossible to plan for the future. We know that costs in life aren't. Costs like your mortgage, costs like your bills, your children's need for food. Labor knows this. That's why we'll make job security an objective of the Fair Work Act. We'll restore the once and for all. 
Australia's industrial relations system and working conditions have long been the end the blood, sweat and tears of workers and unions, the Americanisation of our workplaces and that remarkable history if unchecked, and we must fight it with the same strength and unity as those who came before. to stand with mighty unions like the SDA and the TWU and all of the work In October 2018, the Prime Minister was asked what his message was for who faced being expelled from school simply for being themselves. and is going to take action to fix it. Yet three years in, that is actually going to entrench the ability of schools to expel LGBTIQA plus teachers. This is yet another example of the Prime Minister Delivering the exact opposite. This was the case. But the reality is different. As legal experts teachers that gay and lesbian couples should not be able to marry or have children. Against any staff or students who do not adhere to this belief. Schools will be largely free to tell trans students that their gender identity is against the laws of God of a father. And this legislation will override state and territory legislation. law such offensive speech. The Prime Minister in 2018 discriminatory legislation, this Trojan horse of hate, into the House himself this right wing fundamentalist friends rather than working to end discrimination. In who started high school in 2018 is going to graduate the Reform Commission into Discrimination in Schools reports in 2023. Meanwhile, we've got Meanwhile, in the Senate today, we had an attempt by this government. Hearings as part of this inquiry would be held over the January holiday period. Absolutely important review of this legislation. This on the basis that that's their religious belief. And when I put this to the Attorney General, Yet there is a note in the legislation that specifically says would not constitute discrimination, which means the Attorney General was wrong. Uh, relationships are evil and that they will pray for them to find husbands. view would be completely legal and telling a disabled person that they're the work of the devil for denying their child a father would be legal to his far right wing mates and to engage in culture wars to distract the 
been living through two years of pandemic. He's done absolutely nothing to support people who are out of court, let alone having done nothing to address, to address our climate crisis. We support protecting people of faith to not be discriminated against, but this bill does not. Senator Rice, your time has expired. It being 6 p.m., the Senate stands adjourned. And I always wonder what will happen.